हेलो हेलो चेक चेक
uh, a very good morning to all of you <coughs> i am and uh, greetings from datta mege medical college nagpur i am dr aditya kekatpure uh, organizing secretary for today's session and today's and tomorrow's sessions and uh, we are really blessed to have faculties uh, dr dinesh kale sir who's come from belgaum dr pranav shah sir who has come all the way from ahmedabad dr manoj pahukar sir uh, he is consultant at uh, alexis hospital nagpur Dr. Alok Umre sir, he is uh, owner and director at uh, Arogyam Hospital. Dr. Ujwal Vankhede, he is a consultant orthopedic surgeon at Aryanth Hospital. Dr. Ashay Kekatpure, he is a professor at Dattamege Medical College. And I am an associate professor in this institute. So, uh, I'll be giving a brief introduction regarding what we are going to do and uh, how today is planned. Okay. So uh, today we will be having lectures in the first half covering all the aspects of the pelvis uh, injuries classification then the relevant anatomy do that dr ujwal is going to take care of after that we'll be having lectures covering the sacral fractures si injuries okay accent injuries after that we'll be breaking up for a short tea break and then we'll be having a uh, relevant discussion regarding the acetabular fractures and then we are going to divide into small groups for a small group discussions okay and in the second half we will be having demonstrations of percutaneous screw placement on cadaver by dr pranav shah sir and dr dinesh kale sir <coughs> okay because we have a single c arm so hands on will not be available for the demonstration uh, for the percutaneous screw fixation today morning today okay but tomorrow we'll be having hands on workshop on all the surgical approaches relevant to pelvis and acetabular injuries okay and later in the day we are going to have sawbone workshops covering all the aspects that are relevant to a beginner as well as to a expert covering the basics of fixation of the pelvis and acetabular injuries okay washrooms are outside nearby here also and at that end also okay and then we have a school of uh, teleconsultation room where we'll be dividing into groups i hope this helps so not to uh, waste further time we'll be starting with the first lecture i hand over mic to dr ujwal van khede so dr ujwal i as a consultant and uh, has lot of experience in the management of pelvic injuries and uh, thank you so what do you say thank you thank you aditya sir hello am i audible to you yeah. is clear yeah thank you so uh my today's topic is a relevant surgical anatomy of pelvis as such uh, uh the pelvis is so complex it has so many structures it's not possible in a very limited time to uh, convey all the structures all anatomy of a pelvis to you but what i am going to do is like uh, keep it very brief and short and as simple as possible to give you the relevance uh, how to fix the pelvis or what are the clinical relevances of every anatomy of the pelvis okay so uh, i'm starting my talk sorry ah. it's not working i think ah. starting speech so uh okay so uh relevant surgical anatomy of a pelvis uh, at outset uh, i thanks dr aditya kekatpure and all the eminent faculty to start on the very difficult pitch and opening this uh, uh, pelvic acetabular symposium thank you bagor so our objectives for today's lecture is to learn the anatomy of pelvic ring on the headings of osteology ligamentous anatomy muscular anatomy and neurovascular anatomy and to differentiate the few palpable landmarks next one so coming under the osteology we all know that the pelvis is a ring structures and it is made out of uh, three bones these are one the four median one is the sacrum and the two innominate bones this innominate bone is made of a fusion of three bones that is ilium pubis and ischium and it develops from three separate ossification centers these three uh, ossification centers meet at the triradiate cartilage which usually fuses by the age of 16 to 17 years and this forms a complete pelvis 
as such for the bony structure of a pelvis it doesn't have its inherent stability if you remove its all soft tissue so the ligaments play a very big role to provide the uh, to provide a very good stability to the pelvis the two most important joints which are involved in the pelvis or a pelvic ring is a we know sacroiliac joints two sacroiliac joints and a pubic symphysis the main function of a uh, pelvis in a view of an orthopedic surgeon is a stability and structure to allow the weight transference so coming to the pelvic osteology we know that the innominate bone it is formed by the three uh, different bones and uh, excuse me uh, this is ilium pubis and the ischium if you look at each bone differently it itself is a ring the ilium is also a ring pubis is also a ring and ischium is also a ring which connects with each other to form the pelvis so this rings when breaks up it usually breaks up at the two places not at the one place so whenever there is a fracture in at one place you should look for some uh, another fracture also so usually there are whenever the ring breaks it breaks at the two places so you should also suspect a second fracture somewhere else also usually why ilium ischium and pubis when they are <coughs> considered as a ring so if you want to fix a ring you always fix the ring at its periphery so usually the fixation points are usually at the periphery of each ring that is like ilium or the ischium or the pubis so ilium forms the biggest form uh, biggest part of this which is a fan shaped ischium which usually forms the two fifth part of a acetabulum or the posterior column and the pubis forms the anterior column of a acetabulum as well as it is very uh, important to know how to reach yeah uh, and pubis is sorry pubis is very important in a way that there are multiple muscular uh, muscle attachments over here like a rectus muscle which is uh, very important for a stopa's approach or a ilioinguinal approach so pubis is if you see there it is convert uh, it shows three parts there is a one prominence out here which is a pubic tubercle where there is a insertion of inguinal ligament pubic body uh, percutaneous screws fixation ke liye kafi important hai and the pubic root where like uh, ilium and the pubis is separated the ischium as such is very important for a posterior column uh, fixation and ischium itself acts like a sub, uh, it helps in a supporting for a sitting so what are the palpable anterior landmarks in the pelvic osteology you can feel the pelvic crest starting from the anterior superior iliac spine to the posterior uh, posterior superior iliac spine just below the anterior superior iliac spine you will have the anterior iliac anterior anterior inferior iliac spine which is very important for a few screws as well as external fixations we should know the, about the pubic tubercle also which is a, a insertion point for the inguinal ligament because here there somewhere is a landmark to put a screw out here okay coming to the next <coughs> on the posterior aspect what are the palpable posterior landmarks it's a sorry the complete iliac crest psis uh, you need to uh, visualize psis in certain cases uh, where you have to put a screws from anterior to posterior posterior to anterior and the ischial tuberosity where you can uh, in acetabulum size you may put a plate out here also so this is a, a view from the inside of a pelvis you can feel com uh, sorry so this is completely an iliac crest you can see here the si joint the si joint is divided into two parts the articular part and the, there is a some intraosseous ligament atta uh, attachment out here this is your greater sciatic notch and lesser sciatic notch which is divided by ischial spine <coughs> sorry then this is the anterior superior iliac spine which is a prominent anterior most part of iliac crest iliac fossa where the iliac muscle is completely attached and this is your iliopectineal line which forms the border of a true pelvis and the false pelvis usually no muscle crosses from this side to this side that means like a uh, iliacus muscle is above and the other muscle is below no muscle usually passes this brim and this is the border uh, which usually separates true pelvis from false pelvis so as i told you there is a true pelvis and a false pelvis false pelvis is sorry is just about the pelvic brim this false pelvis has a iliacus muscle and its posterior border and lateral border is from the iliac 
iliac fossas as well as sacro joint and sacral ala while the true pelvis just lies below the pelvis uh, pelvic brim this true pelvis usually contains most of the vital organs for a genito urinary uh, organs like uh, rectum or uh, vagina even a <coughs> prostate and urethras coming to the next part so what is exactly clinical relevance of a sacro complete hemipelvis so there are two corridors in hemipelvises if you see uh, there is one starting from the exactly tuberculum iliac towards the supraacetabular region and one starting from the AISS that is the anterior inferior iliac spine to the PSIS. These two pillars have a very strong bone and these strong uh, these pillars are used for the fixation in the forms of a in the form of the screws or in the form of the external fixations. The length is given out here. Coming to the second part, the sacrum. The sacrum is the median triangular bone. It has a five fused sacral vertebras and a rudimentary sac coccygeal bones. It has a, sorry, two rows of sacral foramina on the anterior and posterior aspects. <coughs> so the ventral aspect that is which lies inside the true pelvis is completely smooth and it is in a very close relationship with the rectum as well as a presacral venous plexus lies over here which bleeds a lot. Okay. So S1 vertebral body here forms the promontory and if you see these are the sacral alas. These lateral sacral alas usually goes from posterior superior to entero inferior in a direct uh, in a sloping position and if you find in anterior aspect there is a common iliac vessels and the lumbosacral trunk. So whenever you are putting a iliosacral screws or if you are putting anterior sacral plates, uh, you have to be very careful for that. So uh, this is a sacral ala slope as well as promontory and in x-ray you can see this, okay. And it's uh, I think like uh, Kare sir and Shah sir will tell you about this when he will be putting the percutaneous screws, how to look for it. Then. This is exactly the concept, something called as a vestibule concept, where the S1 pedicle, which is lies in a horizontal position, and uh, this is exactly the corridor where you put the iliosacral screws. I think we will come to know about this tomorrow. Coming to the ligamentous pelvic anatomy, which is very important. So uh, when we wet bear, the complete force goes, sorry, from the hip joint to the iliac bone, from SI joint, to the spine. So the major structural stability of the pelvis is usually provided here and it is provided here by the ligamentous where these are there are multiple uh, ligaments out here. These are the posterior sacroiliac, sacrospinous, sacrotuberous and the SI joints will come there and the anteriorly there is a pubic symphysis joint which acts like a strut actually. It just holds the uh, pelvis and it doesn't let fall the pelvis. But usually this is not much weight, it doesn't have much weight bearing uh, function because a lot of patients who have a exostrophy of a urinary bladder usually have a really good function of a weight bearing. So you can see in this x-ray there is no, uh, there is so much widening of a pubic symphysis uh, but patient is doing really good with a weight bearing just because it doesn't have any kind of a weight bearing. You know. Coming to the SI joint, the sacroiliac joint, if you see here. It has a two parts, the inferior articular surface which is uh, lined by the hyaline cartilage and it is almost L-shaped and this is called as a iliac tuberosity. Iliac tuberosity it doesn't have any kind of a cartilage, okay. Otherwise, uh, sorry, this is iliac part of a sacroiliac joint and this is a sacral part of a iliac joint. It is not a true synovial joint. On the iliac side it is covered by fibrocartilage while on the sacral side it is a hyaline cartilage. And when we wet bear, usually the sacrum moves dorsoventrally, okay. And this dorsoventral movement is usually prevented by something called as the interosseous ligaments, which are among the strongest ligaments in your body. So these are the interosseous ligament among the uh, between the sacroiliac joint, and these are the strongest ligaments in your body. It unites the tuberosities of the ilium and sacrum and it confers the stability to the posterior sacroiliac complex. 
So coming to the other ligaments of a pelvis on anterior aspect or pubic symphysis, there is a superior and inferior pubic ligament and the inguinal ligament. I'll come to later. On posterior aspect, there are on the on the posterior aspect of pelvis, just anterior to the sacroiliac joint, there is anterior sacroiliac ligament, iliolumbar ligament. On the posterior aspect, if you go, I'll show you later. Uh, these are there is posterior sacroiliac ligament, interosseous ligament, just I showed you, and iliolumbar ligament. Uh, if you find a transverse process fracture of a L5 fracture, consider that the iliolumbar uh, iliolumbar ligament is broken, and there is some pelvic instability. So, if any patients whose pelvis is not looking uh, looking very innocuous, but if you find the transverse fracture of a L5, consider that the iliolumbar ligament is broken. Okay. And the pelvic floor is formed by the sacrospinous ligament and the sacrotuberous ligament. So on, on anterior ligaments, what we have shown is a superior pubic ligament and inferior pubic ligament. It is also called arcuate ligament. There is a symphysis, fibrocartilages, and your inguinal ligament, which starts from the ASIS to the pubic tubercle. Coming to the posterior pelvic stability, these are the major stabilizers of your li uh, ligaments. So any injuries of a pelvis when there is an open book or the vertical, <coughs> vertical shear, uh, lateral compression, usually uh, these ligaments are damaged. On the anterior aspect, <coughs> sorry, this is iliolumbar ligament as I told you, again, and anterior sacroiliac ligaments and on the posterior aspect these are the ligaments which are the among the strongest ligaments these are posterior sacroiliac ligament dorsal sacroiliac ligament and the superficial sacrococcygeal ligament while the sacrospinous ligament and the sacrotuberous ligament although forms the posterior aspect it forms also the pelvic floor so what forces are prevented by the each ligament? So anterior sacroiliac ligaments, it usually raises the external rotation of a heavy pelvis. Posterior SI ligament, craniocaudal. So if anterior SI ligaments, sorry, broken, then there is a usually open book of injury. You can find anterior SI ligaments are broken. Posterior SI ligament, vertical shear ligaments. Iliolumbar ligament, as I told you, there it, it raises the rotation of a pelvis. Okay, and even sacrospinous ligament and sacrotuberous ligament ex resist external rotation and craniocaudal translation. Coming to the muscular anatomy, uh, just a brief. In the pelvic, on iliac fossa, you can find the iliacus muscle. As you, as I told you, below pelvic, uh, pelvic brim, there is obturator internus muscle. On the outside of a pelvis, if you see, there are three gluteal lines giving rise to the glutei as well as other muscles. Uh, here obturator internus and external muscle is there which forms a sling for the superior pubic ramales. Coming to the neurovascular pelvic anatomy which is very important because initial management of a pelvis injury usually have a lot of hemorrhage and why it bleeds a lot and which no vessels should be considered is considered. So coming to the first neural pelvic anatomy, there is a lumbosacral plexus and a lot of uh, nerves gets uh, arise from it here. So iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, genitofemoral, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So out of this, I think obturator nerve, which you can find uh, in your cadavers, the most important. Then the sciatic nerve from the posterior aspect. Then there is also superior gluteal nerve which passes from the your uh, super, uh, sorry greater sciatic notch and the pudendal nerves. Some even the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve when you do the certain uh, approaches, which is very important. So, what is the importance when you do the anterior sacroiliac uh, plating? Uh, L4, L5 root of a uh, lumbosacral trunk usually passes just anterior to the sacrum. You have to be very careful there. Sciatic nerve, which passes through the greater sciatic notch just below the pyriformis, but it also has some anatomic, uh, anatomic versions or anatomic, uh, I would say, different, uh, different anatomic variants. 
So you have to be very careful about the sciatic nerve also. And obturator nerve, this obturator nerve usually passes through the true, pel uh, true pelvis to the uh, obturator foramina. And this is your obturator nerve's course. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So again, this is the L5 nerve root, which is just 2 centimeter medial to the SI joint. Have to be very careful in the il uh, iliosacroiliac uh, screws. Then this is a sciatic nerve. You have to know the variants. <coughs> Coming to the vascular, then there is a common iliac vessel. With this common iliac vessels ex uh, divided into external and internal iliac. Usually this internal iliac artery bleeds in a pelvis injuries. Out of this, there are two in, uh, important branches, anterior and posterior. The posterior branch, which bleeds a lot. So posterior branch, which are the superior gluteal arteries and iliolumbar arteries, which bleeds a lot. Sometimes even the uh, this inferior gluteal nerve also, artery also bleeds. Uh, usually visceral branches supplies blood to the visceral parts of the body. So uh, they are not too uh, much bleeding. Then this is the uh, anatomy of a presacral venous flexus. This is the majority, uh, this is the source of a majority of a hemorrhage. You need to close the potential space to stop the hemorrhage out here. And this is something called as a corona mortis. Uh, this corona mortis you will find while doing the uh, stopas approach. And it's a anastomosis between the obturator and the external iliac or inferior epigastric system. Coming to the last part, perineum. So female perineum is formed by the pelvic diaphragm, which have a urethra, vagina, and rectum. Structures, these structures are relatively pliable, are not commonly injured. But vagina may be perforated by bone spicules from pubic rami fractures in lateral compression injury. These are my references. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Dr. Ujwal. And uh, after, like you have known the pelvic anatomy, and uh, we will be covering more of that as we go on the cadaveric lab tomorrow. So I have been uh, classification of pelvic injuries. So I'll be briefly covering this, okay? And uh, is not working. So. Uh, there are several classification systems that are available for classifying the pelvic injuries. Tiles classification is one. It basically classifies pelvic injuries into stable, unstable. Okay. So stable will be type A, fractures not involving the pelvic ring. A2 will be stable, minimally displaced fractures. Type B is rotationally unstable but vertically stable. Okay. Then, and then uh, type C is rotationally and vertically unstable. Yeah, please skip this. So now I'll be mainly speaking regarding the Young and Burgess classification because it takes into account the uh, force type, the severity of injury, the direction and as well as addresses the instability and it is the classification system that is commonly used whenever we are speaking regarding pelvic fractures. Okay. So now uh, Young and Burgess classification classifies into a lateral compression injury. So now the force of vector that is coming is coming from lateral aspect. Okay. So now. <coughs> It subclassifies into uh, type 1, type 2 and type 3. So now you can see the force of vector has come and you will always see a Ramaya fracture in case of lateral compression injury. And it can, it will be associated in type 1 with a sacral fracture on the side of impact. So there will be indentation on the sacral side. So as the force vector increases, you will see more of posterior injuries. So there will be a crescent fracture on the posterior aspect. This is a mandatory part of that. And as the vectors continue, it will open up the contralateral pelvis. 
So there will be associated open book injury on the contralateral side. So now see this. So LC1, so now you can see, so whenever you see a plane uh, pelvis with both hip x-ray, you always see a, so pelvis is like a ring. Okay. So most of the times what we see, Next. Next click kara. Hey, Samur ka one jata hai. Hey, karna hai. Tu wahi nikala kya? Arey, tum chakadi aise USB port dal rahe. Nay, 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 ujwal sir. So, okay. So now you can see there is an injury on the posterior aspect with the pubic ramus fracture. So this is LC1 injury. So to the next thing then. Marker nahi laga. Isut nahi nahi karan. So now LC2 injury. So there is a pubic ramus fracture and now on the posterior aspect there is a sacral fracture. Okay, so crescent fracture on the back. So crescent fractures will be covered by Dr. Pranav Shasar. Next. So LC3 injury. Now you can see uh, the mechanism of injury is going laterally and you will see an open book injury on the contralateral side. Now in this case there is an associated acetabular fracture also. So now coming to the APC injury, anterior posterior compression. So the victim, the there is an injury from the front and now there will be always a pubic symphysis diastasis okay along with that so there will be minor opening of the symphysis and SI joint injury anteriorly now we have known the ligaments so now try to understand as the injury increases so there is an impact the pubic symphysis is opening and now the anterior sacroiliac ligaments are getting strained up so that is type 1 okay so there will be minimal opening now uh, it is standardly said it is less than 2.5 centimeter and this can be managed conservatively okay but again that can be discussed because it more depends on the dynamic instability now in type 2 it opens up more and there are intact posterior sacroiliac ligaments so now the anterior ligaments are completely gone and now it is starting opening up and then coming to type 3 there is a complete disruption of the sacroiliac ligaments okay so we'll go to the case studies So now in type 1, so now the pubic symphysis is open, okay, it is less than 2.5 up to 2.5 centimeter and the anterior ligaments are, the anterior SI joint has just opened up. In type 2, now this is associated with the IT fracture, you can see. There is opening of the anterior SI joint on the left side, you can see the arrow. In type 3, what has happened is there is a complete disruption of the pubic symphysis and there is a left side you can see disruption of the sacroiliac complex. So this is APC3. Now then coming to vertical shear. Now what is happening in vertical shear? Now whenever the patient has a history of fall from height, the complete hemipelvis will go upwards. Okay. So there is vertical displacement with symphysis diastasis. Now it has opened up or the rami fracture anteriorly, the iliac wing or the sacral. So sacral fracture it will be transforaminal based on the classification of the sacral fracture. Okay. So now this is what the concise a screenshot of Young and Burgess classification. 
and this is what is important whenever we are going to manage a pelvis fracture patient okay or there can be a combined type that's it so i have kept it concise if you have any questions we'll be having small group discussions to discuss various cases of that okay and we can discuss it further okay thank you so now we have dr manoj pavukar sir he is going to speak regarding the anterior ring injuries So, a very good morning to all of you. And first of all, I must congratulate uh, the Datta Mege and the, all the organizing team for uh, arranging this fantastic pelvicetabular cadaveric workshop. So my job is to make you understand the anterior pelvic ring injuries. And I think in all uh, like orthopedic practice, we know the mainly the, if there is a polytrauma patient or the patient is having multiple injury, your pelvis AP X-ray is the most important X-ray you need to understand. A good pelvis X-ray properly centered, we'll have that in the case discussion, how to take the proper AP and that will delineate your almost 90% of injury. You can identify almost everything. You need CT scan only in few cases where you want to see the posterior complex injury, some rotation or sometimes the abdominal things which you are able to do. So already this young Burgess classification, Dr. Aditya has very well maintained. And what is the importance of this classification? It makes you understand the potential, what you wanted to go further. If you see a APC kind of injury, hemodynamic instability. Lateral compression is associated injuries as much more. Vertical instability, it's a most severe, most form of this pelvic injury. So like, uh, so the pelvis is usually a very stable because of the ligaments and all the bony architecture. Then the type of uh, instability starts first the rotational instability. Okay, it could be either with the APC injury or the lateral compression injury, then the most unstable pelvis is the vertically unstable injury. So this is what a rotationally unstable pelvis like. So it is mainly the external rotation force, it opens up, anteriorly this pubic symphysis is gone, pubic rama is gone and sometimes the uh, isolated uh, posterior uh, this injury. So once you understand this is how vertically unstable injury, whole of this hemi pelvis is suddenly lifted up. Okay, it is somehow uh, dissociated from rest of these things. So what ultimately all these rotational or uh, this uh, vertical stable causes, there is a huge increase in volume of this pelvis. Okay, so it usually this uh, anterior lesion injuries which I am going to discuss, uh, they are mainly these uh, pubic diastasis, the pubic rami fractures, the straddle kind of fractures and uh, the associated injuries you need to take into consideration. So the most common are the APC open book injuries. And uh, what the first, uh, if you see this open back injury, what should first should come to mind is the hemodynamic the patient will have an uh, systolic uh, like uh, hypotension, he will be landing into the peripheral circulatory failure collapse, this uh, you need to understand. So all the anterior pelvic ring injuries, the first part is usually the initial resuscitation protocol, early stabilization of pelvis is most important and once this, all these things into uh, stabilize, then you can go for the definitive stabilization. So all institutes wherever you are practicing, they should have their own algorithm for treating this pelvic injuries. These are very critical and very high energy injuries. They have got mortality of almost more than 20 to 25 percent. Especially if it is an open pelvic injury, you should understand the severity, the mortality will increase very high. And they are usually have some associated, once you see pelvic fracture, there has to be some associated injury most of the times and they are life threatening. So this is a simple case scenario, a young male, 
presented to your ER and uh, the most important is the pelvis AP. This will give a most of the idea. You can see on one side there is dislocation, on the other side there is uh, fracture of the shaft fever. You can see a wide open uh, pelvic injury and obviously he has to be in shock, okay, with such kind of thing. The pelvis volume increases suddenly and he will be having systolic dysfunction, okay, like uh, the peripheral circuit, another kind of injury, rollover injury, again severe kind of injury. You can see injury anteriorly as well as extending to the posteriorly. Severely multiple side crush fractures, okay, so this patient uh, with this uh, instability will also have an hemodynamic instability. So our first priority for all anterior pelvic injuries is to determine from where the bleeding is happening. You should always rule out the other sides, the abdomen, the chest or the other uh, like uh, DICs are very common in early 24 hours and once all these are ruled out the pelvic fracture remains your mainstay. This is bound by uh, this uh, ligament which will as uh, very well uh, told you about this anatomy. This is what is happening. Usually pelvis which is closed it is a kind of spear. Okay once it becomes an open book injury it becomes a kind of cylinder and then it can accumulate at least 3 or 4 or 5 liters of blood which is even more if it is a vertical unstable the volume becomes infinite you have to reduce this pelvic volume and uh, you need to have some protocol so as to arrest this bleeding so in pelvis there, there are three main sources of bleeding one is your venous source which is most important 70 percent is from venous which you cannot control or uh, apart from some uh, things which you can do the another way is around the bony side fracture disruption which will cause more bleeding and third are the arterial but they are again very less 10 to 15 percent so these are the various methods like uh, once this patient is with you in an ER, that becomes a very dire emergency for all the orthopedic surgeon. You can apply any of these methods so as to stabilize. Simultaneous, you need to go for investigation, ICC for resuscitation. This is simply uh, in ER, you can do this thing. Okay, just wrapping a sheet around your pelvis, uh, flexing the hip and internal rotating. This will reduce your pelvis volume. Another is just circumferential, you can just wrap up the sheet. So this will, uh, this is a very important resuscitative manual, very inexpensive. And they, they, they see how uh, this pelvis will close down even by this simply wrapping up this sheet around the pelvis, just clamping it with these towel clips and you can reduce the pelvis volume immediately. Another is uh, Dr. Aditya was in a dynamic uh, stability, but sometimes this will need a good uh, further like anesthesia. Dynamic instability, anterior pelvis, you can certainly make out. The next comes if the patient is not stabilizing. You are, you are given volume, uh, this, uh, this uh, blood transfusion, everything, but it is not responding. The next line, which very simply is to do an anterior external pelvic fixator. I have done it in the ER itself. It's a very simple, very easy procedure which you can apply at all the, uh, uh, like uh, initially always go for fluid resuscitation, blood transfusions. And uh, uh, what does this do? It prevents any disruption of clot. It uh, decreases the pelvic volume. But mind well, they, it will not support any of this uh, the posterior disruption. So this is mainly used in open book injury and uh, the pelvic fixator, the second most common condition where there is a contamination open pelvic injury where this will be most important. So this is like, uh, this is what the frame usually I do. Just put two or three pins in this uh, ASIS, a trapezoidal kind of frame structure. Always try to put one or two of these suprasoidal pins to additionally get the stability. Uh, for this you need some image intensifier but this anterior external fixator with the uh, iliac crest and they should be like uh, we can even ambulate uh, these patients uh, with this fixator. Sometimes nowadays we see that the, 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 there is a decrease in uses of this fixator but still it has got its own indication. It's a very good tool, uh, very effective tool which I have experienced. So this is the same patient which we have discussed the anterior uh, this uh, open pubic uh, diastasis uh, immediately was dissipated not responded we have just put this uh, xfix in the er itself we could dissipate him and then uh, once the primary stabilization and hemodynamic stabilization has been done you can go for this definitive fixation this uh, this was iliangular approach long back and uh, this uh, plating this uh, pubic symphysis was uh, fixed then uh, this uh, uh, the opposite side uh, shaft femur this can be used and patient can be ambulated with this fixator as well. This is the further. This is another second case which I discussed the, uh, the severe uh, uh, kind of pelvic injury again hemodynamic stabilization similar kind of extension though it will not get a good stability but it will temporarily stabilize and could give a, these are the further final uh, these are then the further uh, definitive surgeries uh, which you can do in this patient for these things. So if the patient is not responding with hemodynamic then the uh, like uh, 
your fixate at the third uh, becomes your retroperitoneal packing, abdominal laparotomy, retroperitoneal packing. Then angiography is certainly indicated after 24 hours. You are given a lot of five or six blood transfusion and patient is still. Then the angiography do have a role, but only in 10% of cases. But mind well, even this modality is there and institution of this having. Then the open pelvic injuries, we all know that uh, they will be having uh, usually associated some genital urinary or the gastrointestinal problem. These associated injuries and the high mortality, uh, you must uh, uh, understand this is a case of this uh, pelvic fixator which was applied for the same lady and uh, we were able to like, uh, she was having sciatic nerve palsy on one side, otherwise she was doing well. So the mainly the anterior injury here, you need to just stop the bleeding, pack the wounds. You should always look for the associated injuries like uh, the soft tissue injury, the uh, associated fracture, this moral laval lesion, we all know. There's a lot of uh, bleeding. This is a basically an internal degloving kind of injury. A lot of bleeding would get accumulated here. You need to identify this thing and evacuate it. And then definitive management, once these things are done, it always takes a precedence. You certainly do have to stage it, like the major uh, pelvic surgeries, abdominal surgeries, which sometimes take it uh, and the second and fourth day. We should try to avoid any surgery which is more than three hours in especially a polytrauma kind of case. This simple pubic diastasis uh, can be, should be treated. If it is more than 2.5 cylinder, if it's less and dynamic uh, instability is there, you can just put simply plate. But if it associated with posterior injury or there is severe disruption, nowadays dual plating is certainly recommended. And it is a simple, uh, uh, this plating anterior uh, symphysis with this final style incisal, like this, uh, this is the kind of initial plates we used to use. Nowadays, uh, this uh, long uh, segment uh, plates uh, encompassing may sometimes the posterior injuries can also be tackled uh, with this incision. And uh, dual plate fixation, it is certainly biomechanically more stronger, much advocated and should be done. And uh, there and there are an anterior pelvic injury, there are other injuries, the ramas screws. Again, this is a very simple, effective tool. But you have to be very cautious about this uh, being proximity to the various neurovascular structures. And we will be having a practical demo as to how to put this uh, sacroiliac or this uh, pubic uh, ramas screw uh, independently. Then there are a few other anterior injuries like this straddle injuries. These are all will be associated with some uh, bladder or the urethral injuries. So uh, most of the times you may not need surgery, but nowadays the demanding patients are uh, like such kind of displacement, though this is not my case. But uh, these kind of injuries you can certainly fix uh, very well so as to start ambulating early. Then uh, this is another modality. This is again like uh, this uh, internal fixator, which we see in obese patient. This could also sometimes uh, reduce uh, the pelvic volume and could improve this thing. Nowadays, uh, even I have seen this case on the internet, like in 83 year old with uh, such a fragility or osteoporotic fracture, anterior injuries. Nowadays, even they are advocating so as to start ambulating even this uh, uh, huge fixation and uh, start ambulating this patient early. So regardless of whatever the anterior uh, pelvic injury, but it's important to also get the posterior stability of all these anterior injuries. So in summary, it's like if uh, whenever there is hemodynamic stability, just uh, show up, go, go for help. It's a multidisciplinary approach. You should try to involve everybody. Uh, to identify the kind of instabilities, having stabilize it. You can uh, use the methods which are discussed. Very important to go for good imaging modalities. You need to understand this pelvic anatomy. Uh, learn hemodynamic and uh, pelvic instability principles. Do whatever algorithm uh, which you need to develop for your institution. Follow that. And these are very life-saving, like in orthopedics, uh, vascular injury, cervical spine injury, and pelvic injury. These are the only dreaded immediate injuries which could cause fatality. So you need to be very cautious and try to develop some algorithm which is practically available uh, wherever you are working. So thank you very much. So now, uh, till now, we have covered the basics of pelvis anatomy, like we have come through the uh, clinical anatomy, then to the classification, and now, uh, like Dr. Manur sir has covered the anterior pelvic ring injuries. Now, you are in the ER, uh, on-duty doctor, and you see a patient of pelvic fracture coming to you. 
So what should be the initial steps that you should be doing to, man uh, to stabilize the patient, that is very critical. Because seeing the fancy x-rays does look good, but saving the patient is critical. Okay. So now Dr. Suyograti is going to speak regarding what you should do in the first 24 hours when the patient uh, comes in the ER. So that will be covered now. First of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present here in front of such a good audience. First hour. So, I am going to cover what you have to do in first hour in emergency room. The, a polytrauma patient is lined up in emergency room. You are an on-call doctor. Generally, Generally, pelvis injury is a generally pelvis injury is a high trauma injury. It has a disruption of pelvis ring requires significant injury. So it also have a associated injury because of that. Resulted from motor vehicle accident. A bimodal distribution in young adults we get a motor vehicle accidents and in Elderly females, low energy trauma without associated injuries. There are some clinical signs which make you suspect there is a pelvis injury, such as a external rotation of both the lower limbs, severe external rotation in bilateral open book fracture. You can get this kind of picture. In lateral compression fracture, there is an internal rotation and shortening of one side of the limb. And moral levis lesion, these are the some clinical signs which make you suspect there is a pelvis injury. Then physical examination. Physical examination should not used to rule out pelvic fracture. Useful for patients which are awake and alert in unconscious patient, unstable patient, stress movement of pelvis may lead to the dislodgement of clot. So you should not do more physical examinations there. A hemodynamically stable patient, certainly you can do some tests like a compression stress on pelvis which give you idea about the instability. A direct uh, tenderness can be checked on anterior uh, side on pubic symphysis. Uh, the wide opening can be palpated there. And with the affected pelvis, you can lower limb traction and see for the instability. This you can do for a pelvis examination. X-rays. A AP X-ray is must in all polytrauma patient, in all unconscious patients. A AP X-ray is must. AP pelvis X-ray. If you are not suspecting pelvis injury, still a AP pelvis X-ray is in a ATLS protocol for all blunt trauma patients. In hemodynamically unstable patient, only AP X-ray should be done. You should not waste time in doing all other views. In hemodynamically stable patient with AP X-ray, you can do some more X-rays light inlet and outlet view to see the injuries. The fallacy of AP X-ray is that you cannot see anteroposterior displacement in AP X-rays. So sometimes if you do only AP X-ray, you can miss this. So there is an inlet view which you show you anterior and posterior displacement and outlet view which will give idea about the vertical displacement. This is AP X-ray we have to do in emergency. This type of injuries generally come with hemodynamically unstable. Their BP is falling, they are in a shock. So first we have to resuscitate them. Patient of pelvis fracture is a risk of massive hemorrhage. There is a disruption of pelvis vascula vasculatures. Implement damage control resuscitation. Give blood products in 1 is to 1 is to 1 ratio of RBC, plasma and platelets. Fluid resuscitation should be with 
aim of permissive hypotension. You should not aim for a normal BP. You should not aim for a map of 70 or 80. It will create more bleeding. If you achieve a map of 70, 80, it will create a more bleeding. So nowadays they say go for a permissive hypotension. A map around 60 will give sufficient blood to brain, kidney and that will be enough. So you should not waste time in putting fluids and fluids to achieve the map of 75 or 80. If patient is unstable, you are giving blood, give trimexamic acid. Trimexamic acid works wonderfully in such situations. Trimexamic acid prevent clogged breakdown, make reduced bleeding, load with one gram of IV bolus, avoid resuscitation to lower limb sites. Never, if they are polytrauma patient, many times you can have fractures to upper limb and you tend to, if you tend to do a resuscitation from lower limb, it will lead to the blood in the pelvis again. It will get uh, accumulate there. So if upper limb is not accessible, then go for a central line, but don't do resuscitation from lower limb. Pelvic rim fracture, bind the pelvis to control hypotension to reduce the bleeding bind the pelvis, decrease, binding the pelvis will decrease the space in the pelvis to, and it will create a tamponade effect that will control the venous bleeding. Binding will increase the map for short term, so patient can be, go for a definitive management or you can shift to the patient to tertiary center. Binding the pelvis also help to stabilize the sharp bony fragment. So they don't cause further damage and decreases the bleeding. Sheet wrapping, it is available everywhere in every setup and this is easiest thing you can do. But while wrapping the sheet, you have to see that you have to close the pelvis. Pelvis is an open book fracture, both fragments are externally rotated. So you have to give traction to the both lower limb, make them internally rotate and then wrap the sheet. Sheet should be at the level of, uh, upper side is at the level of ASIS and so it should be centered around GT. The pressure over GT will lead to the closure of pelvis. So this is the method of close reduction of open book injury. It should be made completely tight and clamped and then take again x-ray, it will show that it was reduced. Second thing available is pelvic binder. It is commercially available, easily available and you can use this also. Make sure the device of choice is lay over bilateral greater trochanter. It should be centered on greater trochanter and proper amount of pressure should be applied. Give vertical traction to both lower limb and internally rotate it. Once sheet is wrapping is done, left it undisturbed, but you cannot keep it more than 48 hours. It will cause skin necrosis. Skin is there is already damaged and it can cause so then you have to go for an external fixator or a definitive fixation depending on condition of patient. Next important thing you have to do is focus assess sonography of trauma examinations. This is the tool very important to see from where bleeding is happening. Patient is in hypotension and you have to decide it is he is bleeding from where. So it covers all the four cavities of the body perihepatic, perisplenic, pelvis and pericardium. Nowadays they do EFAST, that is extended fast assessment of sonography trauma patients. It also covers the both uh, lungs also. So they see for the blood in lungs also. This is must in such patients. Advantage of fast, it is very fast, non-invasive, can be performed while resuscitation the patient. If you go for a CT scan, you have to stop resuscitation. This can be done in ER only with resuscitation going on can be very sensitive. Disadvantage, it is operator dependent. You should have a good radiologist. Body habitus may limit the quality and sensitivity. Not organ specific, cannot detect hollow viscous and retroperitoneal injuries. So in unstable fracture patient, hemodynamically unstable pelvis fracture patient, if fast is positive, then he should go to OR for expiratory laparotomy. There is a bleeding, intraperitoneal bleeding, that should be first taken care of. If fast is negative or indeterminate, go for a peritoneal tap. 
diagnostic peritoneal tap. If it is positive, again patient will go for expiratory laparotomy. Most important is first control intraperitoneal bleeding. If DPT is negative, extraperitoneal packing or pelvis angiography are the two tools we have to control this bleeding. If it is a venous bleeding, most of the time, 75 to 80 percent of time, it is always a venous bleeding. So it can be controlled with extraperitoneal pelvic packing. Sometimes it is a arterial bleeding, that time you need a pelvic angiography and embolization. In pelvic embolization, they do a angiography, see the which vessel is bleeding and specifically embolize that vessel to control the bleeding. It need a cath lab setup. Most of the patient, they have a venous hemorrhage. So venous hemorrhage is more common. Mechanism is retrograde blood flow through the valveless portal venous and collect in the pelvic sink. Major disruption of perisacral and perivesical flexes lead to the huge bleeding and make patient go in drastic shock. So their pelvic packing has a role. Pelvic packing is a extra peritoneal packing with a vertical laparotomy incision in spaces of recess behind the bladder and uh, extra periodonially, you just pack the mops to make a tamponade effect and control the venous bleeding. So algorithm is in trauma patient if hemodynamically stable, stable pelvic rim assess for definitive management. If unstable pelvic rim, close observation for occult pelvic bleeding is he is going in hypotension. Hemodynamically unstable, but stable pelvic ring, pelvic ring is stable, then see for the other causes of uh, hypotension. If pelvic ring is also unstable, then there is a sheet wrapping and external fixator you can do. Still, if you are unstable, you can go for uh, exploratory laparotomy. That with that, you have to do external fixator application. And if still unstable, then CT angiogram and you have to go for a embolization. Do not miss associated injury. Most commonly associated injury are chest trauma, head trauma, intraperitoneal trauma, genitourinary injuries, and long bone injuries. So we will cover how to see for a genitourinary injuries in this patient. Blood urethral meatus. If you see a blood at urethral meatus, it give you indication that there is a possibility of genitourinary injuries. Genitourinary injury is more common in adult male, they have uh, urethral injuries and women, they have bladder injuries. Catheterization should be avoided. If you see blood at meatus, catheterization should be avoided. You should go by a retroperitoneal, retrograde contrast uh, should be given and a cystogram should be done. Cystogram, uh, extra cystogram can be done in a alert patient. You have to give the contrast retrogradely and still he feels uncomfortable, you can give contrast and then take an x-ray. So it is difficult in trauma situations. So go for a CT cystogram. CT cystogram is the choice, uh, investigation of choice. The clinical prediction for extraperitoneal bladder rupture is gross hematuria, microscopic hematuria with more than 30 RBC, diastatic pelvic symphysis disruption. If more than one centimeter uh, diastasis is there, you should suspect there can be a very high chances of injury to the bladder. Fracture of obturator ring and displacement more than one centimeter. This thing should make you suspect there can be an injury to bladder or urethra. Specific physical examination should include pelvis assessment, assessment of pelvic stability and the digital rectal examination. There are some absolute indications for uh, imaging for bladder that is blunt penetrating trauma. Okay. 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 So the investigation of choice in such cases is CT cystogram. Now I will give you the, what are the recommendations for the pelvis trauma in the emergency room. Time taken between arrival in emergency department and definitive bleeding control should be minimized. That is very important. Serum lactate and base deficit will represent the 
status of shock they are the marker how much hypoxia has already happened use pelvic ring uh, pelvis x-ray and fast in emergency department these two things are must in all polytrauma patients who are hemodynamically unstable hemodynamically stable pelvis fracture multiphasic ct scan and intravenous contrast should be done when there is a suspicion of uh, bladder injury uh, retrograde urethrogram or ct urethrogram should be done perineal and rectal digital examination in cases of high suspicion of rectal injury if rectal examination po positive proctoscopy is recommended avoid non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs until hemorrhage has been excluded they can increase hemorrhage open pelvic fracture empiric antibiotic should be given in first 6 hours associated perforation of bowel or vagina is suspected then go for a broad spectrum antibiotics also cover anaerobic and gram negative open pelvic fracture prophylaxis again tetanus should be given thank you Thank you, Suyok sir. And uh, now that uh, we have understood, like when a patient comes to the ER, what things we need to do. Okay. So has uh, like we have covered the basics, and now we have managed the patient. And now we are going. We have already discussed the entering injuries. Now we are going towards the posterior side. Okay. So now Dr. Vikram Sapre will be covering the SI joint injuries. Okay. Sacroiliac joint injuries. And after that, we'll be having a talk. So any questions? Any questions now you want to ask something, any experiences? So now regarding very important thing, uh, regarding the rectal examination, now I'll share my own personal experience. I was uh, on-duty on doctor. There was nothing, uh, the patient had a history of RDA and the surgery team said the patient doesn't require any surgical, inter uh, surgical intervention. That's the patient's BPV was uh, drastically falling. And we just shifted the patient on the side and there was profuse bleeding per rectal. Okay. So that is why complete exposure of the patient is very essential when you are doing a first screening of the patient. And uh, just uh, as a tip, always whenever you are uh, assessing an emergency patient, start writing your notes like a primary skeletal survey and then a secondary skeletal survey. So what will happen in your primary skeletal survey, you always mention if the patient is unconscious that you are not able to assess all the tenderness and every every point but exposure and looking at the genitalia is very crucial so i was called for operating a pelvis fracture at a periphery center i went over there and i just stripped the patient and there was a uh, uh, this thing genital complete lesion on the genitalia it was complete tear of the vagina the primary surgeon didn't bother to see that okay the one primary reason was the patient was in severe pain and that was one reason he couldn't explore that. But always, always, always see the perineal region properly whenever you are suspecting a pelvic fracture. Okay? So we'll go to the next stop. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Adit. And I would like to thank Adit and uh, the organizing committee uh, for organizing and giving us opportunity uh, to speak here. And I think uh, the cadaveric lab at uh, Sananta is a great asset uh, for all of us. And, uh, you know, it's a really a great boon for easy learning. <coughs> uh, coming to uh, discussion on SI joint injuries, diagnosis and management. I think uh, there will be a lot of overlap, so I'll be uh, precise here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, we have already discussed uh, in detail uh, the bony anatomy of pelvis, which can be classified into a, a true pelvis and a false pelvis. Uh, the latter being the a true pelvis, uh, which uh, host uh, all the internal pelvic organs and vascular structures. So, which is more important. Uh, <coughs> looking at the uh, anatomy of uh, pelvic ring. If we see the pelvic ring, uh, the pelvic ring uh, is uh, the bony conformity of pelvic ring is by uh, both the innominate bone and the sacrum, as well as the three joints, which are sacroiliac joint, uh, both sacroiliac joints, and anteriorly by pubic symphysis. 
the ligamentous uh, stability is provided by uh, the i mean to say the this the forms the stat, uh, static uh, stability the dynamic stability is provided by the ligaments the tendons and the musculature uh, there so uh, coming to the diagnosis of si joints uh, once we have uh, resuscitated the patient stabilized the patient then coming to the final uh, diagnosis of pelvic injuries the most important thing which we need to do and still the gold standard is the uh, pelvic x-ray standard ap x-ray uh, pelvic inlet and outlet views uh, will give you a fair idea of uh, what we are going to manage in this pelvic injury so routine L, uh, additionally uh, these basic x-rays they uh, help us uh, they take less time and so uh, give us uh, we can diagnose these injuries early so x-rays are very important three simple x-rays for the pelvic injury so uh, what we do is uh, the inlet view outlet view and ap view inlet view is uh, directed uh, 25 degree cephalid and uh, the outlet view is 50 degree corded earlier we used to do uh, 45 45 but uh, the recent recommendations being 25 and 50 degree so on the inlet uh, view uh, that's the inlet view you can see uh, the pelvic ring uh, completely the posterior displacement you can see so in this x-rays you can assess the uh, type of injury what are the injuries the uh, injuries to the anterior pelvic ring posterior side injuries and the amount of displacement the vertical shear you can see so all these things you can diagnose on simple x-rays and once your diagnosis is done uh, we need to further establish uh, what we are going to do so depend for the planning so we do a ct scan where you can assess what is the mechanism of injury what is the degree of injury how much is the displacement whether this is a stable injury or not additionally you can also see injuries to the pelvic organs and uh, the plan for management can be decided with the ct scan so uh, these are the two uh, main things uh, x rays and ct scan where we need to uh, do a di complete diagnosis of pelvic injury what kind of injury is what uh, type of injury means uh, what was the kind of uh, displacement uh, out there and what we need to plan this is all after you have done your initial resuscitation resuscitation so uh, on ct scan uh, on especially on the 3d scan you can see the injuries uh, the, the here you can see sacral injuries or you can also see transverse process uh, avulsion fractures which is just uh, uh, ilolumbar ligamentous avulsion you can assess uh, other injuries also the anterior injuries on 2d uh, images you need to further uh, evaluate and assess the amount of displacement if there are any bony fragments in the si joint or if there are any reason uh, for uh, hampering of reduction or in uh, kind of uh, sacral morphology all these things can be assessed on ct scan ct scan also ca can give us a sort of a customized idea of what should be your inlet and outlet angle so on outlet angle should be perpendicular to anterior uh, cortex of s1 and uh, inlet view inlet angle so this you can decide this you can individualize for every patient based on your ct scan so coming to uh, si joint injuries management si joint injuries uh, can be classified this was a classification given by tan in which the type 1 injuries are anterior sacral injuries or anterior sacral dislocation type 2 are posterior sacral dislocation and uh, type 3 are crescent fracture dislocations uh, which uh, pranavsar will further uh, give us here so coming to uh, type 1 anterior dislocations you can see the dislocation complete uh, dislocation here anteriorly this is the type 2 uh, si joint uh, or the posterior dislocation the sacrum is dislocated posteriorly sorry and the crescent fractures or the fracture dislocations which are more common amongst the all so coming to the management of uh, unstable and displaced uh, si joint uh, dislocations uh, the surgical management uh, we can do an anterior plating or if it's uh, well reducible you can do ilosacral screws anterior plating uh, the advantage is uh, when your si joint is not getting reduced it helps us uh, in achieving the reduction if there are uh, if your bony uh, fragments or cartilage incarcerated you can clean uh, the si joint you can divide the si joint and if you need an additional uh, fracture fixation of uh, innominate bone 
then this will be uh, beneficial. Ilocecal uh, screw, percutaneous screw. This is a uh, uh, good technique in which uh, it can be done percutaneously and it's a, a completely fluoroscopic dependent procedure. So uh, you don't need to open, but a prerequisite is you should be able to achieve a complete uh, close reduction, anatomical close reduction. So enter plating, main indications are SI joint fracture dislocations where you need to fix uh, the ileum also. Uh, when close reduction is not possible, uh, it gives a complete visualization of SI joint from anteriorly as well as superiorly. Uh, additionally, ILEC crest, ILEC fossa and lateral ELA are also um, exposed. But the exposure, uh, as we have discussed, it's limited by L5 nerve root, so you cannot go medially more than uh, around 1.5 to 2 centimeters. So uh, coming to the exposure, this exposure or the approach is uh, primarily through the lateral window of ileal approach. You go completely till SI joint. Uh, to improve the exposure, what you need to do is use four Homan's uh, retractors. Uh, two of the small spikes are hammered into the sacral ala, around uh, 1.5 to 2 centimeters. You have to be very careful here. Uh, you can see the L5 nerve root is close to it. You need to have one anteriorly on the SI joint and one posteriorly on the sacrum. So there are a lot of vital structure here anteriorly also and we uh, medially it's the L5 nerve root. So we need to be very careful, very small window is available for us for the fixation. So uh, the reduction maneuvers which we, we may require here, uh, reduction <coughs> maneuver we need to close the SI joint. So uh, you can give a manual uh, compression uh, on the pressure on ileum or you can use shan spins. Uh, in the ileum or you can use any of the reduction clamps, uh, Farabaugh or Junglat, uh, to achieve the SI joint reduction. So if you can see, sorry. So we have on uh, the medial side on the LR, we have a very limited uh, space available which is limited by L5 nerve root. So uh, once you have done a complete exposure, the fixation, uh, you can use uh, two plates. It doesn't matter whether you put the plate parallel or uh, in a uh, uh, angulated form. Uh, the there is no effect on the stability. You can give 60 to 90 degree of angulation, uh, which will help you increase the length of the screws. And uh, it's better to per pre drill uh, the screw uh, hole on the uh, ailer side before applying the plate. So this was one case uh, where the, it was a fracture dislocation out here. So the CD, a few fragments out there in SI joint also. So we debrided it. We did a, uh, we applied two plates over here and a plate for the ileum and anterior fixation also was done. So uh, coming next to a sacro uh, screw fixation for SI joint. It's a basically a fluoroscopic guided technique in, uh, as I said earlier, it's a prerequisite is to have a completely reduced SI joint. So it wouldn't, it's difficult to, uh, you can't achieve reduction out there. So if you're able to reduce it by manual methods, then you go for a uh, percutaneous screw. For SI joint, we need a partially threaded screw, while if you're uh, doing uh, for the sacral, you have to use a um, fully threaded screws where you don't need a compression out there. And uh, you can increase the fix, uh, you can put additional uh, uh, SI joint screw. Uh, you can use a S1 and S2 corridor also and additional plate posteriorly or anteriorly you can use. And uh, definitely we also do uh, anterior arch fixation along with it, which increases the stability. So uh, SI screw, uh, you know, it's uh, perpendicular to the SI joint, the S1 corridor for SI joint. While for sacral fractures, it is uh, horizontal one. So as uh, we have already discussed this vestibule con uh, concept uh, given by Carlson, uh, it only describes that there is a narrow window in the center. So around uh, 25, uh, 27 millimeter uh, roughly you can get uh, in, uh, in height and around 25 millimeter in width. So this is a normal uh, in normal patients, but this won't be the same in cases with uh, dysmorphism. So the patient pos uh, positioning you need to have bring the patient completely down. This is just a representation. So you have to bring him completely. You can use a Mayo trolley or something uh, if you don't have a further pelvic attachment uh, for the table. 
that's the lateral view you can take inlet views you can take so you can see inlet i'll show you so inlet views inlet view the ideal inlet view would be the upper border of the pubis is coinciding with the s2 sorry sorry outlet view so you can see both the uh, sacral foramina first sacral foramina that's the outlet view so what you need to do is uh, have a lateral outlet and inlet views in the lateral view what you see uh, is uh, iliac cortical density uh, we have to completely uh, match both the sides and both the uh, sciatic notch we have to match so that they overlap uh, there and then you can uh, decide the placement of screw let's skip this for the so for s1 uh, for amena your entry point is uh, below the uh, icd slightly on the uh, cranial body s1 body and uh, angulated superiorly the uh, owl or the tocha to initially uh, make an entry point uh, see in all the uh, planes so uh, this was one uh, case where you do dual plating with si joint screw another case you can additionally uh, use a plate or you can use an additional screw also so additional plate also can be placed posteriorly to increase the stability of your fixation you need to keep in mind uh, sacral dysmorphism so the features of uh, sacral dysmorphism are acute ailer slope if there is an upper uh, uh, upper uh, sacral segment superior to ilosacral if you see the upper sec uh, segment which is superior to the ilosacral uh, connection and not recessed it i normally it is slightly recessed recessed uh, disc between s1 s2 non circular uh, sacral foramina and uh, uh, this is <coughs> lateral sacral triangle ratio it's a ratio of uh, lr height to the width and a sacral dysmorphism score the angles that we have seen so uh, these are the features of a sacral dysmorphism uh, non circular s1 you can see indentation over here so your screw will go in maybe in out and in so we have to be very careful we can use s2 corridor or you can use other method of fixation in these cases thank you hello so uh, thank you vikram sir and uh, that uh, covered most of the aspects of si joint fixation now i call upon dinesh kale sir and uh, sir has come all the way from belgaum for to teach us regarding all the nuances of pelvic vascular injuries and uh, just a minute till this out Lot of my relatives are in Nagpur. First cousins. I am at present professor of orthopedic at the JN Medical College, Belgaum. It's Nagpur Moon Title Field. regarding management of sacrum fractures actually in the literature there is no a set rule given it has to be optimized as per your convenience your expertise and your ability to do these fixations posterior fixation yes many of the uh, surgeons are doing posterior fixation i have no personal experience of posterior fixation for one simple reason i believe that once you take an incision this is a, of course a small incision one on each side and you have to pre bend the plate and put it but now after the uh, knowledge of exposure of the si joint with the lateral window and the use of percutaneous slowly posterior plating is coming down unless you have a very badly shattered sacrum bilaterally the only option left for you is to do a posterior plate 
नागपुर लिखेल है I didn't get your question. What, what was it? Sir, uh, when uh, in a fracture pelvis with urethral injury, Fresh when we are uh, no, sir, at three months when the stabilization has already been done, and we are doing stabilization has already been done either surgically or non-surgically. Okay. That is up to my esteemed colleagues. But when we are doing an end-to-end -end urethrotasty, how much removal of the callus? That is that. You really don't see much of a callus in symphysial area. Absolutely uh, no. Sir, it's during, fibrous tissue. Because during surgeries, we have to nearly take out l more than three-fourths of the lower uh, pubic symphysis. So how much, yeah, inferior pubic to me, what can be done without much damage? Thank you. Oh. See, very frankly, the anterior part really does not give rise to much of stability of the pelvis. It's only when the anterior is unreduced, the posterior does not reduce. And I'll show you by example what I mean. You will be able to understand. Even a wide symphysis pubis with an intact posterior ring, patients do very well. Absolutely fine. There is no problem with that. Sir, go ahead. It was discussed in the dialogue recently, and one of the leading surgeons was discussing regarding this. That in this case, if generally the patient has a urethral injury, they do do cremation on the anterior abscess, but they have just it continue to reduce the stability of the pubic ring because and have just it reducing it is very essential. So the superior part has been removed. It has been the reduction of the posterior abscess. state of non inner instability then why not use the symphysial gap for your work and yeah. then allow the orthopedic surgeon to finish off his job by stabilizing get an orthopedic opinion before starting absolutely yes yeah, yeah. thank you sir. thank you sir <laughs> after you stay uh, we need to fix it further if required uh. okay just one minute Okay, I'll just uh, run through my slides because we are behind schedule in a big way. How do I go forward? Is going? Yeah, this is the place where I work. Uh, without going into detail about the theory part of the sacral fractures, it's all in the books. And here's a pointer hit seeker. These are bad to manage. I'll show you an example because. To reduce them is quite a task. One should not consider posterior injuries in isolation. This is the basic thing. It is always with the anterior component. If you see a posterior involved, whether it is SI or sacrum, make it a point to go and examine. Hello? Yeah, the anterior part. Now, what is the ring concept? Ladies must be familiar with this. This is a bangle. Unless you close this, the back doesn't close. So you can't fix a SI joint like this without closing this. And that is why the anterior ring is important. It hardly gives any stability to the 
structure. There is very little literature giving clear guidelines regarding how one should manage sacral fractures. If it is this type, how do you do it? If it is this type, how do you do it? A thorough examination is extremely essential as uh, Aditya also had said. We had a case of a sacral fracture, came walking. 48 hours after injury, he had a clavicle fracture. Then he started complaining of pain in the, uh, what you call, pelvic area. They took him for the x-ray because the pant was smelling. The staff removed the pant and that is what you found there. Now this is a moral level lesion that you see here. This can be nasty. Luckily this is on the lateral aspect of the thigh, not coming in the way of our surgical exposures. The approach to the sacrum basically must look for active bleed, the severity of the injury, neurological status. If it is a transforaminal injury, if there is a neurodeficit, make it a point to call the relatives and tell them that he has a deficit. We don't assure you that this will recover. Because the results are bad, the story is not very good. You should also look for the associated astabular fracture, limb fracture, visceral injuries. Geriatric insufficiency fractures don't have much of a complication, but these are usually, they go undetected. Now this is the anatomy which shows a lot of vessels around there. What is the time that you should operate them? If you have an SI subluxation and a dislocation, I think within 24 hours is the ideal time where you can do a percutaneous fixation. But many times it happens in our hospitals. By the time the patient is made ready, fit for surgery, it takes at least 48 hours. And, and as he had described, you require a radiolution table which should have a femoral traction facility and IITV and the most important is the last line. Your CM technician must be well versed with what views you want. Because if you are going to waste your time in adjusting the CM, it's going to be a procedure. Now what we have done is we have used two hydraulic tables so you can raise them at one time. The CM moves all around. So it's not a problem. And if you want a traction, on, the, on that side of the table, you can connect a bar, put a steamman pin there. But in fresh fractures, you don't. Instrumentation, yes. Instrumentation is very important. What a general orthopedic surgeon uses, those instruments are of no use here. You require very long wires. You require very long uh, cannulated drills require at least two drilling systems preferably battery operated because the dr same drill system guide wire, you remove the guide wire then put the screwdriver uh, uh, what you call shank on that it's quite time consuming one must plan before you surgery look at the status of the skin around If you need to flip the pin, that means so how much obese is the patient? Try to do percutaneous if possible because the obesity is a big problem. Lastly, drape the patient in such a way that if need arises, you are unable to do close fixation. You don't again start draping the patient for an open surgery. Now there are many approaches. If you are doing it anteriorly, supine position, percutaneous, AIP with lateral window, only the lateral window, midline laparotomy. If a general surgeon is taken into the OT for other visceral uh, injuries, if he has done a laparotomy, you can utilize that. Posteriorly, if you require a lumbopelvic fixation or if you have a crescent fracture with that, then you will require a posterior incidence. Again, not going through with all this, importance is the identification of welfare route as he has told, the plate should be as wide as possible. Iliosacral screw has now become the gold standard. Next to that is an anterior sacral plating. Now that is the way you will be doing the anterior plating. Not going through this. Yeah, in case of sacral fracture with symphysial problem, which to fix first? Here it should be 
reduce the symphysis, hold it, don't fix it. Go back and fix the posterior part, come back and fix the anterior part. Now this is an x-ray, not mine, just to show you an example of posterior fixation. What has been done anteriorly, don't worry, it is not done nowadays. They have passed a small tense nail which is halfway through, not really good, it has distracted the fracture. Now this was the case I was talking about. This patient had an establular fracture, also had a transforaminal fracture and this sort of a fracture. So what happened was we had to open him posteriorly. We tried to reduce that but it was after about 12 days. It was just impossible to reduce and at that area the lamina is so thin that if you try to use force and push it down, it will start breaking. So we did a laminectomy there, flipped the patient did the astabular fixation. This was in the ward after probably after about two weeks or three weeks, I'm not very sure. And then at the end of six months, later on he went to become a steward in Indigo. And after that he got fed up. He has started his own car painting showroom. One then second, now he's got a third one in my same city. Why it is important to take into consideration a teamwork? Sacral fractures, if they have got associated injury, please call at the very first sitting general surgeon, neurosurgeon, plastic surgeon and a gynecologist. Because once you open it for the very first time, all of you can do something. Invariably what happens, urethral injury, the orthopedic the urologist comes, sorry, I am talking about it. The urologist comes, he explores his, puts a catheter and goes away. Now the problem is, when the patient comes to us, there is a discharge from here. Once there is a discharge from here, anterior, everything is gone. Very high chance of him. Now this was a patient who from the end of 16 days. So finally, we removed all that fixators. And by the way, all the fixators were in and out from all the sides. They were not in the crest. We left this as it is. And that's what I was com coming to your point. And you can leave it, nothing happens. Because urethral injury is a major part of it. He is a uh, state transport uh, bus conductor. Back to his work. Only thing is, he has been advised every two hourly to go and empty his bladder because little incontinence is still there. This is the same person who had a uh, sacral injury with a rectal tear. So they had done a draining colostomy. We put him on an anterior x fix, we put him on the uh, bilateral sacral fixations, and with the x fix, he was moving around in the wall. Now you can't have an x which is on the lateral side, it has to be x fix through the AIIS. This is the picture at the end of one and a half year. This is the original wound. He is back to his farming. He is able to sit cross leg. Unfortunately, his anal sphincters have not yet got back the power. Still, his colostomy is as it is. I don't know when the, the general surgeon is going to close it. But he is happy. He's gone. He goes to his fields, does all his field work. Now, what I meant by saying front back front is luckily everything was possible in a supine position. So, we reduced the front put a transsacral screw and then plated the anterior part. Because unless you reduce the anterior part, like I showed you an open bangle, the posterior part will remain open like that. Another patient who had a sacral fracture, also an anterior injury. Now this is a little modified fixation. I put two column screws and then to reduce this, I put a small plate here. Young boy doing very well. Now this is a case where though it's not coming into the sacral fracture just because there is a small injury here. But here I wanted to show you how one can utilize all possible corridors in the pelvis. You name the corridor and that corridor has been used. We have put a sacral screw, we have put an LC2 screw, we have put a posterior column screw, we have put an anterior column screw plus these are for the osteotomies that have been done. 
Also, this will sh in the same part of this thing, you show we have done a plating here with a SI screw and an LC2 screw here. He came with 6 gram hemoglobin. He had a foot drop. At the end of 2 years, foot drop has not recovered, which was told to him. It is not going to recover. He is back to all his work. Yeah, another way of reducing a sacral fracture, 116 kg, I think, 6 foot 3 inches. Now imagine opening this fellow from behind is going to be hell of a job. He also had a large moral level lesion anteriorly. So what we did was, in the casualty we had wrapped a towel or a bed sheet. And we found on the x-ray that this was getting reduced. We took him in the OT, washed him, kept three drapes ready. We took the OT sheets, wrapped him, tightened it. We were lucky to get the reduction. So I made a hole in that drape. Sacrificed one of the bed sheets. Huh? Huh? <laughs> one slide has gone. Okay, till then I'll proceed. In that case, we only did a the second case. See, this was a guy who was trying to change his tire, punctured tire of the bus lying on the road under the bus. The other truck ran over him. He was very violent. By the third day, third day, by the fifth day, he started So we decided kill the other areas were clean. We put transaxle screw. Mobilization of the patient is extremely good. You will be surprised to see this is how he recovered. And three years, he has gone back to driving a luxury bus. These fractures require a lot of You require at least two orthopedic surgeons. Don't be too enthusiastic. You do require help and you do require somebody who has to take two pelvic acetabular surgeons. Now you will see here, I am giving traction, a colleague of mine, Dr. Prati from Bombay, we re reduced it anteriorly. Now when you pull this and reduce it, to pass a wire from this side with the traction being pulled is difficult. So what you do is, you pull from this side. Pass a wire from here and bring it up to here. Once you feel on the pull the traction is there, just pass it inside. That is not the guide wire. That is the wire. Then you pass the second guide wire which is going to be a definitive wire and fix it. Oh, these things have got... This is the same guy whom I had shown you with a bag on the buttocks. That is his status right now. had from the train. Now this we have fixed after four and a half months in C2 fixation. Still she has done very well. The only problem with her is now the anterior. It shows the plate is out. I said any problem for you? She said nothing. I said forget it. Don't do anything. It quite Okay, this is a screw that I have myself uh, designed and I am getting it patented. Okay. The advantage of this screw is it has got a self-holding cylinder on that. So you pass a screw and if you feel your screw is either long or short, your guide wire still remains where it is. You are able to take back the screw and exchange it. In the routine cases when you pass a screw, and then if you feel you are short, to retrieve that becomes very difficult because the gluteal muscles are going to cover. 
you all must have done pf and in pf and two screw system agar screw ka screw ka length kam zyada ho gaya so when you are removing the screw at the bone nail junction there is a small gap there like this then you have to put a artery inside hold the screw put the screw when pulling on the artery you have to remove to avoid this i have designed the screw show you a i'll show you where can we purchase where can we use from where can we we get this has been given the uh, whole and sole right to manufacture it okay is it and available in market right now 100% okay. more than 23 24 uh, pelvic acid surgeons are using it okay okay thank you sir Good morning, sir. Sir, it is often said acid double lung fractures treated with sacral fractures. We should fix the sacral fractures first. So, what are the tips and how to do that? Because if we apply traction, all the traction will be lost in the acid double lung fracture, sir. Kind request whenever whenever you are asking questions, it will be good that we know you. So a short introduction from where you are coming. We will have that subsequently also. So now we have Dr. Pranav Shah sir. Uh, he has come all the way from Ahmedabad. Uh, sir is a uh, trauma surgeon and does lot of hip and uh, pelvic acetabular injuries. And sir is going to uh, speak regarding crescent fracture management. Over to you, sir. Right? So this is the basic understanding. If 
understood this, everything else is a very straightforward. Yes. So this now shows you, sorry, this now shows you the fracture, crescent fracture, as I told you, right? So this is the typical crescent fracture type 2 where you have injury in somewhere in the mid zone. Now let us go to understanding. So crescent fracture is usually a lateral compression injury. SI joint injuries extend proximally into the ilium. Actually SI joint and part of the ilium along with the sacrum. You understand? SI joint disruption hua hai, but sacrum ke saath ilium chip ka hua hai. Puri tarah se alag nahi hua hai. Right? So here you can see this portion of the ilium is with the sacrum. This portion of the ilium is with the sacrum. This is dissociated. This is dissociated. Can you make out? If you understand this, you will very easily find out the fixation strategy. The size of the crescent is variable. Accordingly, we can classify that crescent into type 1, type 2 or type 3, which is according to the day's classification. We will go there. So, day's classification gives you a type 1 fracture where very minimal SI joint disruption and maximal SI joint intact. Got it? Then type 2 where almost 50% SI joint disruption, 50% SI joint intact and type 3 where most of the SI joint dislocated, only part of the SI joint intact. So as you go from 1 to 3, the SI joint disruption increases. Okay? So this is a type 1 fracture where the intact fragment is bigger, the dislocated fragment is smaller. A type 2 fracture where intact fragment and disrupted fragment are almost equal and a type 3 where the intact is small, disrupted is more. All can make out? Yes. yes? Okay. So now let us move forward. Now the point is most of us have a habit of looking at our pelvis CT, especially the AP. In AP view, if you see here, it is a very small crescent fragment, right? Almost like something you will neglect. But the crescent is always seen better on the posterior side because there is so much of overlap. Your SI joint is overlapping on your posterior one third of the ilium. This portion is overlapping here. Here you can see it is such a big fragment. You can put one, two, three screws from here. It is not a small fragment that you are looking here. Okay. So have a habit of seeing your crescent from behind. Now this is one such example. This patient is having a bilateral, one side crescent, another side crescent. Everybody can make out, here the crescent is small, here the crescent is big. Everybody agrees? Okay. Tell me, is there any fragment, is the fracture line going into the SI joint here? So it is not a crescent fracture, it is an iliac wing fracture. The crescent is only this, this is a iliac wing. See the entire SI joint and ilium is stable. No point putting iliosacral screw here. It is a stable, stable fragment. Nothing disrupted there. The disruption is here. The disruption is here, not in the SI joint. Okay. Just because this fragment looks a little wide, you may misinterpret it as SI joint widening. But it is actually, if you detail, if you look at it in detail, it is actually a iliac wing fracture, not a SI joint disruption. Okay. So the fixation options. Type 1 fracture, very less intact, fra uh, disrupted fragment, iliosacral screw, almost impossible, so plating is the choice. This is an example, a type 1 fracture, you can see here, very less disrupted, maximum connected, so plating has been done, like this. And this is a posterior plating done, not necessary you go from the front, you can even go from behind and stability achieved, sorry. Now if you look at type 2 fracture, which is somewhere here. You have a choice of iliosacral screw, you have a choice of plate, both options are there. You even have a choice of putting a percutaneous screw from here, okay, provided you have reduced it well. So in type 2, you have a plate plus screw option and in type 3, most of the SI joint disrupted as good as a SI joint injury only and iliosacral screws will be strong enough. 
Okay. Now let's look at a case. So this case, if you can carefully see, there is this fragment. Compare SI joint to SI joint. There is a disruption, but not in the entirety. So this is actually a crescent fracture. This portion, one piece. This is the disruption. This is the SI joint disruption. Everybody can make out. Why this has happened now you can very well see. See the calcification of the I mean SI ligaments. Can you see here? It has all become a bone. So that SI ligaments are so strong. They will hold the bone. Will not let it disrupt. Some portion of the bone will remain with the sacrum. Right? So this patient, this is the fracture line. Now you can see it is into the SI joint. It is not iliac wing fracture. It is even from posterior side you can see though it is a crescent but it is going into the SI joint. Can you make out? So now how do you do? Okay, you assess it in various views. So this is your SI joint disruption. You can see there is a lot of space for us to put iliosacral screws. Okay, and this is a little bit of a dysmorphic sacrum. You cannot say completely but you can see this depression here. This depression here will be holding the lumbosac uh, lumbosacral trunk. The thing that was shown in the first lecture today, right? L4, L5 roots are passing from here. If I put a iliosacral screw like this, I am definitely going to damage it. And if I see a lateral view in this, the iliac cortical density will be quite low. So this is almost like a dysmorphic sacrum. We have a very narrow window to fix the iliosacral screw. This is a type 3 as you can all make out. There is most of the SI joint is disrupted. Only part of it is intact. Now getting reduction. One very important clue of getting reduction in SI joint disruption is tying the patient like this. Both the toes tied together, both the knees tied together, internal rotation and most of the times this maneuver will bring a closure of the book. So just use whatever simple tools are possible to get the reduction. Another way to get reduction is using this pointed clamp. You can use this pointed clamp on both your pubic tubercles. On the pubic tubercle you put the clamp and then you compress it and it will come in position. Sometimes there is a posterior translation. So on one side you have to give an anterior pull also along with the closure. So that is how you are going to get the reduction. Once you get the reduction you start fixing the anterior portion. Many times fixing anteriorly well reduces posteriorly indirectly, right? Sometimes that does not happen especially when there is a comminution in the fracture. In that case you have to do open reduction of SI joint by using the lateral window of the ilioinguinal approach. So in this picture this is your disrupted SI joint. This is the fracture extending into the iliac wing. This reduction is done open. You can see a hole here. Sometimes you may have to put one screw here, one screw here, use your Jungblut clamp, maneuver and get the reduction. Once you get the reduction you pass a temporary wire and then you can go ahead and do your iliosacral screw fixation or a plate fixation. In this patient, iliosacral screw fixation, you can see I have put a compression screw first because the SI joint was disrupted. And then I have also put a S2 screw, but once I have compressed it, I don't want to compress any further. I want to have screw hold here as well as here. So the second screw I have put is a fully threaded screw. If both the screws are in compression, sometimes for this fragment, the iliac fragment is not having a single screw thread and that has some amount of instability. So whenever you are putting two screws, your first screw, if it is a disruption, only then you put in compression, okay? Then I, I, as you can see, I also done the iliac wing plating because we have an intact iliac wing. We can use ilium to ilium plate and thereby, you know, we can have avoid a iliosacral plate and have space for a iliosacral screw. Iliosacral screw has biomechanically more stability than a iliosacral plate which is done from anterior side. So if I do a ilioileal plate which is, which is this and I leave the space for iliosacral screw, I get a biomechanically stronger construct. Okay? 
So this is that patient post-operatively. This is that patient at three months, uneventful, normal healing. Also the patient at polytrauma, as somebody suggested, it is a very common thing. This is another crescent fracture, three weeks old. Very times we get pelvic injuries which are old because the head injury, abdominal injury, urological injury, chest injury takes priority. Orthopedic surgeons are always called at the end. So this you can make out is a SI joint disruption on this side and a vertically unstable pelvis on left side. All of you can make out. This is that patient CT scan. You can see it is a type 2. See, there is an equally large fragment on both sides. So this is a patient where I would prefer to do a plate plus screw fixation. Okay? So how do we go about? This is your initial position. These fractures usually will not reduce easily. Three week old. It will not reduce easily with uh, traction. So you will have to open on both the sides. Open reduction will be necessary. So much of fibrous tissue which has formed in the SI joint area, you will have to remove. So once that is done, a pointed clamp is used to open reduce. And I have put a transfixing K wire. You can see here to hold that. Because a single pointed clamp in that area, you press more and it will go into, go into the bone. And then you may sometimes have further combination. So you have to use optimum, you know, optimum pressure on that. Then your posterior fixation. You can see this spike. So it is an open reduction. It's not a percutaneous. Your anterior reduction is done here. Then you pass, pass the screw. See, the screw is going from posterior and I have left a space anterior for the plate. So this is how you have to plan. You cannot have a screw from here. Otherwise, I'll have to put a plate like this and this portion is already intact. So it is going to be difficult. So the posterior plate is not going to do anything in this case. Anterior plate is going to hold the reduction. So my screw goes from posterior and plate comes anterior. Everybody understood? Yes. So this is that patient's post-operative x-ray. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's what, sorry. Let's just have, so this is how, so this is how plate and screw and anterior fixation you can see. Anterior fixation is absolutely mandatory in these kind of fractures, especially the old ones, because, and vertical is unstable. B, anterior fixation is mandatory. So this is how the uh, fixation was done, and then the patient healed uneventfully. This is another type 3 fracture. You can see most of the SI joint is disrupted. Very small crescent is present here. Very small crescent here. It's a type 3 fracture. Again, with a type 3 fracture, most of the SI joint gone. Iliosacral screws stand alone will be strong enough. So that same thing has been done. But now you can see a posterior plate. Because most of the SI joint is joined, uh, gone, so I can even use a posterior plate in this patient. So I have used a posterior plate, anterior plate, and screw. All the three things combined to give more stability. Here, anteriorly, I did not open. Because it was a fresh fracture, I could reduce posteriorly. I have not opened anteriorly. You can see posterior plate, anterior plate, iliosacral screw, everything fixed. And in three months, the patient completely mobile. And last one is this atypical crescent fracture. You can see here in this anterior part, it is exiting somewhere over here. So this all doesn't seem to be a... This is more of an iliac wing fracture, but since it is extending into the SI joint, it will fit into the definition of a crescent fracture. So this fracture, uh, boy who fell in the shaft of the elevator, this is his CT scan. You can see here, there is an anterior piece and a posterior piece, iliosacral screw out of question because it is going to go from the fracture, right? This is not a very typical. It is an atypical crescent fracture. The acetabulum is intact. So it's iliac wing and crescent, two fractures in the pelvis. So your anterior fixation getting reduction posteriorly. And your posteriorly now you have to use the plate smartly. Your plate you are going to use as a reduction tool. How? See, you put an under contoured plate over here, compress it, and this fragment is going to push down. Got it? So this is what was done. That plate pushing down this fragment. It has, the plate is anchored here, but it is pushing down this fragment. Then it got the reduction. Then we put the 
multiple interfragmentary screws. Then finally, we put the screw on this side also. This is that patient's six year follow up, completely normal. Okay. So, friends, understanding the crescent fracture is very important. CT scan is the key. Axial cut is where you identify which class, whether it is type 1, 2, or 3, and classify according to DACE classification because that is going to guide you the treatment. And it is an intraarticular fracture, so anatomical reduction and stable fixation is mandatory. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. And uh, I think this is the best uh, lecture regarding crescent fracture one can attend. And I hope most of the concepts regarding managing crescent fractures are clear now. And uh, so now we have uh, covered all the aspects, relevant aspects of pelvic injuries. There will be a lot of permutation combination in that. But now to uh, cover the complete uh, spectrum of injuries and what will you do if you see blood at the urethral meatus, okay? So to cover that and to throw some light on that, uh, we have invited uh, Dr. Anagha Kulkarni. She is a female urosurgeon from uh, Central India and she is going to speak regarding that aspect. Over to you, madam. I th thanks Dr. Aditya and the entire team for inviting me today for this uh, talk on... Uh, Genitourinary injuries and pelvic fracture. So um, here I would like to uh, talk a little bit about how we get reference. Anagha Kulkarni, please take the question. So uh, basically, when we see blood at the urethral meatus, if the patient is in shock, along with hematuria seen either day one, maybe a little later too, uh, that is how uh, you'd be. In, involved in a fracture pelvis case. However, sometimes a cystogram is not enough and I would like to present it a little later on in my uh, talk. It's a karpai. Is it okay if I stand over here? So we would like to know as an orthopedic surgeon what should be our approach, okay? And uh, Okay, uh, so I would like to start. What are the basic injuries that we see in pelvic fractures? So, uh, yeah, it's okay, it's on. It's a hole, any hole? Okay. Okay, so uh, pelvic fractures, as we all know, that it is a multimodality approach, and all of us, including from the emergency department, orthopedic, vascular, Everyone is uh, involved in this. Uh, the associated injuries that I'm here to talk about are those of the urethra, bladder, ureter, bowel, vascular nerves. Though the vascular and nervous topic is too vast to approach, it is these that actually give the maximum issue uh, later on or after all the disability. Hematuria on catheterization, inability. towards the 
urologists at the go. So, and also, as we said, on a uh, digital rectal examination, if we find a high riding prostate or a butterfly perineal hematoma, these are the cases where a urologist needs to be involved. We do an on table RGU and a primary alignment may be done in such cases. So, let's see. Ideally, a retrograde urethrogram is done on table and then uh, if primary alignment fails, then a retro, retro uh, then a suprapubic cystostomy is what is indicated. So at seven days, within seven days, if we get a referral, then we can plan a primary alignment. Otherwise, a suprapubic cystostomy along with an end-to-end -end urethrostomy or a progressive perineal at a later date would be what is indicated. So these are why primary alignment so these reduces the chances of incontinence, callus, even if the patient needs a surgery at a later date, the callus that we need to remove would be less if a primary alignment has already been done. However, it does increase the chances of infection. It also increases the chances of uh, uh, the hematoma being infected, which is a sterile thing to begin with. However, feasibility is one of the important constraints that we see. So, uh, for primary alignment, the patient should be able to be positioned in a lithotomy-like position, which becomes difficult many a times. So, feasibility is one of the aspects. And uh, for a suprapubic catheterization, uh, feasibility is easy. It is usually done ultrasound guided. And uh, I'm sorry to say, but uh, the chances of infection are not that much, sir. So when would we suggest an emergency exploration if there is an uh, associated another? Yes. So but then you said that uh, the anterior compartment stabilization will not change the final result. So uh, right. X fix is done. Sir, I would come to that later on. So intraperitoneal, in if there is an intraperitoneal injury or a bladder neck injury, any associated uh, gynecological injury or an open type fracture we, and my esteemed colleague would be actually going ahead with a surgery. These are the times we would like to do a primary surgical realignment for the urethra. It's very difficult with the hematoma, with the bladder having been displaced high up. The urethral uh, fragment has been taken down quite a lot. It's very difficult. The positioning, everything. Now, uh, Next. So this is what we have already discussed. Let's go ahead. This, is, this was about what to do when a particular urethral type of injury comes. We'll come to it later. So this is what, this is a stretching of the urethra and just a simple catheterization would be okay. This type 1 urethral injury. Uh, this type 2 injury where the membranous urethra as we see has been ruptured. And here, primary realignment usually fails because the bladder neck goes up. It moves 5 centimeter inside the, uh, inside the pelvis. And then getting it is very difficult. Uh, here, because uh, the injury is twice, it's associated at two places. Here, one side is, can be seen and we can actually get a light from the above. And a primary realignment becomes possible. So bladder neck injuries when they are associated with uh, uh, pelvic trauma, this is one case that I would like to uh, discuss in uh, the next year. So this is type 5 injury where a bulbar urethral injury is associated with a bladder neck injury. And we also see that 2% of all of these injuries would be associated with upper tract injuries too, either a kidney or a ureter injury. So... That is why a routine cystogram only approach may not be helpful and a CT urography is usually indicated. So 5 to 15 percent of all pelvic trauma would be associated with a bladder injury and a distended bladder as sir rightly suggested a diastasis of more than one centimeter, uh, displaced fracture of the obturator ring of more than one centimeter along with shock, hypotension, a distended bladder, a butterfly 
butterfly pelvic hematoma, all of these risk factors for bladder injuries. Next. Next. So here I would like to discuss a case of a 52 year old male. He had a high velocity trauma and open book fracture with pubic diastasis. Catheterization had already been done and patient was received with shock. On an uh, retro uh, RGU, we found that the bladder neck was injured and next. So uh, if we see that uh, uh, pubic symphysis is open, it is an open book type injury and we can see the uh, Foley's catheter peeping out through the bladder opening at the bladder neck. So this was sued primarily in a single layer because at this position getting a double layer closure which is ideally advised is not possible. But anyway, this had to be closed because uh, this patient also had a sacral fracture. So uh, for that, uh, this needed to be closed. In that case, uh, these fragments would impinge on the bladder neck at this point. And uh, in this case, uh, she was a urosurgeon who was involved in that patient. And uh, as it was discussed already, getting an anterior reduction, we can't, uh, uh, unless and until we have an anterior reduction, we can't get a posterior reduction. But what we realized in this case, whenever we were trying to reduce the pubic symphysis, it was impinging on the urethra further. And getting a repaired urethra with a closed symphysis was not possible. So what we did, we reduced pubic symphysis. We put a posterior fixation for the iliosacral screws on the both sides. And then we kept the pubic symphysis wide open. She repaired the urethra in that case and we left it like that for three months. The, so as to give it a, no, sir, with a X fix, with a X fix, definitely with a X fix anteriorly. And to add up to the uh, complexity of the case, the patient was having HbA1c of 11 with a diffuse uh, fungal infection on the entry aspect of the so anyways, uh, we were not aiming for a uh, fixation in that case. But in this case, this mandated a laparotomy and that is why we had opened this patient. Uh, uh, no, sir. Uh, yes, uh, we had opened it up uh, as a midline. Mid so this patient had a huge uh, infected. He had a pre-peritoneal pre in the space of red zeus itself. But sir, we had to open the peritoneum because uh, the bones were actually impinging on the bladder at the same spot. So here if we see this is, this over here is the omentum. So we have gotten a pedicle domental flap to come up to that place and we have sewed it at the bladder neck. Next slide. So this is a pedicle domental, omental flap that we see has been sewed in place. So this is a video. Yeah, it doesn't play. So here, as we see, uh, yes, it's playing on the side. It is separate also. Yes, it's separate. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. No, no, no. So, uh, so here we see that the omental uh, patch has been kept just at the, uh, it is sutured to the bladder neck over here. Hmm? 
So this was the actual picture where we saw uh, the bladder neck injury. Sometimes uh, it is really impossible to get in with the ideal uh, anterior uh, stabilization. But here the patient had persistent urinary leakage even on day two of catheterization. So a cystogram was done on day three after catheterization and it showed urinary leakage. So uh, this was a patient that we saw. He is around 36 year old male and he had come to us with a uh, pelvic fracture. He had undergone a primary realignment for a bladder uh, type 1 injury, I guess. And uh, postoperatively, he had persistent hematuria. He had already undergone a cystogram, and there was a huge hematoma seen inside the pelvis. Uh, so, because there was persistent hematuria, he underwent a CT urography. And if we see the ureter uh, on the left side, from the third slide, we see there's no contrast. And then there's contrast extravasation seen on the last two slides. So the ureter has undergone a rupture. This patient again underwent a endoscopic, slide, endoscopic realignment of his left ureter with DJ stenting. And uh, postoperatively, he is doing fine. So take home here is that uh, around 2% of all these patients may have associated ureteric injuries. And they need to be actively looked for. Hi, sir. Uh, Mechanism of ureteric injuries is usually deceleration injury. So a seatbelt trauma is the cause. And uh, they have to be taken care of immediately. So let's come to... So this was a patient who had undergone, uh, op operated for fracture pelvis. A primary realignment was done. And post-operative uh, voiding cystourethrogram was failed to show a communication between the bladder and the plate that we just saw. Is it playing? Is it playing? It's okay. So uh, as we see that, uh, So this is the last I wanted to show. So this was one 60-year-old female. She had undergone a, a fracture fixation. And we can see the plate here. We can also see that the bladder is open. And the screw is popping into this bladder, into this open part of the bladder over there. This plate had to come out, and then the bladder was repaired primarily. So this is the primary closure that we had to do. And uh, so this is what, what had to come out, for the closure. So here my take home is that the bladder needs to be deflated completely when anterior fixation is done. Otherwise, there's very high chances that the bladder may come in picture. Also, there are multiple chances of fracture fragments actually causing uh, injuries to the bladder. So they have to be actively searched and repaired. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Anaga. And it was an excellent presentation. And something that interesting I learned during the last case when I assisted her, uh, like we use uh, methylene blue to uh, in chronic osteomyelitis, methylene blue to go through the tract. She very beautifully asked the assistant to inject methylene blue. She was checking for where the repair was good or not. And that was very helpful intraoperative was. Okay, so that is a very useful take. And as uh, Kayar said, always, always, always involve a urosurgeon, a gynecologist, a general surgeon when you are doing a primary exploration in such a complicated case. So, can we please have, yeah. Like, uh, this suprabibic cystostomy which you do, can't it be through any other route? Can we keep it sterile? I mean, that area. I mean the region of the pelvis can we avoid it because that is the area where we operate and so uh, that is a taken, big deterrent for us like it can be taken up to the umbilicus okay uh, this is because uh, this is usually done endoscopic without opening 
So it's very difficult to get the peritoneum away because if the peritoneum comes into the stab, then okay. it is difficult to uh, be sure that we are not injuring the bubble. So, just because uh, one case I want to discuss, uh, uh, the same thing, uh, SPC was done. So, we got it revised. Yeah, so, so on a higher side and then did a plating. So, what's your opinion uh, about revising the SPC and then uh, the. No, no, if it has already been done. So it is not regarding the placement, rather it is about the initial trauma causing extravasation of the urine and contamination in the space of red zeus. So that makes putting an implant difficult. So uh, that concludes our first session and thanks a lot Dr. Anaka ma'am. And now we'll be having a short ceremony of Hello. With our CEO of hospitals, Dr. Anup Marar sir over here, Dr. Uh, Singh sir over here, and Ujwal Gajbe ma'am over here, a dean and vice dean of our institute. So we'll have uh, a short uh, inauguration ceremony. And I kindly request uh, Tripti ma'am also to join uh, for inauguration and lime lighting ceremony. Dr. Vasan sir. So Vasan sir is our head of department of orthopedics and uh, chief medical uh, uh, HOD orthopedics and sir is also here. So I kindly request Dinesh Kale sir, Pranav sir and all the faculties to please join us. Anup sir, I kindly request you to fellowship Dr. Dinesh Kale sir. Uh, 
सर इज प्रोफेसर एट जे एन एम सी बेलगांव मेडिकल कॉलेज सो मोर लाइक अ सिस्टर नेम नेम ऑफ अवर मेडिकल कॉलेज सो सर इज अ लीडिंग ऑर्थोपेडिक सर्जन सर एंड डज एक्सेंस एक्सटेंसिव पेलवे एस्टाबुलर इंजुरी मैनेजमेंट so i kindly request you to felicitate uh, dr pranav shah sir singh sir please come forward sir has come all the way from ahmedabad for this conference and i also kindly request ujwal ma'am to felicitate uh, dr alok umbre sir thank you alok sir and uh, i also request uh, dr suyog radi sir to come forward and dr vikram sir present <laughs> vasan sir please come forward <clears throat> dr suyog radi is owner of wims hospital in amravati Vikram sir, please come forward. Sir, kindly felicitate uh, Dr. Vikram Sapre sir. Thank you, Vikram sir. And I also kindly request Ujwal ma'am to felicitate Dr. Anagha Kulkarni. She is uh, the only female urosurgeon of Central India, and. Uh, सही बात वेरी ट्रू मैम थैंक्स अलॉट मैम सो वी आर ब्रेकिंग अप फॉर अ शॉर्ट टी ब्रेक नाउ and after that uh, we will be having uh, so now as we are running behind and to keep uh, so that we can have more point in the cadaveric lab we'll be cutting short on some of the lectures like mine on classific uh, the acetabular fracture anatomy that i will share you uh, on our group also okay so now after this we'll be having lecture of dinesh kale sir regarding classification of acetabular fractures because that is one thing that is very important for the management ward of group okay but uh, so yeah yeah so uh, whatever you think if you want to go ahead because we have reserved the slot because but definitely cadaver will take some time we as per the schedule we had planned 2 hours for the demonstration of percutaneous screw but if you want we can always uh, change that but i will require 1 hour to uh, do the proceedings over there sir yes definitely we are going to so we'll be having we'll break for some time because yahan pe baithe baithe then we'll be catching up sleep okay so kindly feel uh, free to get up go to washrooms okay washrooms are just nearby okay and then have your tea and coffee and then we'll again sir wo neend kharab hone ke liye
Hello, 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 check, check, check. Hello, hello, check, check.
हेलो या सो लेट अस लर्न फ्रॉम दिनेश सर हाउ डज ही क्लासीफाई हिज टिप्स एंड ट्रिक्स फॉर क्लासीफाइंग एस्टेबुलर फ्रैक्चर्स दैट विल बी अ टेन मिनट स्टॉक आफ्टर दैट विल बी डिवाइडिंग इन टू लाइक वी हैड ट्वेंटी वन ट्वेंटी फोर नाउ डिवाइडिंग इन टू एट पर ग्रुप ओके वी आर मेड थ्री स्टेशन एंड टू फैकल्टीज ओके सो वन ग्रुप विल बी स्टेइंग ओवर हियर वी हैव आइडेंटिफाइड टू रूम्स एडजस्टेंट टू दिस एंड ट्वेंटी मिनट्स टू ट्वेंटी फाइव मिनट्स पर ग्रुप डिस्कशन ओके एंड देन विल बी शिफ्टिंग सो वन ग्रुप विल गो टू सेकेंड सेकेंड विल गो टू थर्ड एंड देन थर्ड विल अगेन कम ओवर हियर ओके the benefit of that will be you will be interacting with all the faculties and then uh, there uh, we have done like we have collected all the ao uh, cases it is more uh, it is more uh, what to say uh, synchronized so you will be going through all the astabular fracture patterns that are essential okay and please make it interactive if you have any question feel free to us that is why we have made small group discussions okay make it So kindly announce our set. We are starting. And AC का क्या होगा? हेलो 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 वी स्टार्ट ऑफ द क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ द एस्टेब्लर फ्रैक्चर्स वन रीडिंग विल नॉट हेल्प यू टू रीडिंग्स विल नॉट हेल्प यू यू मस्ट सिट विद द बोन मॉडल सी व्हाट सी व्हाट इज रिटन इन द एंड ड्रॉ पिक्चर्स ऑन द बोन मॉडल it is after such six or seven exercises that you will be able to slowly and slowly start understanding the various classification i'm not going in big depth into the sub varieties otherwise you will get confused the establum consists of three bones ilium ischium and pubis for some similarity i am going to compare supracondylar fractures of the human with this when the analysis remember that the acetabulum as such is a combination of some part this and this and when this is attached to the main body by this bone this is the sciatic buttress whenever there is a discontinuity of this this and this from this that is the only variety which goes into a b c associated both column fractures this much you remember kya kar raha hai pull is kar raha hai उल्टा से उल्टा से ओके देर आर टेन टाइप्स ऑफ फ्रैक्चर्स फाइव सिंपल एंड फाइव सब वेराइटीज ऑफ दैट नाउ दिस इज अमेटिक डायग्राम दैट इज गिवन इन द बुक बट आई विल बी शोइंग यू दिस ऑन एक्चुअल बोन मॉडल वॉट इट मीन्स सी इफ यू सी हियर एंटीरियर वॉल एंटीरियर कॉलम transverse now these are very simple to understand this is easy to understand this is easy to understand the only difficulty is between this and this now let us take it on the bone model anterior wall fracture is a segmental fracture of the middle third of the anterior column detaching a trapezoidal piece that contains the anterior acetabular wall so you will have a piece 
coming out from here. Superiorly, the fracture line begins below the AIIS. Always it is below this. Inferiorly, the fracture line exits at the superior pubic ramus. So this is the superior pubic ramus. It exits here, giving rise to such a small piece. This is an anterior wall fracture. Medially, fracture line involves the anterior quadrilateral plate. <coughs> we go little ahead. Now this anterior column fracture can be so small, this big or this big. Now how is this division made? Depending on the exit of the fracture superiorly, there are three types. High iliac fracture, intermediate fracture and a low fracture. Now intermediate means it has to be between AIIS and AISIS and AIIS. And anything beyond that coming into the acetabulum and then exiting. Now when it exits, it cannot take such a big curvature. So it exits in the inferior ramus. Posterior wall fracture. See, posterior wall is a part of the posterior column. Now, this injury occurs commonly in a dashboard injury. When, that's why there's a separate talk on posterior wall, posterior column. So, we are including in the small group. Okay. Only part in the lutronal classification that spares the quadrilateral plate. This is the only primary fracture where it spares the quadrilateral plate. It can include the pure superior rim fracture. Associate complex fractures do occur in this. I'm not going into detail of that. Then you have a posterior column fracture. Like you have an anterior column fracture, this is a posterior column fracture. Now what are the peculiarities of this? It is a segmental fracture of the posterior column that crosses the obturator foramen. Remember, this is very important. It has to cross the obturator foramen to separate the ischial piece. It detaches a fragment that contains the posterior astabular wall and most of the ischium. Superiorly, the fracture line enters at the greater sciatic notch. See, this. And in a posterior wall, a column fracture, this is the most difficult area if you get this fracture after, say, 5 days, 8 days, 10 days. Because there is a spike here and that is the exit of the superior gluteal vessels. One has to be very, very careful during reduction of these fractures. Sometimes, instead of coming like this, it can come like this and split this into an anterior half and posterior half. That's a rare variety. Now, transverse fracture, very simple fracture, it divides this bone into superior part, inferior part. A superior part is connected to the sciatic buttress. The inferior part is the ischiopubic part which contains the obturator ring and the obturator ring is intact. Depending on the level of the transverse fracture, you have varieties. You can have a fracture going here, middle or lower down. So you get a transtectal, juxtatectal and infratectal. Now, first three varieties you've seen. The, the next combination is posterior wall with posterior column. It is nothing but a posterior column fracture with a posterior wall piece. Morphologically, it is same as the posterior column but contains the posterior wall. Except the posterior column fracture is often partial with the fracture line extending to the roof of the obturator foramen but sparing the ischiopubic ramus. Now, in the posterior variety, you have a transfer with posterior wall. Just like a transverse fracture, which also has got a small posterior wall fracture. This is equivalent to your juxtatectal, infratectal, supratectal. The group of all transverse fractures, they are grouped into one. The T-type, the tra transverse type, transverse with posterior wall type anterior column with posterior hemi transverse and ABC. They all come under the transverse varieties. 
Now, what is the peculiarity of a T-shaped fracture? Transverse fracture is similar to a elemental transverse fracture. That means it divides it in, sorry, it divides it into upper half and lower half. Depending on the vertical limb of the <coughs> transverse element, this can go anteriorly, this can, I mean, more anterior here or here. But in transverse fracture, if you have a fracture going seen here, no fracture here and a ramus fracture here, it is not a T-type fracture. It must cut the acetabular floor to enter the obturator foramen. Now this is anterior column posterior hemitransverse. For my simple understanding, not in the books, I keep in my mind that this is a transverse fracture. In one, anterior wall is gone. In one, posterior wall is gone. So you have anterior column, posterior hemitransfer. The other is posterior column with uh, transverse. One we showed you earlier. Ideally, the quadrilateral plate fracture line meets at a right angle. And usually this fracture is an undisplaced fracture. Now, this is the most difficult fracture to understand. But remember, most of the anterior column, acetabular roof, mostly remains with the anterior column segment. That means this segment in the ABC. Most of the posterior column from the posterior iliac wing, entire weight-bearing portion of the acetabulum is disconnected from the sciatic buttress. And therefore, this is the most difficult fracture to reduce because you have to convert 2 into 1 and then, I mean, 3 into 2 and then 2 into 1 for fixation. Above the estabulum, the descending fracture lines merge in the coronal orientation. Sagittal orientation, coronal orientation, they merge in this orientation. This is in short about the classification. Now, in a anterior, some peculiarities on the x-ray, in an anterior column posterior hemitransverse, the anterior column is segmental. So you get a quadrilateral piece that is seen on the x-ray. That is number one. Number two, anterior uh, column posterior hemitransverse, the head goes with the anterior column. The approach has to be from anterior. You can't address this from posterior. But with a transverse, posterior column, transverse fractures, there you have to address it from posterior. For all the anterior varieties, the approach is anterior. What are the approaches that can control the posterior? Posterior wall, posterior column, transverse fractures. All of them can very easily be managed from the posterior side. Many a times T-shaped fractures or even ABC can be managed from posteriorly provided you do a safe surgical dislocation. Please, once you go back home, open your books, take a bone model, buy a bone model and evening in a leisure time, go on marking on those bones. It is after 8-10 exercises, you will be easily be able to pick it up. One last sentence, whenever you are in the casualty, we always ask for pelvis with both hips. Make it a habit of asking three x-rays, AP and both Jude view. Then only you can draw all your lines for coming to a diagnosis. 99% of the fractures of the acetabulum can be diagnosed on plain x-ray. It is only to see the incarcerated pieces that you require a CT. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis, sir. So now. Uh, 
after this basic understanding let us divide uh, divide ourselves into three groups so we are 21 right now okay so seven participants in each group over here dr pranav shah sir will be here uh, in the adjacent room dr dinesh kale sir will be there and in the third room uh, dr alok kumbre sir and i will be there uh, taking you through the list of cases okay and after that we'll again come back to this room okay and we'll be having how i do a surgical approach regarding the iliovinguinal approach that is uh, we should all be aware of that with stopas and iliofemoral approach with uh, in our help we right now rarely do a iliovinguinal approach but unless and until you have a basic understanding of iliovinguinal approach doing rest of the approaches become difficult so that is a must attained lecture and after that dr pranav shah sir will be taking uh, will be speaking regarding stopas approach okay and then we'll be breaking up for lunch fine fine thank you So, uh, regarding CT, it's they like want to... Got, got an your point. So, that, that like uh, the... Just a minute. I'll just take you through one of the cases. We have covered that in the small group discussions that we'll be having now. Okay? So, that small group discussions will be having all the x-rays with you. Just a minute. So we'll be taking you and help you read and in that case you are going to participate and uh, identify the various radiological landmarks that are essential in coming to the diagram. That is what you are asking? Because planning needs to be done on the x-ray machine. Very true. So we are going to have that. So let us divide ourselves into groups. So this is group 1 which will be uh, headed by Pranav Shah sir and uh, in this group we'll be starting from case number 10 to case number 13 okay so uh, just a minute So we are starting with case number 10 over here. Let us, uh, from 1 to 7, you have your batches with you. So 1 to 7 will be going to with Dinesh Kale sir. So 1 to, that is 1 to 7 only. Okay. So please take them to uh, group number, room number 2. So it is ma mentioned last number. It is 0102 like that. Okay, your registration number. So kindly go. Nikit, you, you are guiding them. So next, Mahit, kindly take the cell, uh, next two rows to the adjacent room, the other. Yes. And the last two rows, please come forward. And Pranav Shah, sir. Hello, hello.
Okay, the first one presentation mode mein nahi aaya na abhi tak so look at this since we all want to learn no no how do you read it on x-ray so let us start with this any one of you can just say what you can see on the x-ray anybody can start to volunteer what you are seeing is a pelvis x-ray ap view why it is not inlet So an x-ray in which you can see both of the obturator foramen, you can see the inferior and superior pubic ramus both separately and you can see part of the sacrum that is an AP view. If it was inlet, then these two would be overlapping, you will not be able to see the foramen and you will only be able to see the profile of the sacrum, nothing else. And if this was an outlet view, then your symphysis will be at the level of sacrum 2. You will be able to see the foramina and you will be able to see the whole of obturator foramen, complete big view, okay? So that is how you come to know whether it is iliac or, I mean, it is an inlet, outlet or a normal AP, okay? So now in this normal AP x-ray of the pelvis, what do you see? One by one, start to speak, one person, one per, what are positive finding, whatever you can see? How do you say it is a posterior column? More important. So you are talking about this? Okay. Yes. So according to him, it's a posterior column disruption. Anything else? Quadrilateral plate. Where is the quadrilateral plate? Ilio ischial line is for the quadrilateral plate or it is for the posterior column? For the posterior column. So how do you say that the quadrilateral plate is broken? So this head is dislocated into the pelvis. So you feel it is a central dislocation and that is why it is a quadrilateral plate fracture. Now what if this head has migrated posteriorly? How do you say on an AP x-ray whether it is a central dislocation or a posterior dislocation or an anterior dislocation? What you can say for is that this is a dislocated head, right? Why it is dislocated? What is the relationship which will give you a guidance whether the head is dislocated or not dislocated? Head with the sentence line. Let us talk more about acetabulum. Roof of acetabulum. This is called the sore sill. This is the roof of acetabulum. The relationship between roof and head has to be congruent. Then it is a not dislocated or a well aligned or relocated. If that has disrupted, this and this relationship has disrupted, then it is dislocation. This dislocation may be anteromedial, may be pure medial, may be posteromedial. You cannot comment on the AP x-ray. Okay? So what you can for sure say is that this is a dislocated head. This is a fracture of the acetabulum, most likely involving the posterior column because your 
intact iliopectinal line. Iliopectinal line going from here all the way here seems intact. So it does not involve the anterior column. It must be involving the posterior column. This is the roof that I was telling you. So this is the anterior wall along in continuity with this and on your bone model, on your bone model, it is this line, okay? That is this. Then this is your teardrop. On your bone model, it is this, this portion, this portion, what we call as a medial wall, okay? Now, this is the ileum. The outline of the entire ileum is here, okay? This is pubis, this is ischium, and this is the ileum. Yes, what did you say? Posterior wall. Where did you see the posterior wall? The posterior wall is here, which is with the column. How do you see a posterior wall? Posterior wall is seen properly in which view? See, here you can see the posterior wall. Anterior wall, if it is all well aligned, you can make out. But when dislocated, your posterior wall will be seen only in your obturator view. Obturator view shows anterior column and posterior wall. Iliac view shows posterior column and anterior wall. Right? Very simple to remember. And this is your posterior column. As you can see, as you people rightly diagnose, this posterior column is broken and displaced. Okay? Posterior column cannot break from one completely. Posterior column also has to break from the ischiopubic ramus. Okay? As it was suggested in your first lecture, it is a ring, it breaks in two, from two places. This is your floor of the acetabulum. This is your ilioischial line, which would otherwise would have been like this here, but now it is broken. This, this portion of the uh, acetabular, uh, what you can say, the joint line is with the posterior column. This portion is more laterally and anteriorly, okay? So the, as, I, as I said, this is the obturator view. In the obturator view, this is a very poor quality x-ray. However, nowadays x-rays are not so bad. But in the obturator view, you can see the entire anterior column, which seems intact, and this posterior column with this piece, which may be a wall, dislocated, okay? And your iliac view will show you the posterior column, which is broken, and anterior wall. You can see this anterior wall, which is intact. Okay. Okay. Now this is your CT scan. Somebody asked me how you can, you know, find out in the CT scan about the column and the wall. Okay. This is a small posterior wall fragment. This is a column fragment. Sorry. Let's go back. Now there is a very simple rule in a CT scan. In this portion, which is just above the acetabulum, just above. At the level of roof, this is the cut at the level of roof. You divide it into, make a plus, divide into two parts. Okay? So one part, this side and this side, medial and lateral, anterior and posterior. Can you make out? So you get four quadrants. Okay? Everybody understands? Whatever is medial is a column. Whatever is lateral is a wall. Okay? And when you make a Cut like this, if there is any break here, anterior column, posterior column, posterior wall, anterior wall. Very simple. Okay? Just make one plus. Yeah. So whenever you see, uh, now look here. Let us just look here. Okay? Make a plus like this. Okay? Head co center me rakhe plus. Okay? So whatever is medial is a column. So now you are seeing that posterior portion medially broken, posterior column gone. Posterior portion laterally may be this broken. See, if you make it like this, 
here also there is a fracture you have to put a wall got it so yahan se aisa line banaya aisa line banaya you have to see from whatever is intact extrapolate it ke ye idhar hona chahiye so abhi ye aisa plus banaya aapne ye aapka hua anterior wall ye aapka hua anterior column dono intact hai ये आपका हुआ पोस्टेरियर वॉल जो टूटा है और ये आपका पोस्टेरियर कॉलम जो यहाँ आ गया है ठीक है तो सिटी स्कैन में इट वेरी इजी टू अंडरस्टैंड बराबर ना फाइन नाउ अगेन कमिंग बैक टू द केस सो दिस पोस्टेरियर कॉलम फ्रैक्चर एंड देर इज अ लिटिल बिट ऑफ वॉल सो ये कॉल इट अस्टियर कॉलम विद पोस्टेरियर वॉल ओके नाउ वॉट अदर इन्वेस्टिगेशन और वॉट अदर थिंग्स यू वॉन्ट टू चेक इन दिस सिचुएशन so you want to check the neurological thing yes whenever there is a beak like entering into the site see this is in the area of sciatic notch ye lesser sciatic notch ye greater sciatic notch pata chala isme dekho la aise dekho lesser sciatic notch greater sciatic notch ye fracture yahan kahin pe hai greater sciatic notch ke summit pe hai dekha yahan pe curve se upar shayad yahan hai so this is the area where your sciatic nerve and superior discal vessel two things will be exiting so if you have the anatomy in your mind to ye aise dikhte hain aap sabse pehle sciatic nerve check karenge aur patient ko shock ke liye monitor karenge superior gluteal vessel agar lacerate hue hain in this patient if the superior gluteal vessels are torn then patient will bleed also when you go in for the surgery you try to reduce it you will make sure that sciatic nerve and superior gluteal vessels don't get entrapped in the fracture पहले आप उनको आइडेंटिफाई करेंगे उनको बाहर निकालेंगे और फिर इसको अंदर बिठाएंगे समझ गए ना जैसे रेडियल नव कई बार फ्रैक्चर में फंस जाती है तो हम पहले रेडियल नव को डिसेक करते हैं बाहर लेते हैं और उसके बाद फ्रैक्चर रिड्यूस करते हैं सेम थिंग हियर गॉट इट ओके सो नाउ यू गॉट द डायग्नोसिस वेरी इजी बिकॉज यू सॉ थ्री व्यूज ऑन एक्सरे एंड यू स्टडी द सिटी स्कैन प्रॉपरली बराबर थ्री डी स्कैन में दिखता है आई डोंट से नो बहुत ईजिली दिखता है बट जो बेसिक्स है ना वो हमको माइंड को ट्रेन करना है कि डायरेक्ट थ्री पे जंप नहीं करना है ठीक है सो नाउ यू हैव अ पोस्टियर कॉलम एंड पोस्टियर वॉल फ्रैक्चर हाउ विल यू ट्रीट इट सो यू फाइंड दैट द पेशेंट इज हैविंग अ लिटिल बिट ऑफ साइट इन पॉलिसी द पेशेंट इज हैविंग नो शॉक पेशेंट इज हैविंग नो अदर एसोसिएटेड इंजरी नाउ यू वॉन्ट टू ट्रीट इट सो फर्स्ट थिंग वॉट अदर इन्वेस्टिगेशन यू वॉन्ट टू डू सेकेंड थिंग वेन डू यू वॉन्ट टू गो इन थर्ड थिंग what approach you want to take so now somebody from the second row will volunteer at least aap logo ne aapke sath senior colleagues ko operate karte to dekha hoga acetabulum agar khud nahi kiya hai to so at least you know how the decision making is working see execution is 50% decision making is 50% execution karne ke liye aap india bhar se kisi ko ghar apne aap bula ke kara sakte hain decision making aapko karna hai पेशेंट का काउंसलिंग आपको करना है तो वो आपको पता होना चाहिए ठीक है सो नाउ इफ यू हैव टू डिसाइड व्हेन डू यू वांट टू ऑपरेट हाउ यू वांट टू ऑपरेट ओके एंड इज देर एनीथिंग एल्स यू वांट टू चेक बिफोर गोइंग इन माइक दीजिए पीछे ओके सो यू वांट टू सी वेदर देर इज एन इंट्रा आर्टिकुलर फ्रैगमेंट एनी इंट्रा आर्टिकुलर इंपैक्शन इंट्रा आर्टिकुलर इंपैक्शन भी होता है एंड थर्ड थिंग एनी इंजरी टू द हेड ऑफ द फीमर जब हेड इतना जोर से उसमें टकराता है और वो एसेटाबलम को तोड़ता है तो हेड को कुछ तो डैमेज होगा ना राइट सो इफ देर इज अम्पैक्शन फ्रैक्चर इन द हेड ऑफ द फीमर विच इज इन्वॉल्विंग द वेट बेरिंग डोम देन द प्रोग्नोसिस इज गोइंग टू बी बैड ये पेशेंट को फ्यूचर में टी एच आर आने वाला है तो हमको ये सर्जरी में टी एच आर बर्बाद नहीं करना है राइट right? इन्फेक्शन नहीं होना चाहिए हमको खूब ध्यान रखना है हमारा प्लेन इंसिजन हम पोस्टर इंसिजन लगाएंगे फिर टीएचआर के लिए कैसा इंसिजन लगाएंगे तो हमको पोस्ट्रोलैटरल वाला अप्रोच ही जाना है ये सब माइंड में कैलकुलेशन चलना चाहिए राइट ये सब डिसीजन आप कैसे ले सकते हैं अगर आपने सी स्कैन ठीक से स्टडी किया है ओके न्यूरोलॉजिकल इंजरी ऑब्वियसली जब हम ओ में जाते हैं वेन वी एक्सपोज इट वी आर गोइंग टू लुक एट दाइटिक नव वील टेक पिक्चर ऑफ दाइटिक नव वील हैव अवर माइक्रोवास्कुलर सर्जन स्टैंड बाय कि भाई अगर जरूरत पड़े तो तू रिपेयर कर देना हमको भी पता है कि इट इज अ फ्यूटाइल एक्सरसाइज उससे कोई खास फर्क नहीं पड़ने वाला बट लेकिन पेशेंट को ये चाहिए कि सर अगर हो सकता था तो आपने क्यों नहीं किया ठीक है तो एटलीस्ट वो आके देख ले बोले कि भाई ये करने की जरूरत नहीं है ऑन पेपर लिख के चला जाए फाइन नथिंग रॉन्ग 
but you had that thing planned. So your decision making depends on your study of your CT scan. So now in this patient, no intraarticular fragments, no head impaction injury, partial sciatic nerve injury, only foot drop, uh, no open wounds, no other issues, patient fit for surgery. Now you decide how you want to operate. With no visual injury, sir. No other injury, only acetabulum, pure fracture. We have to decide uh, by which uh, position. Uh, so which position you want to take? Lateral. Lateral position is fine, nothing wrong. Yes, then so you decide the position, you decide the approach. Posterior approach. What? Is there a name for that approach? Moore's approach. Cocker Langenbeck. Cocker. That is the difference. The Moore's approach is a posterior approach. Cocker Langenbeck is a postural lateral, lateral approach. approach. Okay? So the split of the gluteus maximus is more anteriorly in Cocker Langenbeck. And that is the approach you take. You don't take Moore's approach. Okay? Because this fracture line that you see here on your bone model, that fracture line is somewhere here like this. And you have to put a plate from here to here, more anteriorly. If you go a posterior approach, you cannot put a plate like this. Okay, you are going to damage the superior neurovascular bundle. You have to put a plate like this, going anterior. So your approach has to be either cocker langer neck or another one lateral approach is there. Gibson's. Okay, modified Gibson's. One of these two. In columns, usually we use cocker langer neck. In walls, you can use Gibson. You don't have to move so much posteriorly, so you can use Gibson. Okay? So your approach is decided, your position is decided when you want to operate. You want to operate in 24 hours, in 48 hours, in 3 days, in 7 days. When? How do you decide? Yes? Patient is absolutely stable. Now when? 5 days. So when you have a neurological injury, when you have a persistent hip dislocation, what is the need to wait? How do you justify to wait? Whatever the factor causing the neurological injury has not been dealt with. If it is a bone spike, if it is a head pressing, if it is a column pressing, you have not done it properly. So why do you want to wait five days? Right? So there are certain situations in acetabulum fractures which require urgent surgery. And they are first, persistent dislocation, second, neurological injury, third, open fracture, fourth, head incarcerated between the fracture fragments, which means what? In a transverse fracture, the head is here, the column is here, another column is here, head beach mein fasa hai, impacted hai, jitna wo move karega, utna wo ghista jayega. You will have a head impression fracture. Samaj ke? So these are the situations where and a new onset sciatic palsy after reduction of dislocation. So in these five scenarios, you don't want to wait. You want to go in as early as possible. Okay? Got it, everybody? Fine. Now let's move forward. Ah, okay. But obviously, you have to do it or do it. But this is what you wanted to do. In a column plus wall combination, Sir, abhi hum ten pe jate in a column plus wall combination, do you use single plate or use two plates? Yeah. Posture column, posture wall, jaisa usme tha na. Isme wall chota tha. Suppose ke thoda sa bada ho wall. So you want to use single plate or want to use? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. It's a large fragment. Two screws possible. Now what you want to do? Lab. So, I want all of you to pay attention here. Your plate for the column goes like this. Plate for the wall goes like this. If your plate for the column goes like this, you may miss the fracture altogether. Got it? So a column plate is first 
and a wall plate is second. You require both. If it is a small fragment, if it is a small fragment, you may put two interfragmentary screws and still buttress it with a spring plate, somebody said. But only two screws for wa uh, wall fragment is unstable. You have to buttress it with a plate. So column plus wall fracture, column plus wall plate, compulsory, okay? Yeah, now the basics are with you. Now we are going to go to the most complex scenario. Oh, aapke pas case to aapki experience ke sab se nahi aayega. Oh, to Bhagwan ne jo bhi dalna hai, googly ho dalega. Sorry. So now this is the fracture. Somebody from you. Aap batao. Read the x-ray, please. It's a pelvis AP. Normal x-ray. Normal x-ray? What is this? Retrograde urethrogram, where is the urethra? Urethra kaha dikh raha isme? Urinary A dikh raha hai tumko? Ureter dikh raha hai? Is taraf ye ureter nahi dikh raha hai? Dikh raha hai? Antigrade hai ye. Abhi tak patient ne susu kiya nahi hai, isle ye yaan nahi dikh raha hai. Samaj gai? Isme koi catheter nahi hai, retrograde nahi hai, antigrade hai. So it is IV contrast which is done. IV contrast flows from the kidney into the bladder. Thik hai? Samaj gai? Okay, that's fine. Ab ye batao, what do you see here? Ye to sab normal hai. What do you see here? Line se jau na? Sign se jau. Ye. Intact. Dome. But it is. Yes. Fir ye. Something fishy here. Hai na? So it seems to be a posterior fracture dislocation of the hip. Why not anterior? Because anterior wall looks intact. With some injury to the head of the femur. We are not sure. So what is the next thing you want to do? CT scan. CT scan, yes. Will your obturator and iliac view help in this situation? They help us in uh, leg, leg uh, indentation on leg canal. Uh, hmm. Can you see something over here? So there seems to be a head fragment also in the joint, right? Ye jo dikh raha hai, ye shayad head fragment hai. So yes, right. Obturator view, iliac view should be done as a routine when you are having a pelvic injury. But uske liye specially agar aapko order karna hai, to better cap CT scan kara lo. Now this reduction is done. Okay. Where the alignment? Yes or no? What do you say about the alignment? How many people agree that this is well aligned? Perfect congruent hai. Kitne log haath uthao? Yes? Sabko ye aligned nahi lag raha hai? Garbar lag raha hai? Ye head to first class bait gaya andar. Lateralize ye idhar fragment nahi hai, isle aapko aisa lagta hai. Aap isko dekho na. Lo. Ye to first case mein shift honne ka number a gaya. Thik hai. Ye case khatam karke karte hai, ha? So it seems to be congruent for sure, but there is something she over here. You have the other views, again congruent, again congruent, but only thing is that there is a head fragment over here. The wall is also almost in place. If this patient is a 65 year old gentleman, I will treat him conservatively for sure. 100%. Okay. If he's a young, huh? because the purpose of your acetabulum fracture fixation is to get the head beneath the roof. That's it. Agar wo Bhagawan ne karke diya hai, to we are not any way smarter by improving it. Why do you want to do THR? This patient will, with inferior head fragment, this patient will not have, ye absorb ho jayega, chhe mahine baad, dikhega bhi nahi aapko. Absolutely. This is the obturator view. This is your iliac view. Iliac view may be congruent hai, obturator view may be congruent hai, wall fragment bohot chota sa hai, aur agar stable hai, head ka fragment agar beech mein nahi a raha hai. See, if this head fragment was somewhere here, if this congruity was disturbed, I will definitely consider getting it out. But if the congruity is not disturbed and stability is there, then what are we going to go in and improvise? Oh, fragment nikal ke hum kya achieve kiye? 
stable hip does not require any surgery. You know how to judge whether it is stable or not? Intraoperative stress test, flexion, adduction, push. Or if stable hai, don't do anything. If uh, fragment is here, then you have to do something here. And if it is here, then it will not come to congruency. Compare करो इसको और इसको same है वो आ ही नहीं सकता congruency अगर head fragment फंसा है तो got it so this is what CT scan दिखा रहे हैं वो लोग उसी चीज का see the wall is so small see there is nothing in here यही वो fragment है that is inferior half ठीक है weight bearing is the important force here ठीक है let us see what they have done. See? <laughs> Left to two arms. Fine. So head fragment dekhna chahiye. Fine. That's good. Thank you. Move forward. Uh, the problem we are facing on the other two groups is they all of them should know the basic lines. What is the iliopectinal line? What is the uh, iliostial line? Anterior uh, wall, posterior wall, teardrop. So that one basic lecture, Aditya is going to take for you. Because from here, when you are coming to that section, everybody, now that those who have learned from Aditya will understand it further. But every time I have to explain to them how this iliopectin line is to be seen, how iliostial line is to be seen. Aditya, you have seen it here first. You have seen it here. But I have the section that has nothing in it. So that's not coming to understand. So I want the whole group to first see that. Hello? Yeah. So now, uh, just uh, some overlap. You understood the entry column? This already Kale sir has covered. Okay? So, uh, into the obturator foramen, entry column from outside and inside and then the posterior column, okay? So now radiographic lines, whenever we are taking a AP view, look for the uh, obturator view and the iliac view. So these are the three views that are very essential whenever you are taking a 
suspecting a uh, acetabular fracture. So now, these are the essential lines that have been discussed by Letternel. So what, uh, in whenever we are uh, assessing a acetabular trauma, so cortical edges of anterior and posterior walls, the iliopectineal line and the ischial line and the acetabular dome and the acetabular teardrop. So now what to look for whenever we are looking at the AP view. So this is the AP view. Look for these five lines. Iliopectineal line, anterior column injuries, the line one. Ilioischial line, look for the posterior column injuries. Then the teardrop, it is a radiographic uh, landmark. Then the acetabular dome and the anterior and the posterior acetabular walls. This is clear now. So now coming to the acetabular roof line, it represents injury to the superior weight bearing area without defining the extent of the injury. Okay. Acetabular teardrop, analysis of the teardrop indicates that involvement of the quadrilateral surface in the acetabular fractures. Okay. So now this is uh, Mata's medial roof, uh, roof arc angle, the angle between the vertical line through the femoralate center and a line from the femoralate center to the first medial fracture line. Okay. The clinical relevance of this non-operative treatment is an option when the roof arc angles is more than 45 degree in all three standard views. Understood? So now why do we require judate views? Why can't we, a, a single AP will subside, uh, will be enough. Uh, so why? So now you can see the pubic and the ischial fragments are perpendicular almost to the iliac fragment. You can see in the true frontal plane, the obturator segment and the iliac wing have an angulation of approximately 45 degrees. So oblique views are taken for two plane analysis with the pelvis being rotated either left or right by 45 degrees. Okay. So now by using two views, the obturator segment and the iliac segments becomes evident. I, under, I hope this is clear. Obturator segment and the iliac segment. Okay. Please feel to add, uh, add upon this whenever. So now this is the iliac view. You can see the posterior column in the orange. Okay. Uh, the anti wall can be seen and the iliac fossa can be seen in blue. Okay. Now coming to this. Fine obturator view, aapko pe obturator ring will be seeing complete obturator ring. I like view, you are seeing like this. I am uh, speaking with regards to right hip. Understood? So now this makes the picture clear. Okay? So I like wing, posterior column, entry wall. Abhi obturator view pe aate hain. So now entry column. Okay, okay. Now, see, once you turn the patient like this, you see the whole of the ileum for the left side. Now, I'm talking about the left side. So, after you have to shoot it from here, you can see the ileum from here. And now, see the ileum from here. And see the border, the line. Now, that is the ileo-ischial line. If she's drawing now, this is the ileo-ischial line, which is being seen here, this part. So, this is the ileo-ischial line. Okay. So you are speaking regarding left hip now. Yeah. This is the anterior column. No, you go So now we are coming to the obturator view over here. So now you see obturator view. You can see the anterior line, iliopectineal line. So now obturator view, kaise nikalte, kaise nikalte? So always look at the foramen. Aapko jab pura obturator foramen dikh raha hai. So that is the obturator view. And so whenever we are speaking regarding column, like Kale sir said, look at the obturator ring. If it is broken, always suspect a column fracture somewhere. Something is happening. Okay. So be suspicious in that case. And then look at the posterior wall in the yellow. Understood? So now we have covered AP, 
iliac and obturator. So now this makes it more clear. You can see the entry column. You can see the posterior wall. You can see the obturator ring. And you can see the issue pubic ramus. All everything in the obturator view. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks for adding that. <laughs> yeah. Take out one o in that. You don't require one. Uh, Thank you, sir. So, so now, now coming to the CT scan. Okay. So, uh, like, so now in CT scan, this is the axial cut. Now, always uh, start reading 2D CTs because they are more helpful. So now, so now this is the medial part. You have the vestibular dome. Now then you draw, draw a horizontal line that divides into entry and posterior. Entry is shown in yellow and this uh, uh, is the posterior column, okay? Now coming to this, okay? Now this makes the picture clear. So a vertical line that will be the transverse component of your fracture. This is the wall fragments, okay? And then when there is, there is a, yes sir. So now and there is a column. Entry column, posterior column. Okay, so now you can see a transverse component. So now whenever you are seeing an axial cut, you are going through the dome downwards. Okay, so now there is a vertical fracture line. You can see that is a transverse component of your fracture. Understood? Go to the next, you come to the, now you can see the horizontal component of your fracture. This is the posterior column. Go to the next, now you can see the walls are involved. Okay, and go to the next, you can see a multi fragment It can be entry wall or post wall, but this is to make you understand how to read a 2D CT. Okay, now we go to the next. Now 3D simply what it does, it simplifies. Yes. So now, so now this, I think the, we have covered this now. So this fracture types have been covered by sir. So now the elementary and then the associated types. Okay. And then how you classify. Okay. So now you see for the iliopectineal and ileoacial lines, intact iliopectineal and ileoacial line, then look for the wall. Okay, whether it is posterior wall or anterior wall. Now, again, you read the, now this is uh, help to help you classify based on the AP view. Then in again, AP, you see for iliopectineal and ileoacial line, if it is a single column fracture, the iliopectineal line is broken, it is an entry column fracture. It is a ileo fracture, ileoacial line is broken, it is a posterior column fracture. It can be associated with a posterior wall also. Now, you see that both the uh, lines are broken, then your suspicions, then you start looking for the issue pubic ramus and the iliac wing. Okay. So now intact issue pubic ramus and the iliac wing, you, it can be a transverse or transverse with posterior wall. If there is a fracture of the issue pubic ramus, but intact iliac wing, it is a T shaped. The fracture line going inside the obturator ring. If there is a fracture of the issue pubic ramus and iliac wing, it can be a both column fracture or it can be an entry column with posterior hemitransverse. I hope this simplifies your decision making, diagnosing part, okay? So I th this covers the basics of that and now I feel that we are more prepared for the small group discussions now. Yes sir? Fine, thank you.
ओके ओके सो वी वी विल कंटिन्यू इन द प्रीवियस टू कॉल्स बिफोर कॉल Capsular, liberal, or what is not justified? Post case right there. So, so sir, uh, regarding that approach and what is your preferred method of fixation? So, the anterior approach you can you can approach the anterior column by uh, anterior wall by uniparal approach by your femoral approach both ways. So, and fixation. So, more of a it is a capsular <coughs> complex. It is more of a you know putting anchor, suturing your labrum, putting a small screw in the anterior column, all those things. But sir, anterior wall, sir, if it is there, I beg your pardon, sir. Mm -hmm. You can always take by wind, window to the EO inviner and put in two screws also if it is taken up to wire, sir. It's very, very small. Most of the time, it is only middle window, you are saying? Mm, yeah, only means open up, but middle window, say, you can access that anterior wall with that. Uh, yeah, window. middle window is the workhorse of EO inviner approach, but provided you are able to cut the EO pectinal uh, fascia. And able to retract your vessels here and there. Unless you don't cut the neopectinal fascia, of course. you are not able to retract your Absolutely. vessels laterally. Medially. Absolutely, sir. Unless you don't dissect out the iliopsoas, you are not able to dissect between the iliopsoas and the pectineus. Yes. So to get that, to get that things out of the place, we have to do other things. You have to do other things. You have to do other things. And then you can put in two screws and see. Yeah. You can your fixation can be from any quarter. What your exposure has to involve all the three. All the three. So I, I fully, I fully agree. Yeah, is eleven. Okay. Anybody? Yes. Anybody volunteering? What view is this? This is more of an inlet view, right? It's not a pure AP. It's more of an inlet view. Of course, perfect. Not perfect. More of an inlet view. 
as I told you, obscurator forum is not seen. Supe and inferior pubic ramus almost overlapping. Sacrum seen only from the top. So these are all the things suggesting that this is a inlet vein. So sir, sacrum seen only from the top, sir. Can you just repeat it, sir? Yeah, see, you see the anterior sacral line. You okay, see this sir. pelvis as a full complete ring. Yes, sir. This you can see only with the inlet vein. Okay, sir. So one second. Second thing is your foramen here, so it is almost over, not, yes, not sir. obliterated. Yes, sir. Here it is partly seen, but not what is seen on routine ACS. Yes, sir. Right? This is the second thing. And uh, you cannot see the inferior part of the sacrum here anywhere. Yes, sir. So these are the three things. Three things you see yeah. in the inlet view. Oh, Nothing yes. Except that's the inlet view. Okay. So fine. The inlet view or whatever view showing some injury in the left acetabulum area. Uh, now your ilioinguinal line is broken. Your ilioistial line seems to be intact. But since it's not an AP view, we cannot be very sure. So let's see what other views. Yes. Now you have this obturator view. Okay. So what do you see in the obturator view? Anterior column and posterior wall. Posterior, posterior wall, wall seems to be intact. Anterior but anterior column, column appears to be disrupted. Now look here. Up to here it seems to be intact. But this is the remaining gap. So it is disrupted. Got it? Okay. So anterior column gone. Posterior column okay. Posterior wall okay. Not column. Right? Anything else you can see here? Hmm? Sir, head impact. There is a cartilaginous injury. Where? Sir, there is a, uh, in the lateral side, there is a impaction. This portion. Of the, yes, sir. Okay. Of the impaction of so the lateral articular cartilage. That the head has gone protrusive. Has, has gone? Inside. Protrusive. Yes, pro protrusive. This is a protrusive. Because you can see this portion not articulating with the head. The lateral most part. Aapka pelvis model kaan dekhi? Sorry. So when you are seeing it in obturator view like this, ठीक है? इस side का देखो. Obturator view like this, and when the head is not articulating here. ये जो portion है, वो इधर है. अब head इसके साथ articulate नहीं कर रहा है. Normally head इधर ऐसा होता है. तो इसका मतलब head protrude हो गया. Right? So this. So, impaction, protrusio, anterior, wall, uh, anterior column fracture, posterior wall intact. Let us see another view. Posterior column also. Okay, huh? This is the eye view, view, sir. Yeah, eye view. Anterior wall intact. Yeah, see, broken lag. Can you make up? Or posterior column definitely broken. Video is still like a posterior column broken. Okay, which I'm about to say that this is suggested to be this head is moving with this and not. So there is a basically is a loss of cartilage, articular cartilage. Loss of congruence. Because of the articular cartilage. Because of the gap at the fracture over here. Yes. So can because of the gap. Fracture under chala gaya to gap hai. But the congruence is lost. Okay. So now in this situation, what else do you want to do? Definitely you want to do a CT scan. You cannot do anything without a CT scan. This is your CT scan. Now we can use the transverse line. Okay. One, two. Whatever. Now we can tell you. So primarily, this is your one fragment, which is the anterior. Medial is going to go. Call. This is your quadrilateral plate. Okay? और ये पोस्टियर कॉलम तो सब सही लग रहा है, वॉल कॉलम दोनों, ठीक है? But if you trace beyond, इससे नीचे वाला भी नहीं है, ये सब ऊपर वाले भी हैं। इससे नीचे जाओगे, ये आपको यहाँ तक का दिखाए। There may be displacement here. There is one fracture pattern, which is called A C P H T, where the posterior column is usually a low posterior column. So if you are going to go even further down, 
then you may see. So, so, yes. So, just one small request. Yes. This uh, workshop and lectures are also live on other day. So, okay. So now when we go down, when you see the entire head, at that time now you can see the fracture area in the posterior column. Can you see here? Ye, ye, ye yaha, ye yaha, ye yaha. Okay. So you have to see all your axial views, your superior in the weight bearing dome area was showing anterior column injury. Your inferior axial views in the head area is showing a posterior column injury. So this is something which is involving both the columns. So it is a complex fracture pattern. It is not anterior column. It is not anterior wall. It is not posterior column. It is not posterior wall. And it is not posterior column with posterior wall. So that leaves you with only four other options. Transfers, transfers with posterior wall, ACPHT, and associate both columns. Ab ye char hi bache. Okay? Fine. Now this is what you can see. This is your posterior column fragment. This is your anterior column fracture. Okay? Itna aapko AP mein dikhta hai. Ye dekho head kitna hai. Ye head kitna hai. Proctor's view dikh raha na? Can you all take out? Now you see this. Quadrilateral plate fracture, anterior column fracture, head moving in from here. This is what we call as a salon door. ऐसे वो दरवाजे नहीं होते थे पुराने जमाने में सैलून में ऐसे खुलते थे और हम अंदर चले जाते थे तो ये देखो आप ये एंट्रियर कॉलम उठ गया क्वार्टरलेटल प्लेट अंदर खुल गया और ये दर हेड गोइंग इन सर कैन वी कैन वी जस्ट गो टू द सीटी प्रीवियसली इफ यू डोंट मेक आउट सर दिस यू कैन मेक आउट यस सर नहीं सर प्रीवियस सर जो सीटी कट्स था ये सर इन दिस what do you read? How will you read the CT? So in here? this anterior column, anterior wall, posterior wall, posterior column. This is a quadrilateral plate fracture extending into the posterior column. This is an anterior column fracture, which is you can see it is a separate piece. Ye pura dikh raha aapko? Yeah, anterior column hai. Yeah, sir, anterior, anterior wall. column hai. Anterior wall mein kuch nahi hai. Posterior wall mein kuch nahi hai. Posterior column tak extend ho raha hai quadrilateral plate. Posterior column तक क्या हो रहा है सर? ये quadrilateral plate, the fracture of the quadrilateral plate. Yes, sir. Okay, इतना तो. No, that's good, sir. Gulf sign is very different. Gulf sign तो बहुत confusing है. Some people call the posterior wall fracture as gulf sign. Some people call the dome impaction as gulf sign. वो जब इस तरह तो मैं आपको बता पाऊँगा. So moving quickly because we want to cover everything. So this is your fracture which is primarily anterior column and part of posterior column only in form of quadrilateral plate. You can see in obturator foramen there is a, this undisplaced. Can you see this fracture line? Yes. Okay. What are they trying to show in this? They are only moving up to the classification. Okay. Low anterior column fracture with osseous quadrilateral surface fragment and posterior superior articular impaction. Aisa koi classification to nahi hai. This I will fit in as a anterior column posterior hemitransverse fracture. And we will treat it accordingly because all these fractures may anterior column needs to be reduced properly. Quadrilateral plate needs to be buttressed from inside. All these fractures are head moving into the pelvis. So ye us category mein hi aata hai. Osteoporotic, elderly, fall, simple fall, lateral impaction injury, head migrating into the pelvis. In stopa you can do everything in this patient. Only thing is the dome impaction may require disimpaction and bone grafting. Okay? Next case. Yes, somebody will just read it out. Ashay, you carry Corona. Ashay, you you take this case. Uh, it's a AP X-ray of the pelvis with both hips. Uh, we can see that the right hip is slightly superiorly migrated as compared to the left in this view. 
the ilio ischial line and the ilio il iliopectineal line both appear to be intact without any break um a tear drop ye hai ha yes. everybody was asking tear drop na ye tear drop hai it is intact your foramen also is intact yeah. hai na yes so so with your knowledge of all the lines how will you classify this fracture ilio ischial ilio pectineal intact means anterior column posterior column intact yes. and all the complex fracture patterns intact yeah to kya bacha either anterior wall or posterior wall yeah. so kaise pata chalega anterior wall ke posterior wall other views lene padenge nahi ho raha hai no, is taraf ho raha hai we'll have to take other views to have a better look at jo bada hai which is lateral is a posterior wall which is less is anterior wall usually because anterior coverage is less than posterior coverage इसमें सिर्फ पोस्टरियर वॉल ये दिख रहा है मुझे यहाँ से यहाँ तक बाकी एंट्रियर वॉल तो क्लियरली नहीं दिख रहा है और यहाँ पे वो पोस्टरियर वॉल नहीं दिख रहा है राइट मोस्ट लाइकली पोस्टरियर फ्रैक्चर डिसलोकेशन ऑब्जरेटर व्यू विल गिव अस करेक्ट आइडिया देखो नाउ यस व्हाट एडिशनल इंफॉर्मेशन यू आर गेटिंग सो वी कैन सी दैट द हिप इज डिसलोकेटेड पोस्टरियर विद अ वॉल फ्रैक्चर वॉल फ्रैगमेंट एनीथिंग एल्स anterior column intact obturator ring intact ischial vitreous intact posterior column also is intact hai na so now do you need any further imaging or we'll just go ahead and fix it if patient ko sciatic nerve palsy hai ct scan ka time waste karna hai okay chalo sciatic nerve palsy nahi hai lekin patient ko bahut pain ho raha hai vvip hai aapke area ka sabse bada don hai और उसको के सर जो भी करना है जल्दी करो ये बहुत दुख रहा है मेरे को सो डू यू स्टिल वांट टू गो फॉर अ सिटी स्कैन एवरी इंफॉर्मेशन यू गॉट फ्रॉम द एक्सरे डू यू वांट टू गो फॉर द सिटी स्कैन यस व्हाई नो वी हां यस यू हैव नॉट मेड श्योर whether there is any impaction injury intra articular fragments head kaisa hai so now you do the ct scan you can see another small fragment over here you can see the impaction over here ये जो है ना ये यहाँ कुछ नहीं दिख रहा है दिस इज अम्पैक्शन और बेटर व्यू में दिखेगा यस ये उसी का है आई डोंट थिंक सो नहीं उस पेशेंट का तो नहीं है अनदर केस देव शोन बट हियर दिस इज द एरिया वेर आई विल डेफिनेटली सस्पेक्ट अगर इसको जूम करके आप देखोगे तो आपको पोस्टर इम्पैक्शन दिखेगा वो इम्पैक्शन क्या होता है आर्टिकुलर कार्टिलेज फेसिंग यू आप हेड को रिड्यूस कर देते हो ना उसके बाद भी वो जो आर्टिकुलर कार्टिलेज आपकी तरफ देख रहा है जबकि वो ऐसा होना चाहिए सो ऑल इंक्लूड उसके पीछे एक ऑस्टोडोम भरा के उसको ऐसा करके जो गैप है उसमें ग्राफ्ट कर दो एंड ऑफ इट अगर बड़ा पीस है तो यू कैन पुट वन और टू स्मॉल के वायर्स डोंट पेनीट्रेट द फर्दर कॉटेक्स कट इट फ्लश पंच इट अ लिटल बिट इन एंड देन पुट योर वॉल ऑन इट समझ गए नहीं समझे वन मॉडल आपको ज्यादा पता यार सो योर इंपैक्शन इंजरी सी यू दिस पोर्शन अरे ये तो या अभी मैं लाइन ड्रॉ करना चाहूं तो कैसे होगा इस पे ऐसे सो सी दिस ऐसे ही रखो इसको ये ऑब्जर्वेटर व्यू में रखो so now your wall fracture is like this okay itna piece ud gaya head uske sath lekin ye jo portion hai na ye portion kai bar impacted ho jata hai andar dab jata hai like so when you are trying to put the wall back uske pehle aapko ye head reduce karke dekhna hai ye portion ko ki wo articular cartilage aapki taraf facing hai head ki taraf facing hai normally kya hota hai हेड अंदर बैठा था वो कार्टिलेज हेड पे ही फेसिंग होना चाहिए वो कार्टिलेज आपको नहीं दिखना चाहिए अगर आपको दिख रहा है इसका मतलब वो इम्पैक्टेड है उसको बंद करना है दैट कार्टिलेज पीस विथ लॉट ऑफ गुड क्वालिटी बोन इन इट हैज टू बी पुट बैक आपने वो एलिवेट किया ना शास्कर टाइप टू एंड थ्री 
उसमें कैसे आर्टिकुलर कार्टिलेज को हम विद बोन एलिवेट करते हैं इसको आर्टिकुलर कार्टिलेज को सिर्फ हिंज करना है अंदर की तरफ और फिर उधर उसके पीछे जो वॉइड बनता है उसमें ग्राफ्ट पैक करना है फिर वॉल को इसके ऊपर लगाना है सो दिस इज यूजली द एरिया ऑफ मार्जिनल इम्पैक्शन दिस वॉट इज कॉल्स मार्जिनल इम्पैक्शन दिस एरिया दैट कैन बी समाइम्स हियर इट कैन बी समाइम्स हियर एंड वॉट वी सी एज ए डोम इम्पैक्शन इज इन दिस एरिया जो आप पिछले केस में देखा था आपने हेड माइग्रेटिंग इन टू दिल्वी सी हेड माइग्रेटिंग आउट तो इम्पैक्शन इधर होगा हेड माइग्रेटिंग इन इम्पैक्शन इधर होगा हेड जहां माइग्रेट करता है वही इम्पैक्शन करता है समझ गए तो आपने हेड को रिड्यूस करने के बाद कॉन्ग्रुएंसी देख के जज करना है कि इम्पैक्शन है कि नहीं है तो डिस इम्पैक्ट करके बाद में इम्प्लांट लगाना है सी हियर यू आर एबल टू सी बिकॉज यू आर गोइंग फ्रॉम पोस्टियर साइड योर ज्वाइंट इज इन फ्रंट ऑफ यू आपने वॉल को ऊपर उठा लिया है यू आर गोइंग इन द प्लेन बिटवीन द वॉल एंड द फ्रैक्चर प्लेन से ही आप पूरा डिसेक्शन करेंगे हेड उधर से ही आया था हेड उधर से ही वापस जाएगा जो जगह बनी उसमें आपको आर्टिकुलर जो जॉइंट दिखेगा आप उधर से तो वो जगह जहां पे आपको जॉइंट दिख रहा है उसमें जॉइंट कार्टिलेज आपको फेसिंग अगर है तो वो कार्टिलेज इम्पैक्टेड है वो कार्टिलेज हेड फेसिंग होना चाहिए और उसको वापस हेड फेसिंग करना है दैट्स इट वेरी सिंपल बट यू रेकोगनाइज इट लुक फॉर इट एंड ट्रीट इट दैट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट समझ गए सर यस सर टू एक्यूरेटली और प्रॉपरली असेस इम्पैक्शन एंड दीज काइंड ऑफ इंजरीज यू हैव टू सी द टू डी कट्स इन ऑल द थ्री एरियाज सो सजाइटल कोरोनल एंड एक्सीएल टू डी कट्स अगर आप देखोगे तो इम्पैक्शन दिखेगा ही सर माय क्वेश्चन इज डू वी सीटी फर्स्ट एंड देन रिड्यूस और रिड्यूस फर्स्ट एंड देन सीटी पोस्टीरियर वॉल फ्रेगमेंट है तो यू कैन प्लान टू रिड्यूस नथिंग रॉन्ग ओके बट इफ इट्स अ कॉलम फ्रैक्चर और इफ इट्स अ मोर कॉम्प्लेक्स वेराइटी ऑफ फ्रैक्चर तो सिर्फ ट्रैक्शन देके ही आपको देख लेना है तो आप वो ओटी में ले जाके रिड्यूस करने की कोशिश नहीं करेंगे इन दिस पर्टिकुलर केस यू कैन ट्राई एंड रिड्यूस इट इन कैजुअलिटी इट सेल्फ देन होल्ड इट इन ट्रैक्शन एंड सेंड इम फॉर सिटी डोंट टेक इन ओटी फॉर रिडक्शन इन दिस केस कैजुअलिटी में उसको खींच के बिठा के ट्रैक्शन लगा के और कई बार ऐसा होगा कि बैठने के बाद वापस डिसलोकेट होगा क्योंकि वॉल फ्रेगमेंट इतना बड़ा है वो टूटा हुआ है तो आपका हेड कंटेन नहीं रहेगा है ना या सो हियर द सिटी स्कैन इज शोइंग यू एंट्रैप फ्रेगमेंट्स पोस्टर वॉल आगे चला गया है पोस्टर वॉल टूटा है और हेड रिडक्शन करने के चक्कर में वो अंदर फंस गया है तो ये हमको नहीं होने देना है सी दिस इज द मार्जिनल इम्पैक्शन आई वॉज टेलिंग यू उसी वो सिटी को उन्होंने जूम किया है तो ये आपको दिख रहा है राइट दिस इज मार्जिनल इंट्रैक्शन यू नीड टू ट्रीट सो नाउ यू कम टू द लास्ट केस यस नाउ लाइन्स वी हैव अ पॉजिटिव ऑफ टाइम सो वी विल डू फास्ट फास्ट ओके आई विल ट्रेस इट आउट फॉर यू इंग्वाइनल लाइन ब्रोकन हेड डिसलोकेटेड intraarticular fragments and this is the only intact fragment and plus the si joint diastasis okay again you look at this ye wohi patient ka hai kya acha wo log ne reduce kar diya head uske baad sab kuch baith gaya wah kya baat hai so now again you can see iliopectinal line almost intact iliopectinal line broken यहां से टूटा हुआ है एंड देर आर सम यस यस देर आर सम फ्रैगमेंट्स इन दिस एरिया 100 परसेंट सिटी स्कैन रिक्वायर्ड ये पोस्टर कॉलम बैठ गया पोस्टर कॉलम गॉट रिड्यूस कैन यू सी दिस गॉट रिड्यूस विद द रिडक्शन बट अदरवाइज इट वाज ब्रोकन सो योर फर्स्ट एक्सरे विच शोड डिसलोकेशन शोड बोथ कॉलम्स ब्रोकन बट विथ रिडक्शन फॉर्चुनेटली एवरीथिंग फॉलन बैक इन प्लेस हेड कॉन्ग्रुएंट हेड कॉन्ग्रुएंट सॉरी हेड कॉन्ग्रुएंट so now uh, we we uh, and even the si joint now closed to bed jane se so now the decision about whether to fix it or not so first get a ct if you want to decide on conservative line you have to prove that conservative is possible it is operative unless proved otherwise so you prove that there is no intraarticular fragment that there is no joint impaction Oh 
only posterior column with posterior wall. Move further, anterior column and anterior wall. Move further, anterior wall, posterior wall, and posterior column, anterior column. Sub could put up. Hena, but this CT is probably before reduction. Okay. Oh, sorry. Khatam ho gaya. Yeah. So probably post reduction CT hai. Now in this situation, there is an intraarticular fragment. There is a malalignment. Though the X-ray showed that there was a congruity, but when we go for a CT scan, we see the correct picture. Now in this situation, definitely you will want to go in. You want to remove this articular fragment. You want to stabilize the anterior with posterior column. So this will require a surgery, right? Yeah, see, this posterior wall is something I may neglect. But this is the fragment which is a concern for me. Yes, so now, where did the head dislocate? Head dislocated posteriorly. So you will be able to access this fragment from posterior only. So your first approach will be posterior. Reduce, fix. Don't put long screws because your entry column may not be reduced indirectly. So here you do posterior approach and then you do anterior approach one by one. Whenever you are doing stage procedure, means you are doing to take two approaches, you have to make sure that your screws are not long and don't go from one column to another column. Posterior plate, sara kuch posterior column ke andar hi nipat jana chahiye. Anterior column mein nahi jana chahiye. Nahi toh wohi screw anterior column ko reduce nahi honne dega. See, in this patient, because I want to get this thing out, I will go posterior approach. Because the dislocation was posterior. What is the difference in bicolumnar fractures? In bicolumnar fractures means the T-type fracture. I'm not talking about ABC. The T-type fracture, you go to the less comminuted column first. Because there you can get hairline reduction. Fix it. And then you go to the more comminuted fragment. Okay? Less comminuted first, more comminuted second. That okay. is how you do also, you have to keep into consideration dislocation. If there is a persistent dislocation, you may not be able to reduce the posterior dislocation from the anterior side. So dislocation will take priority, then the comminution, and then whether indirect reduction is possible or not. See, if there is a quadrilateral plate fragment with the posterior column, then anterior side posterior column reduce ho jayega. So ye bahut sare cheez ko dhyan mein rakke decision lena padta hai. Hum bhi आज की तारीख में 20 साल बाद भी कंफ्यूज होते रहते हैं। सेफ सर्जिकल डिस्लोकेशन के लिए आपको फर्दर ट्रॉमा टू द कैप्सूल करना है, जो नेचर ने एक ट्रॉमा करके दिया है डिस्लोकेशन से। There is a posterior dislocation which was reduced, but that tear rent is there, so exploit that. Just distract the joint. Up, put a uh, hip society screw and intraoperative and distract the joint so the hip will move out and that fragment will be seen. Uh, From posterior, yes. Dislocate nahi karenge, distract karenge. Dislocate karenge, toh aapka woh head beech mein a jayega, kuch nahi dekhne dega. That loose fragment will come in your view. Yes. That fragment Ashish, we have to first retrieve. Ashish sir, sorry, sorry, every, yeah. all the delegates. Yeah. We have all these discussions planned on table when you will be practicing the placement of the uh, fixations on the pelvic bone, including all the fascia type. So unless and until we move, we will yeah. keep on rotating. These discussions sorry. will keep on going. It, 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 sorry, it, it, sorry. It, 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 it is very, very engrossing. Okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. Except yeah. the placement. Except the use in the post-operative. This is the medial plate. We call the intrapelvic plate. Anterior, uh, no, no, the, the, this is intrapelvic plate. Th that is suprapelvic plate. So, you will come when we are talking about SOPA. Thank you. Thank you. We can go with them, sir. अगर आपका हेड रिड्यूस्ड है, तो पोस्टरियर वॉल को भूल जाओ। हेड रिडक्शन करने के लिए पोस्टरियर वॉल की स्टेबिलिटी जरूरी है। अगर पोस्टरियर वॉल स्टेबल है, हेड रिड्यूस होने के बाद, तो पोस्टरियर वॉल को भूल जाओ।
here we will do the same cases. So uh, from 10, 11, 12, 13. Fine. Perfect. Sir, be easy here. So promote it over there. Give me this over here. Then just click on new channel. Just click it. I will be here. Hmm. Okay. I will draw the channel. हाँ टूल्स में जाके ड्रॉ करेंगे यस अंडू कैसे करेंगे इसको और ये डन कर देंगे तो आप बाद में आपको अगर चेंज करना है मोड तो कर देंगे फर्स्ट क्लास एन नंबर तो डबल स्लाइड केस नंबर तो So, see, whenever you have a pelvis fracture and acetabulum fracture, whenever you have a pelvis fracture and acetabulum fracture, pelvis will kill, acetabulum will not. So, you would address the pelvis first. Then you should address the pelvis. Yes, you should have taken care of the diastasis first. Because that diastasis of 2.5 centimeter means there is a posterior injury also and that pelvis was unstable. भूल जाओ, hip में avian होगा, उससे ज़्यादा क्या होगा? इसमें patient मर गया ना? Life is more important than limb. So again, 10, 11, 12. Yeah. Okay. New batch. So we'll just, if you want to come in the front, then probably it will be whoever. आगे आना है तो अच्छा रहेगा. सोना है तो. Please, please, please come. If you want to sleep, best is behind. So we are keeping it more interactive. Sir will be demonstrating you an X-ray, and we would like you to participate now. So now in this pelvis X-ray, I want one of you to just enumerate all the lines and whether they are interact or not. Please go ahead. Oh, mic can I rotating, sir? View, we can see intact iliopectineal line, ilioischian line, intact obturator ring, intact iliac bone. Anterior wall is intact, posterior wall is broken. Where is the anterior wall and where is the posterior wall? Can you be very sure about it here? In this x-ray? See, whatever is more lateral is posterior wall. Okay, sir. Because posterior coverage is always more. Okay? Okay. In this x-ray, even on the normal side, I am not sure. Very faintly we can see this anterior wall, very faintly. But the posterior wall is well seen. So this is the posterior wall with some irregularities, some void over here. Okay? Okay, sir. Fine. But what is the most important thing? This is a dislocation. Head dislocation. dislocation. So you have a head dislocation. The roof and the head are not matching. What is this? It's a dye in the bladder. How did it come there? By uh, CECT, abdomen pelvis. By CECT. Contrast, yes. CCT. This is the contrast which has been done probably to rule out some abdominal injuries in this patient. Okay, now with this, another good quality x-ray. Any additional information you are getting? This? This. So you see one and two wall fragments. What is this? Head, head fragment is there. Head fragment is a pipkin fracture also must be there. Yes. So this spherical circular looking is from the head fragment. Okay. Now reduction or CT scan. Close reduction karenge nahi karenge? Nahi hoga close reduction due to incarcerated fragment it will again sublux. So you will just directly go for open reduction in this patient? After doing CT. After doing CT? You will take the patient in OT for open reduction. Most probably, yes. Huh? Yes. So you can never say that a close reduction nahi hoga. Unless you don't try, you don't know. Only thing is it has to be a gentle traction and close reduction. Baut jor jabardasti nahi karna hai. Because your head is already broken, there may be undisplaced fracture lines. If you try to do more jugglery, then those will also displace and you will have now head and neck, both fracture. You don't want that. Okay? So, close reduction done. Now what do you say? Is it congruent or not congruent? It is congruent, sir. 
Convent? Yes, sir. Anybody disagrees? Yes, so you want to see the other two views also. Now tell me, congruent or not congruent? congruent. This is your iliac view, obturator view. These are the two small fragments of posterior wall, but I would say 80 percent of posterior wall is intact. Anterior wall you can see over here now, normal, column normal, head well centered on the dome. Only this fragment type one is pip. not perfectly aligned. So it's a type 1 pipkin. Type one B. Displaced type 1 pipkin fracture with a congruent hip. Agreed everybody? Yes, sir. So who wants to operate and what approach? I don't want to operate the patient, sir. Anybody who wants to operate this patient? Yes? No? Don't want to operate, sir. Okay. So before you decide of not needing to do surgery, you have to take a CT scan. Your CT scan will show you how things are. That was your wall. This is the head and this is the fragment. Okay. Now any change of plan? आपको इमेज देता हूँ ना सर। Yes, अब बताइए। ये वॉल चलेगा क्या? चलेगा। So what is the method to identify whether that wall fragment is significant or not? Is there any way you can judge that? Yes. So how do you say that it is stable? you have reduced it and you are going to keep it in abduction and traction, right? So in that position, it is never going to dislocate. By doing internotation, if it is not dislocating, then it is stable. So right? there is something called as a stress test, which is done intraoperative, fluoroscopy. You just flex, adduct and push. If it is dislocating, it is unstable and you have to fix it. If it is not dislocating, it is stable. You don't fix it. Okay? Flexion, adduction and push. Aap aise bethe hai na? Pair pe pair chada ke. Huh? Wo har ek rotation mein aapko karke dekhna hai, wo stable rehta hai ke nahi. Nahi hoga dislocate. Mein wohi bol raha hu. वो नहीं होगा डिस्लोकेट। With a very small sliver of a wall fragment, once reduced, most of these hips will remain stable in flexion, adduction, and push, or even internal rotation and push. It will still remain intact. Yes. So your intraoperative test is showing that the hip is stable. Your CT scan is showing this large head fragment, which is. Slightly, you know, intraarticular fracture, intraarticular step. So now do you want to operate? Who all wants to operate and how you are going to go about with it? Kisko operate karna pehle wohaat upar kare? Who wants to operate this patient? Sir wants to operate. To abhi aap log ko operate nahin karna hai? Sir, now what will you get from this view? Okay, okay. So, the type 1, type 2, type 3 are three different types of fracture lines. One is type 1 which is infrafoveal, type 2 which is involving supraphoveal, meaning weight-bearing dome, and type 3 with either acetabulum fracture, type 4 with neck fracture. Just so, this is infrafoveal with acetabulum fracture, so type 3. अब इसको क्या करना है अपने? ऑपरेट करना है? ऑपरेट करना है? ओके। सो नाउ व्हाट इज़ द गोल ऑफ़ योर सर्जरी? आप वो सर्जरी करके क्या अचीव करना चाहते हैं? पहले तो कौन से अप्रोच से जाएंगे? दिस इज़ अ एंटीरो इनफीरियर फ्रैगमेंट हाँ? देख लो आप ये एंटीरियर फ्रैगमेंट और इनफीरियर है। ये
सो एंटर इन्फीरियर फ्रेगमेंट को आप कैसे फिक्स करोगे विच अप्रोच सेफ सर्जिकल डिसलोकेशन में ये फ्रेगमेंट क्योंकि वो अटैच है विथ योर लिगामेंट ऑफ टीरीज तो ये फ्रेगमेंट को आपको उसमें से काट के बाहर निकालना पड़ेगा तो जो शायद वास्कुलर है उसको ए वास्कुलर करके फिर आपको रिड्यूस करना है ठीक है ना तो अब बताओ यस सो वेन एवर यू वॉन्ट टू फिक्स एंट्रो इंफीरियर मेजर फ्रेगमेंट you do anterior arthrotomy smith patterson approach that is where you don't disturb disturb the vascularity of the uh, fragment and you can still achieve the reduction but in this case now you have a posterior wall anterior column i mean anterior fragment to do do approach karenge posterior wall to stable hai to usko conservative kar sakta hai so dono stable hai this fragment is the infra focal fragment over a period of time it will get lysed gal jayega it is not in your weight bearing area it is not contributing to the stability if your posterior wall in stress test is showing everything is intact to iska matlab hai isko operate karke hum kuch achieve nahi kar rahe hain we can treat it conservatively so to treat it conservatively we have to be sure that we are not missing out anything to no fragment over here ye fragment chalega ye nahi chalega okay congruency no impaction in the head if all these criteria are fulfilled and your hip is stable conserve theek hai okay next okay this case anybody will iliopectineal line is broken iliopectineal line is broken iliopectineal line may be intact may be broken not sure ये तो पक्का टूटा है उधर एक और है यस वन एंड टू जब आपको ऐसा दिखता है तो इसका मतलब क्या है नो वेन यू आर सींग यस सी वेन यू आर सींग दिस काइंड ऑफ अ लाइन विथ इंटेक्टल लाइन यूजली दिस क्वार्टरलेटल प्लेट फ्रैगमेंट क्वार्टरलेटल प्लेट कैन बी ब्रोकन एंड सेपरेटेड फ्रॉम द पोस्टर कॉलम so that your posterior column looks intact but the quadrilateral plate is casting another medial shadow so you have a medial shadow of the anterior column another medial shadow of the quadrilateral plate theek hai the head seems to have gone in lag raha hai aisa protrusio lag raha hai protrusio ye lateral portion jo hai wo head ke sath articulate nahi kar raha hai head has gone protrusio theek hai na so this is the things that you could identify on your x ray now that same thing on obturator view this is your anterior column which is broken here yeah ye yahan dekho farak okay the your posterior column which doesn't i mean posterior wall sorry posterior wall anterior column posterior wall posterior wall mein ek thoda sa step lag raha hai sab sahi nahi lag raha hai theek hai so and another thing is impacted hai this should go like this it is going straight and then acute angle ban raha hai so iska matlab there is some head impaction also i mean the dome impaction not head okay now you can see some extension into the posterior column actually if you see the posterior column but this object is created by the quadrilateral plate okay of course you can see the protrusion now this intraarticular step can also be seen okay now going for the ct scan this is the involvement of anterior column quadrilateral plate may be some impaction here i am not very sure jaisa ye dikh raha hai waisa wall clearly yahan pe wo margin nahi dikh raha articular so maybe some impaction here going beneath this is the quadrilateral plate going into the posterior column otherwise posterior column wall looks to be intact okay theek hai difficult to classify but this is what you see very frequently in acpht pattern that anterior wall moves up sorry anterior column
तो हटा देना कैसे यस तो योर एंट्री कॉलम फ्रॉम हियर फ्रॉम हियर दिस एंटायर एंट्री कॉलम गेट्स लिफ्टेड अप ऐसे ऊपर उठ जाता है जैसा इसमें आपको दिख रहा है इसमें दिख रहा है ये यहां से ऊपर उठ गया ठीक है इट लिफ्ट्स अप एंड योर क्वाड्रिलेटरल प्लेट फ्रॉम हियर ये भी ऐसे खुल जाता है विच यू कैन सी हियर एंड ये वॉइड में से हेड माइग्रेट करता है इन टू द पेल्विस ओके सो दिस इज वेरी टिपिकली सीन विद द एसीपीएसटी पैटर्न दिस इज नॉट अ क्लासिक एसीपीएसटी बट इट इज वेरी कॉमनली सीन विद एसीपीएसटी पैटर्न एंड व्हाट यू हैव टू डू इज लैटरल ट्रैक्शन हेड को रिड्यूस करना है फिर एंट्रियर कॉलम को नीचे दबाना है क्वारिलेटरल प्लेट को अंदर पुश करना है एक सुपरा पैक्टीनियल प्लेट एक इंफ्रा पैक्टीनियल प्लेट दो प्लेट से उसको दबा देना है समझ गए ओके सो दिस इज वॉट आई वॉज सेंग क्वारिलेटरल प्लेट गोइंग मीडियली एंट्रियर कॉलम लिफ्टिंग एंट्रियरली क्रिएटिंग दिस गैप एंड हेड ट्राइंग टू माइग्रेट फ्रॉम दिस गैप एंड वॉट यू नीट टू डू इज जस्ट क्लोज दिस गैप यहां से लेटरल ट्रैक्शन लगाना इसको नीचे बिठाना हो सकता है तो इधर एक एक प्लेट लगा के इसको प्रेस डाउन कर सकते हैं इसको अंदर पुश करना और यहाँ पे एक जैसे वो मॉडल में है ना इंफ्रापेक्टिनल प्लेट वैसा प्लेट लगा देना दैट इज हाउ यू कैन गेट दिस थिंग रिड्यूस ना 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 दिस प्लेट इज इनसाइड पूरा पेलविस के अंदर है इसके जैसा ये देखो इट इज अटिलेटल प्लेट ओनली नो स्पेशल इम्प्लांट सिंपल रिकन्स्ट्रक्शन प्लेट एंड डोम इंपेक्शन Dome impaction has to be addressed as soon as you reduce it, reduce this too, and you see in the obturator view if you still see dome impaction, so यहाँ से ही आपको इसी void से यहाँ जाके dome को push करना है और यहाँ graft रखना है. Entry column जो खुला हुआ है उसी window से जाके. उसी window से जाके. Dome को नीचे. Dome को नीचे लाना है और graft रखना है. All dome impaction do require grafting. Grafting from sir. Entry super relaxed fine. यह आपने तो सामने ही है सब कुछ. पेल्विस में काम करते ग्राफ्ट की कोई कमी नहीं है ट्रोकेंटर भी है और पोस्टियर में ट्रोकेंटर है एंटीरियर में ये ए आई आई एस इलिया क्रेस्ट है ठीक है ना फाइन नाउ नेक्स्ट केस यस वन मोर परसेंट वॉलेंटियर दिस इज द एरिया वन लाइन अनदर लाइन इंटैक्ट ये 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 सब कुछ इंटैक्ट है The only thing which is not is that hip is dislocated, okay, and your posterior wall you are not able to see clearly. Okay, that's the only thing. So, obturator view. Now you can see and intact. Anterior column, posterior wall, obturator mein. So obturator wall and posterior wall intact. Anterior column intact. Obturator foramen intact. Even this ischium part also intact. So this is the only break. And this is the head dislocated. Okay, now you have identified almost all elements of the fracture. So, do you want to do any further study, or you can just take the patient in for OT? CT करेंगे. ठीक है. CT. This is the CT. What is something that you will be looking for when you have such a large wall fragment? When you have a large wall fragment, one thing you should always look for is a marginal impaction. So, what is marginal impaction? So, when this this is how we are looking at the epidermis, right? This is our wall fragment. This is our wall fragment, big wall fragment. Now, bordering that wall fragment. Bordering that wall fragment, this area, this area, usually gets impacted. Dab dab dab, in the direction of dislocation. Okay, so even when you reduce the hip and you reduce the wall, but this impacted type three proximal tibia fracture impaction. So impaction को देख करना पड़ता है. You cannot leave it like this. So here also you have to look for this impaction and you have to correct this impaction. So this is what, this is that marginal impaction. See, it is. ये कैसे perfect curve है? ये curve नहीं है, ये impact हो गया है. 
इस फ्रेगमेंट को ऐसे उठाना पड़ेगा ये जगह पे यहाँ पे ग्राफ्ट रखना पड़ेगा फिर वॉल को इधर लगा सकते हैं समझ गए या ऑल इम्पैक्शन इंजरीज कार्टिलेज के साथ जितना मैक्सिमम बोन आप ले सकते हो उसके साथ में लेके उसको डिस करो और उसके बाद उसके नीचे ग्राफ्ट रखो ग्राफ्ट इम्पैक्ट करने से वो स्टेबल हो जाता है फिर भी आप चाहते हो तो आप एक या दो छोटे स्मॉल फ्रेगमेंट स्क्रूज ऑल इनसाइड यूज कर सकते हैं टू होल्ड दैट फ्रेगमेंट इन पोजिशन ओके ओके या मार्जिनल इंपैक्शन जो हमने बात की ना एंड समटाइम्स देर में भी आर्टिकल रिटेन फ्रेगमेंट वो तो हम सिटी देखेंगे तो हमको पता चल जाएगा लास्ट केस यस Ilio ischial line is broken. Ilio pectineal line is broken. Obturator ring is also broken. Uh, SI joint widening is also there. Uh, if dislocation is also there, wall not able to comment. Uh, Some mysterious looking fragments here. Yes, yes, it is there. May get entrapped in intra intraarticular, right? Yes, sir. Now in this patient with hip dislocation, without CT scan, would you want to do a reduction? Will not be stable. Okay. Yes. Why? Because if you are able to reduce, and things fall in place, then you know what issues to address, what to leave out. Okay. So once the reduction is done, now see how things are looking. Yes, I don't seem okay. Yes, I have done. Yes, I have done. Yes, I. फ्रैक्चर कहा है ये इसके अलावा कुछ दिखता ही नहीं है कॉन्वेंस भी आ गया ऐसा लगता है राइट लुक एट दर व्यू नाउ तो पोस्टर कॉलम इज ऑलमोस्ट इंटैक्ट एंटीरियर में ये थोड़ा फ्रैक्चर लग रहा है पोस्टर वॉल में ये थोड़ा सा दिख रहा है आपको ये ये दिख रहा है पोस्टर कॉलम कैसे बैठ गया देखो ओके एंट्रीय वॉल भी सही लग रहा है सो नाउ कंजर्वेटिव इसमें देखो ये यहां से देखो मोर देन फोर्टी फाइव डिग्रीज है क्यों नहीं कर सकते yes? जरूरी है सिटी जरूरी है सर्जरी CT is necessary because you want to make sure that there is no entrapped intraarticular fragments, okay? And you want to see whether there is any impaction in the head, impaction in the dome, any incongruity which is seen on the X-ray, but on CT it will be seen better. So now that same patient CT, now you see wall, wall, column, column. Hmm? Make ऐसा करके ये सब एंट्री ये सब पोस्टर ये सब वॉल ये सब और ये सब कॉलम ये सब वॉल पता है ना मेक अ टी अक्रॉस सॉरी तो क्रॉस करेगा तो इधर एंट्री वॉल में भी लफड़ा लग रहा है पोस्टर वॉल में भी लग रहा है कॉलम में भी या नाउ गोइंग फर्दर सी सो द एंट्री पोर्शन हैज मूव्ड इन मीडियली द एंट्री कॉलम हैज माइग्रेटेड मीडियली ओके पोस्टर कॉलम स्लाइटली मीडियली ये वॉल अपनी जगह पे टिका हुआ है and there you see the intraarticular fragment can you see yes. right now with this intraarticular fragment here we are always going to be worried to leave it just like that so then we have to go in and stabilize it okay so now how will you stabilize it so whenever you have a fracture which is involving both the columns and your ring is broken obturator ring is broken then posterior column and anterior column are independent of each other and they both will have to be reduced and fixed independent of each other it's a t fracture nahi samajh mein aaya it's a t fracture see if there is it's a t type of fracture if it is a transverse fracture it involves both the columns but reducing one column and on that you can reduce the other column because ultimately they are both connected niche to wo obturator ring intact hai to niche to ischium ischio pubic ramus or pubis connected hai तो एक को आपने रिड्यूस किया और रोटेशन करेक्ट कर दिया तो दूसरा ऑटोमेटिक रिड्यूस हो गया बट जब वो टूटा है तो एक को करेक्ट करने से दूसरा करेक्ट नहीं होगा 
सो इन दैट केस यू हैव टू गो एंटीरियर यू हैव टू गो पोस्टीरियर एंड इंडिविजुअली स्टेबिलाईज करना है और सबसे ज्यादा क्या ध्यान रखना है वेन यू आर गोइंग फ्रॉम द फ्रंट एंड फिक्सिंग नन ऑफ योर शूज टू गो इन टू द पोस्टर कॉलम नहीं तो पोस्टर कॉलम रिड्यूस नहीं हो पाएगा If you are going from back and fixing, none of your screws should go into the anterior column. वो लंबे लंबे स्क्रू डालने की कोशिश मत करो समझ गए पोस्टियर कॉलम स्टेबिलाईज कर रहे हो पोस्टियर पोस्टियर ही रहो एंटीरियर पे जब आते हो एंटीरियर एंटीरियर रहो तो आपका दोनों इंडिपेंडेंट ऑफ इच अदर रिड्यूस हो जाएगा समझ गए ना गॉट इट गॉट इट सर फाइन सो दैट इज एंड ऑफ इट थैंक यू केस नंबर ओनली फोर अच्छा सो ऑल यू ऑफ यू कैन कम फ्रंट कम टू द फ्रंट उज्ज्वल सर we have dr ujwal so i am a shoulder surgeon <laughs> yeah not to call you sir also wait this to wait till there uh so this is a case ten uh delegates can someone explain please uh, the x rays so uh i think like shah sir and all have discussed everything with all the lines you should go according to the protocol and that makes a life very easy <coughs> okay okay posterior wall is there tear drop is okay ब्लैडर इंजुरी no 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 they are looking for a bladder injury okay so they may be having the some abdominal injury or contrast so they have done a contrast so what is the diagnosis posterior wall fracture okay so posterior wall so there is no column involvement here no. only the wall are involved so it's a posterior wall fracture so what is your next step for here or what do you look for here other views what other views would you like obturator to do obturator and iliac yeah so obturator and the iliac view so posterior wall what views would you like to have obturator. exact obturator view. obturator view. okay so uh this x ray is slightly bit tricky there is some thing is going on here also can you see the, how is the head Do you see any head fragment or the heads are okay? Yes, sir. Correct. So there is a fracture of head. Okay. So you need a slightly bit experienced uh, eye also, but just look for ki uh, you, the sphericity of the head is okay or not. Okay. So usually there are chances whenever there is a posterior hip dislocation of wall, uh, hip dislocation there may be a head fracture, a Pipkin type of fractures. Okay. So. this is the one fragment what you can see and this is the wall fracture let's go to the next slide please yeah so we are going to this one so can someone explain this again the x ray So 
this could be a head fragment okay so i think what will be your management here what would you like to do yes sir this is not a obturator view this is not a obturator view this is another just a ap view this is a better ap view yes so you would like to go for a ct scan so the consensus is here sir that like we before reduction we should do the casualty as a patient from two weeks ago you tell that you are ready you wait for one day it's gone okay you are saying now it is normal age we are saying it is a pehle ka casual to nahi aap back from chest mein drag kar wo bodhi ka see pehle kya hota hai pehle kitni hi tissue apne mein kya hota hai there's a wall pehle to crying wall that wall and then coming back so what is that aur sir aaj se bolo to aap seedha flexion mein traction to ye ready hai aur sir aaj se bolo तो अच्छा है ना फिर ऑपरेट करने के लिए इंडिकेशन मिल गया ना अपने को ओके तो सी वंस यू रिड्यूस इट 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 एंड देन रीडिसलोकेट्स मींस यू हैव लेबल्ड एज अनस्टेबल हिप लोकेशन देन योर सीटी स्कैन इज जस्ट गिविंग एन आईडिया हाउ यू आर गोइंग टू ऑपरेट वेदर यू ऑपरेट और नॉट ऑपरेट क्वेश्चन खत्म हो गया सो यू फर्स्ट रिड्यूस द डिसलोकेटेड हिप एंड देन गेट अ सीटी स्कैन दैट्स अ कंसेंसस if you find that after reducing the hip if it is again dislocating it's a unstable then you go for a ct scan okay so for this case they have done a reduction okay so they have done a complete reduction can somebody then again explain this x ray just read it again according to the protocol yes intact okay yes how is the dome compared to the other side you sir yes sir no fracture okay okay and what about the si joints iliac wing si joints See, this is a post reduction post, post reduction x ray so you have to just talk about the hip what, what is it is congruent or not congruent non congruent medial side there is no frag that fragment is broken Sorry. yeah yeah otherwise congruency kyun nahi hai you look at the dome and the head it's perfectly congruent look at the obturator and iliac view sir next view dikhai yes sir please ab bataiye congruency hai ki nahi hai so your obturator view and the iliac view so basically what sir wants to say that if the dome is completely symmetrical your okay so the dome yeah so uh, basically the superior part the dome part is a weight bearing part okay so this is completely symmetrical okay in both views obturator and iliac view okay so what next would you like to do now ct scan okay sorry this is ap view i think <coughs> so this is the uh, video of a ct scan so columns looks okay some wall fractures and you can see the head fragment so uh this is the next view of a ct okay here you can see what to do so again uh what do you think about the columns they are intact yeah what about this a uh? yeah that's a posterior wall okay these are the posterior wall fragments but what do you see here sir yeah so it's a intraarticular 
fragments of the fractures. Okay. So now what will you like to do? What should be your next management? So you want to do posterior approach and trochanteric. What would you like to fix with the posterior approach and trochanteric osteotomy? Safe surgical dislocation. Okay. Okay. So it will be attached to the ligamentum teres, okay. Uh, if we are, if we are, so you won't dis devascularize the fragment, obviously. So it is better to classify the Pipkin's head fractures. Is it type one, type two, three or four? Okay. So how will you differentiate? How will you classify this? Is it infrafoveal or suprafoveal? So it's in the antero inferior part. So it's infrafoveal. Obviously. So it's not affecting the weight bearing area. Understood? So you, if it is not affecting the weight bearing area, will you fix it or not? Better to fix. Otherwise remove it. Sir? Location means capsule is stone, labrum is stone, something is stone. Na? Hip dislocation with posterior wall which remains unstable is unstable. an for surgery. <coughs> Hip dislocation with posterior wall when reduced remains congruent and does not dislocate on stress, which I explained to you. Flexion, adduction, and push does not require fixation. Under, under anesthesia, when you do the dislocation reduction, that is the time you check it. And if it is stable, then there is no need for fixing this posterior column, I mean posterior wall. And then you are left with this antero inferior head fragment, which again doesn't seem to be affecting your hip biomechanics, not in the weight bearing area. It can again be left alone. If at all you want to fix it, you have to go from the front, you cannot do it from behind. This fragment can be fixed with the help of Herbert screws or counter screws from from the head fragment into the intact. Wall ko to bhuli jao. Ye wall to fix So wall is very small since the hip is stable. Since the hip is stable, wall is small. We are neglecting that. That's what we want to convey that every wall fracture doesn't need surgery. Mm. If the hip is stable after dislocation is reduced and hip is stable by doing the stress test, you don't need to operate such kind of patients. If it, if it is unstable, unstable you then you have to operate. And how do you check from posterior side. From posterior aspect. With the excise, head. Excise this fragment. Excise it. Excise it. That small fragment, small fragment inferior one. Head. 
from you go it. from behind, dislocate the hip, get that fragment out, or just distract the hip. You may not even need to dislocate. अरे unstable है तो fix करने के लिए तो जा रहे हैं आप अंदर. Wall को bye bye hi hello करने थोड़ी जा रहे हैं. Wall को कैसे fix करेंगे? ये wall को fix करने के लिए आपको spring plate use करना पड़ेगा और उसके साथ साथ labrum आपका काफी major tear होगा. Labrum को reattach करने के लिए आपको anchor use करना पड़ेगा. Posterior wall को कौन से approach से fix करोगे? आप बताओ. Head. आपको दो approach करना है. आपका प्राइमरी प्रॉब्लम कंसर्न क्या है पोस्टर वॉल है कि हेड है तो वो पोस्टर वॉल वाला अप्रोच लो उसमें हेड मैनेज होता है तो करो नहीं तो छोड़ दो गिप्सन से आप क्या मतलब गिप्सन या पोस्टर वो सेम है ना आप कॉकर लेम्बर बैक करो या गिप्सन करो अल्टीमेटली तो आप पोस्टर वॉल फिक्स करने के लिए कर रहे हो गिप्सन में कैसे आप हेड डिसलोकेट करोगे सब में डिसलोकेट तो एंटीरियरली ही होता है पोस्टरियरली डिसलोकेट होता ही नहीं है सेफ सर्जिकल डिसलोकेशन इज डन इन फिगर ऑफ फोर हाँ नो यू बॉथर अबाउट द फ्रैगमेंट ओनली इफ द फ्रैगमेंट इज फ्लिप्ड फ्रैगमेंट इज Creating a intra-articular incongruency. See, अगर ये fragment head मतलब dome वाले area में जाके फंसा है, तो वो incongruency create करेगा आपको CT scan में दिखेगा कि head और वो जो उसका dome है वो congruent नहीं है। तो अगर fragment bother कर रहा है, तो fragment को by and large exercise कर लो। इस fragment को refix करने का कोई मतलब नहीं। इसको आप fix करने के लिए जैसे आप dislocate करोगे, ये fragment बाहर नहीं आएगा, इसको काट के अलग करके निकालना पड़ेगा, और ये vascular fragment को अंदर fix करके कुछ gain नहीं करना है। only if it is a type two तो हम लोग उसको fix करेंगे। Type two होता तो हम लोग इसको fix करते हम लोग anterior से जाके fix करते और wall को उसके बाद assess करते और अगर wall की जरूरत पड़ती तो wall को posterior से जाके fix करते। Anterior capsule तो काफी posterior capsule दोनों damage हुआ सही बात है लेकिन anterior arthrotomy आप जब कर रहे हो for fixing that fragment आप उसको linear split कर रहे हो। बराबर है। See, safe surgical dislocation is a very fancy and fantastic thing, but you have to understand that with safe surgical dislocation, this head fragment will not go come out. Only whatever is intact will come out. So this head fragment has to be devascularized to bring it out. Yes. Yes. That is what I said. Yes. That is what I said. Uh, 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 the patient has to be patient has to be explained that because you got a hip dislocation we don't know how much your vascularity has been damaged okay we are reducing it we are not going to fix it because there is no immediate threat to your hip biomechanics but this may lead to avian this may lead to arthritis you may require a hip uh, replacement but at that time we will be going from a virgin zone no hardware inside no infection no complication related to our previous surgery you do any investigation if you are going to change your treatment plan according to investigation suppose you do mri and showing a vascular head are you going to do immediately thr no, you do it when it is symptomatic. So there is no point. Conservative management is simple. You have to keep abduction and give a fixed traction. There is no pain traction. After two weeks, you have to say that you have to mobilize in bed. If it is dislocated, it means that it is unstable. So we will fix it. If it is not dislocated from stress, then it will be dislocated from stress. Right? That's true. So, uh, this is the anterior inferior.
going for the next case case 11 So, please read the x-ray. Uh, Iliacial line appears to be broken. Uh, okay. Can you just show me, sir? This is your... Yeah. Get the pointer. The first one. First, first button. Yes. No, no. Ye, ye wala button. Yes. This. Ye hai. First. So. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, laterally, okay. Teardrop? So is it an AP X ray? This is not this is an inlet view. Okay. No, so just go back. Just please go back. Can you see anything more? So here you, according to you, iliopectineal line is broken and ilioischial line is broken. Okay? So both lines are broken. Okay. So ilioischial is okay. And iliopectineal is broken. So this is more of a internal view. Sorry. I think it's maintained. Can you see here one shadow? Large yes. So there is one more large fragment out here. Okay. Yes, very good. So this could be a quadrilateral plate. So if iliopectineal line is broken, which column? Anterior column. Okay. Coming to the next x ray, can you tell me again? So this is. Okay. What about the ileoischial? Okay. Posterior wall intact. Posterior wall is intact. Good. Where is X? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a fracture line. Okay. So can you see this is going almost into the greater sciatic notch? Huh? So these fractures when are reduced. There is one big artery out here, superior glue. Yeah, yeah. You have to be very careful because it bleeds a lot. Okay. So th what view is this? It's obturator view, but it's partly obturator. Okay. Now, iliac view. Can you explain more about this? Iliac view Okay. Okay. And what about this? So this head is gone inside. Okay. And then some lateral part is impacted. Okay. And what is this fragment? So yes. So this is a part of a quadrilateral plate. So what next would you like to do? CT scan. Okay. So this is a CT scan. Can you tell me? So, so which is this quadrilateral plate? Yes. So this quadrilateral plate is different from the posterior column. Okay. This is also the part of the quadrilateral plate. What about this? This is again the quadrilateral plate part. Okay. And what about this? 
this is which column yes this is the anterior column so this is a basically a anterior column fracture there is a quadrilateral fracture what about the posterior column is there any fracture in posterior column okay so there is no fracture in posterior column usually this cortical this <coughs> this cortical density can be seen here also we are not very sure because we don't have much of the other films okay going next so again what is there both column fractures okay and with sorry just a second so this is a rare injury so there is a anterior column fracture right this is a quadrilateral plate fracture which is completely broken away from the posterior column okay there is some fracture in the posterior column but not too much as compared to the yeah even here also okay what next classification anterior there is a anterior column posterior column also so is it a both column okay so it's a transverse why transverse both columns okay yes so you think it's a transverse fracture okay what about the quadrilateral plate which is goes this one so okay just 2 minutes ये है ये भी है ठीक है बट इट्स नॉट टू सिग्निफिकेंट इट्स देयर ओके सो इट्स बेटर टू रीड फॉर अ थ्री डी टू डी सी टी बट यू गेट सम आइडिया फ्रॉम द थ्री डी सी टी ऑल्सो ओके सो क्लासिफिकेशन दिस इज अ थ्री डी सी टी ओके सो वॉट यू सी हियर दिस इज एंटर कॉलम फ्रैक्चर this is your anterior column fracture so anterior column is fixed right and there is a quadrilateral plate okay so that is a part of a posterior okay so what about now so this is a part of a quadrilateral so what exactly happened the head has pushed inside it has broken the quadrilateral plate from the posterior column as well as it has bounced back and it has created a anterior column fracture which is displaced okay so there is anterior column fracture as well as quadrilateral fra fracture so and what about this right now you can see here anterior column fracture again and there is nothing in a posterior column okay so classification is lower anterior column fracture with associated quadrilateral surface fragment and posterior superior articular impaction the impaction what we saw on the x rays that was the impaction so whenever there is a marginal impaction uh, usually these hips are very prone for arthritis you need to reduce this marginal impaction wherever you see the marginal impaction you just have to uh, make sure that it sits on the femoral head and have to put the bone graft behind it is much more difficult game than what i said but for making hip stable you have to do that thing okay so this is one of a rare classification what they have told or anterior column posterior yes sir yeah yes sir so this is what i'll show you the ct scan so what will you do here this head has caused the impaction okay so you have to remove the head from that impaction part so you will give the distraction to the hip right you have to fix the anterior column okay so now you already have a impaction over this area only right so, so this, this is a posterior superior margin only if you are going through this one so this is anterior column but this part is a posterior superior column so you go through the fracture site only just like a tibia fracture okay okay 
Non, non, il se fait, il se fait. Non, non, it's done. We are done, okay. We can discuss then on lunch. So basically, like, why do you have to create another uh, window? Haan. तो जिस तरीके से टीबिया में आप क्या करते हैं जब अगर टीबिया का फ्रैक्चर इंपैक्टेड है तो आप क्या करेंगे फ्रैक्चर साइट से जाके उठाएंगे उसको सो सेम थिंग यू डू हियर ऑल दो इट इज लाइक मच डिफिकल्ट देन वॉट एवर द सेट सो यू डू द ए आई पी ए आई पी अप्रोच द क्वारिलेटरल प्लेट इज स्लाइटली विट आउट साइड वॉट एवर द इम्पेक्शन इज देयर यू यूज अ स्मॉल यू कैन यूज द लैबिना ड्यूरा जस्ट मेक द इम्पेक्शन आउट साइड ओके एंड सी दैट इट इज लाइक अट ऑन इट इज सिटिंग ऑन द फ्यूमोरल हेड You apply the plate infrapectin. Yeah, yeah. you put the infrapectin in the buttress plate so that it pushes the quadrilateral plate to its place. Okay. Yeah, inside infrapectinial. Anterior approach. Stopaz approach. Stopaz approach. AIP is a stopaz approach. Yes, you can reach up to the SI joint. Which one? See, so basically, so this is your quadrilateral plate part. Through the fracture, you just. So through the fractures, go just use the infection, put a plate. Ah, why am I getting on this? Stand on this side. Stand on this side. Stand on this side. Stand on this side. Or slider everything get retracted there. From this side, you can see. So unique plate and how how difficult it is. How difficult it is to organize plate.
Understanding of the fixation fractures. So um, all of these lectures are accessible. The videos you can find on the orthoacademy.com uh, website and a lot of my um, drawings and um, other content can be seen on the Ortho Academy website. So do not fear if you miss some of these uh, slides. Uh, they are all somewhere online. So I want to start by uh, discussing <coughs> this uh, classic fracture um, that um, I uh, encountered a few weeks ago at Denver Health uh, and managed. Uh, but this is a great exercise for you guys interested in pelvic and acetabular fractures to, uh, to be able to classify, to be able to know the personality of the fracture, to be able to identify some subtleties, and then finally decide uh, which approach uh, you will undertake. The, the three first points are crucial even before knowing the surgical approaches. So if in your mind you could say, well, uh, the iliopectineal and the ilioischial uh, lines are disrupted, so it could be a transverse fracture, it could be an anterior column posterior hemitransverse, it could be an associated both column, or it could be a T-type. It is not an associated both column because my iliac wing is intact. The obturator foramen is disrupted. This makes it a T-type acetabular fracture, classified on an AP radiograph. The personality of this fracture, as you will see in the, in the next few slides, is that it is from the transverse families because it is a T-type, and T-types have a stem that is the transverse component that then goes down to making it a T, but the fracture is characterized by where this transverse fracture line is located. In this case, you can see that the fracture line is really, really high, right? If you guys know about the roof arc angle, which defines how medial the fracture line extends from a vertical line, this one would virtually be zero degrees. It's, it's like in line with a sore seal, which makes it a transtectal T-type fracture. Uh, those are bad because they're hard to get to and because they breach the most important weight-bearing part of the acetabulum. Some other subtleties, you could see that there's posterior wall comminution at the back, so it is a T-type posterior wall fracture. You could see that there is a, some contrast in the bladder that is suspicious for bleeding. And you could also see that the femoral head is potentially likely injured, uh, some cartilage delamination from that subluxation or medial dislocation. So a lot of things can be seen on an x-ray. And on the course that you're attending today, I hope that you can be really critical uh, when observing uh, an AP radiograph of a pelvis. So. What we're going to do today, the sequence of learning, I want you to focus on getting x-rays and what they're used for and when they're not adequate. So you have an inlet view. When is it a good inlet? When is it not a good inlet? You need to be able to do that. The second uh, learning is about the fracture and being able to understand these fractures on three dimension. And finally, Correlate the above with which approach you want to do, particularly 
and some reduction vectors, although that comes much later um, in the learning. To do this, I really recommend, um, uh, you guys may have seen or not, but I really the do model build recommend is the simplest of supplies, um, including a Sabon's model, a one centimeter thick uh, yoga mat, thirty-five by created. twenty-six by one centimeter sheet uh, of plywood, again the fixation materials. Website, First, the model is ideally centered and, and brought towards the edge of the plywood of sheet, on this which enables with, enough um, space for proper John ergonomics Hopkins and hand placement University. to obtain proper quarter placement uh, for all screw approaches. Very approaches. Simple model Pilot holes are then drilled in the wood and midline of the posterior sacrum, and ultimately these are then bound together by a simple wood screw. To provide additional Additional stabilization, fixation is also applied to the bilateral PSISs, which remains outside the corridors of any percutaneous approaches. After adequate fixation is achieved, the model is wrapped in a one centimeter thick yoga mat, a size which was specifically chosen to provide a tactile feedback and texture as similar to the layers of skin as possible. While wrapping the model in the yoga mat, the mat is attached to the model using staples. However, if needed, splint tape could also be used as a suitable alternative. After trimming the mat as needed, to provide so the most realistic skin tension, the mat is pulled tight angles, and further fixated with staples. And more importantly, After also pulling the sides in tight this, bilaterally, it will allow staples are again applied to completely enclose the model, the corridors, which is now ready for you can use. Take an hour every day after your clinic to go and practice and be the best at what you do. It is really a pretty amazing and cheap way of doing it, not needing to go in a cadaveric lab, which is very expensive. So. I really recommend you guys doing that. The model build. Um, you can find, again, on the Ortho Academy, a ton of material. There are, it is difficult to find in textbooks how to get the appropriate x-rays. How do you actually move the machine and what those x-rays are used for. And I tried with these drawings to summarize for you guys uh, what each x-ray is utilized for. So, for example, the iliac oblique view what are the screws trajectory you're seeing, what is the view most commonly used for, some tips and tricks on angles of view and how do you obtain them uh, in the operating room. So really useful, I recommend you download them, they're free, all of this is free on the website. You go on the website, you download them and you read them and you use them and practice. Uh, so now I'm going to do a little shift in your brains and um, you're going to have to be attentive because this is complicated. We are accustomed to seeing all of these x-rays. We were brought up in our orthopedic education seeing all of these x-rays through a exopelvic lens. This is an associated both column fracture and we're used to seeing it from we're used to seeing posterior wall, posterior columns, and transverse and posterior walls in that view. T-types look like this, so was associated column posterior hemitransverse. A question that I often get is, well, what is the difference between the T-type and the anterior column posterior hemitransverse? What if the anterior column limb of a T-type 
went more proximal. That would look exactly the same as the anterior column posterior hem hemitransverse, wouldn't it? And the answer is absolutely not. It does not, it is not the same fracture. And the reason is the main fracture line in a T-type is a transverse fracture line. While the main fracture line in an ACPHT fracture is the anterior column fracture line. And you will see from my few slides later in the talk that the planes of these fracture lines are very different. So it is not a matter of exopelvic appearance of those lines because they really look the same, but it's more a matter of the plane of the main fracture line. And this has critical importance in your reduction maneuvers and your fixation strategies. They are very, very different fractures. The fact that we are accustomed to this uh, exopelvis view, but I want you to familiarize yourself with the endopelvic view of the fracture. And those are very different. Um, you could see how a T-type totally changes perspective when you're doing an an uh, anterior intrapelvic approach, uh, so-called modified stopper. The fracture lines are different, and you need to, to be able to understand that your, your visual is changed. In green dots is the constant fragment. That is the fragment you're going to build everything to, and therefore, knowledge of where it is located in space, intrapelvis, will allow you to accomplish this task. We have been taught for the last decades that transverse fractures were A to P on a two-dimensional CT scan, and column fractures were, were medial to lateral on an axial cut. Well, how, how is that possible? If you look at that picture on the left and just focus on the transverse component, how is it that this transverse component would be A to P when it is actually breaching the acetabulum from medial to lateral. Why do we see a line that is A to P? And I really struggled understanding this concept until a few years ago where we actually created some fractures on a sawbone to better visualize why this was the case. And the reason why this is the case is the fracture is actually not medial to lateral. It's cephalocaudal. So as it starts going from lateral to medial, it then cuts 90 degrees and separates the acetabulum into a medial part, which is the anterior, the distal part of the acetabulum that is medialized, and a proximal lateralized part that is the constant fragment. So you have a cephalocaudal fracture with medial displacement of that distal segment and the constant fragment that contains a large part of the weight-bearing portion of the acetabulum. And this is very important um, aspects in terms of vector of reduction and implant placement. But that is why transverse fractures are A to P on an axial. On the contrary, you have an anterior column fracture, and you could see it right there, that is actually medial to lateral on an axial CT scan, but it, because it is a fracture that separates the anterior column and breaks it, pushing it laterally. And you can see that here, that this is not a medial and lateral part, it's an anterior part and a posterior part. The posterior part contains the constant fragment, the anterior part contains the constant fragment. So very different injuries and very different reduction maneuver. So you can see them here. You could see on the left it is a transverse fracture, line A to P, medialized, uh, medialized fracture. It needs to be pushed 
lateral and the fixation most of the time requires an infrapectineal fixation, right? You want to push that medialization back to where it needs to go. On the contrary, on the right side, you have a column fracture. The reduction maneuver is a Farabuff or equivalent on the wing component, and you want to internally rotate and compress from anterior to posterior with ideally some suprapectineal plating system. As we discussed earlier, transverse fractures can be transtectal, juxtatectal, infratectal, based on where they're located. Look at fracture line one, two, and three. One is transtectal. These are the worst because their location, they're located right on the roof of the acetabulum, so a lot of load. They don't tolerate any step-off, higher risk of post-traumatic arthritis, and very hard to get to through an AIP. Ideally, these fractures can be managed through the middle window of the ilioinguinal, for those of you that do that. But from an AIP, it is a little more challenging, and that's when I will add an ASIS osteotomy to the modify Doppler approach. They're hard because they're right under the psoas muscle, in the psoas gutter, and hard to place clamp uh, into. This is a table, you can take a picture so you can look at it uh, when you have a few minutes, but it's a picture that, it's a table that correlates the type of fracture, transverse versus anterior column, and how different they are in their degree of displacement, and therefore vectors of reduction and fixation strategies. So another common um, issue is identifying the differences between anterior column, posterior hemitransverse, and associated both column. They look exactly the same. If you look at the endopelvic view, they're exactly the same injury. The biggest difference is the ACPHT contains a piece of joint, a piece of cartilage attached to the constant fragment. And that makes it a fairly unforgiving injury because the reduction has to be perfect. But if you see it on the endopelvis approach, um, you could, as you're turning this model, when you're doing a modified stopper, this piece here above the, the greater sciatic notch contains a part of cartilage of the acetabulum. Very important to remember that. On the contrary, the associated both column the constant fragment does not contain any piece of articular cartilage. And that makes it a little more forgiving, particularly in relation to secondary congruence, where the two columns are totally separated from one another, and they can achieve a mold around the femoral head, particularly in elderly patients. So a little more forgiving. Um, Moving on to understanding the anatomy, before you go into uh, complex surgical approaches, um, it is critical to understand the three-dimensional representation of the anatomy. This is a model that was built by one of my international fellows uh, this year, Guillaume uh, David from France, who um, really, really took um, a However, your, your superior screws in the plate may go across, go across the fracture. And this could be a problem if your anterior column is not perfectly reduced. So um, you could see this here on this model. Look at how likely it is that these screws at the top of the plate breach that red transverse line. There is a perfect axis. As opposed to an anterior plate that is unlikely virtually unlikely to have screws, neither proximal nor distal, that would prevent a reduction of the posterior column. So I like to start from the front first for that specific reason.
Um, this uh, slide just highlights what we discussed earlier, is that on the left, you have an associated both column. On the right, an anterior column, posterior hemitransverse. They look exactly the same. The difference is the size of the constant fragment piece that is much smaller in an associated uh, both column fracture because it does not contain any cartilage. Remember that. So moving on to sequence of events and we're getting towards uh, the end and I will show you a couple of cases, but uh, my sequence of events is always posterior to anterior. If you have an associated pelvic ring injury and a, an acetabulum, you start at the posterior ring, you build that constant fragment, you stabilize it, then you fix your acetabulum, and then you fix the anterior ring. It's like building a wall, you wanna start from a fixed point. And I do the same for an acetabular fracture that is isolated. In fact, we mapped all of our acetabular fractures, over 250 acetabular fractures from the last six or seven years. And the mapping, uh, and we're in the process of publishing this, focusing on this constant fragment, the mapping all, most of the time, 99% of the time, leaves an intact, totally accessible piece of that green zone that's called the constant fragment for you to work with. And this is my go-to when I start an AIP approach, is I, I go straight away to that posterior ring, um, about a centimeter anterior to the SI joint, infrapectineal so that I can start building my wall moving posterior to anterior. The implants we have, those quadrilateral plate, are not adequately built because they're not built based on this constant fragment. And therefore, I would advise all of you to start using, uh, you know, a, a small a recon three, four hole plate or um, a third tubular plate in that constant fragment area as the first maneuver of reduction to tackle that posterior column. You see the quality of the bone in that area is good, and this is the hinge upon you're going to rebuild your entire acetabulum. It is the cornerstone, as you can see here in those two fractures on the left and on the right. If you key in perfectly this triangle with more fragment-specific implant, your reductions will be much improved. So going back to our case and to finish off, I just wanted to show you two cases. Um, this is a bad T-type with your wall fracture. Um, there's a lot of bladder deviation. You could see uh, there's um, a very big corona mortis in this case, uh, but more importantly, a lot of comminution. Um, and despite the presence of posterior wall, I decided to go anteriorly first to get an anatomical reduction of my anterior column before moving uh, posteriorly here. You could see the three-dimensional CT scan demonstrating incarcerated piece inside the joint that we were able to extract from the AIP approach. Not an easy AIP because you're very um, transtectal and difficult to clamp in this, in this case, and a fairly distal posterior column fracture, which makes it just a little more challenging for us. Um, I will, uh, I have a clinical picture here showing you the corona mortis. In this case, the corona mortis was bifurcating around the obturator nerve. So always, uh, if you can, have a good visualization of the corona mortis. And before you clamp it, uh, make sure the obturator nerve is safe in there. 
The lateral traction will help you greatly uh, achieve 90% of your reduction. And then you can follow that with, um, for, for those transtectal, I, I find it very difficult to find the appropriate vector. So I like to use a screw-based clamp, see the Youngbluth of Farabuff, uh, putting you know an infrapectineal plate in this case that is not completely screwed down to the bone. You could see it on the left here and using screw-based clamp to slowly reduce that fracture. Uh, you want to make sure you don't over compress the intrapelvic fracture line because this will gap open uh, the uh, intraarticular portion of the transverse fracture. Remember, it's three dimensional. If you squeeze on the intrapelvic side, you may distract uh, the intraarticular part of that fracture. Uh, because it remains an indirect reduction uh, and you don't see the joint. So be very critical uh, with your um, x-rays. Simple, simple fixation here because this patient may likely need a total hip replacement for the, the, the features of posterior wall comminution uh, and femoral head damage. So I'm doing, I'm, I'm aiming for anatomical reduction, but also I don't want too much hair in the way. And then we flipped him and did a coker and addressed the push wall and achieved a, a very satisfying uh, reduction, I think, as you can see on these x-rays. I will conclude with the high acetabular wall fractures. You see how this is really a proximally based fracture. This is a fracture from a couple of weeks ago too, uh, but it, it really looks on the left like this is a transverse fracture, right? If you just show me that CT scan, I would think that this was a transverse posterior wall, but that fracture doesn't exit through the anterior column. As you could see in the bottom scan, the um, coronal view, it is a very large posterior wall piece that is so large that it um, affects the right, the dome of the acetabulum uh, right in that, um, in that um, most weight bearing uh, part of the acetabulum. So the thinking here is you could try a Coker Langenbeck. Uh, again, these slides are available, so uh, don't panic if it goes too fast, but the problem with the Coker Langenbeck is you, you won't be able to access the superior part of the acetabulum um, without doing a trochanteric osteotomy. So I think you have a few options here. You do a Coker Langenbeck with a trochanteric osteotomy, or you do a modified Gibson. And I find that most of the time you do not need a trochanteric osteotomy with the modified Gibson. The, the difference between the two is that uh, the modified Gibson, the only downside is that it is a little harder to go distal on the posterior column with the modified Gibson. So just something to keep in mind, if you have a very high wall with some distal wall comminution, you're perhaps better off doing a Coca Langenbeck with a, a trochosteotomy. If it's just a, a fairly classic posterior wall with high extension, you're better off with a Gibson. Um, so this is what the Gibson looks like. You got your short external rotators, um, and uh, just like a coker, you would excise them. You would um, um, put your your retractors in the greater and lesser sidic notch. You'd put a clamp under gluteus uh, medius, labeled number one here, and that would uh, show you the extension of that a large posterior wall piece which we did in this case. I like to place chance pins. They serve as great, powerful uh, soft tissue retraction, uh, particularly to retract gluteus uh, medius uh, and the skin uh, and show you uh, your uh, posterior wall extension. And this is the fixation using a, a ton of uh, spring plates uh, with longer screws. And this is our reduction. Uh, this uh, lecture was 32 minutes. I apologize if I went a little over my allocated time. I hope it was um, useful for you guys. Uh, please don't hes hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Um, and uh, good luck on the rest of the course. Uh, thank you guys for listening.
Good, uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Cyril Moffrey, and I'm the chairman of the Department of Orthopedics uh, at Denver Health Medical Center. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation, um, Dr. Kekatpure, um, and uh, hello to all delegates and candidates uh, of the Pelvic and Acetabular Surgery Symposium and Hands-On Cadaveric Workshop. It is a great honor for me to be here with you. Um, so, uh, Dr. Kekat Pure uh, asked me to uh, discuss uh, for a few minutes uh, something around pelvic and acetabular fractures that I thought may be really valuable for the audience. So, I thought that I would keep things very simple because this is a lecture um, that I've given uh, several times, uh, realizing uh, that the simple concepts are often misunderstood and it is critical to understand these simple concepts uh, for progression uh, towards a better understanding of the fixation uh, of acetabular fractures. So um, all of these lectures are accessible. The videos you can find on the orthoacademy.com uh, website and a lot of my um, drawings and um, other content can be seen on the Ortho Academy website. So do not fear if you miss some of these uh, slides, uh, they are all somewhere online. So I want to start by uh, discussing <clears throat> this uh, classic fracture um, that um, I uh, encountered a few weeks ago at Denver Health uh, and managed. Uh, but this is a great exercise for you guys interested in pelvic and acetabular fractures to, uh, to be able to classify, to be able to know the personality of the fracture, to be able to identify some subtleties, and then finally decide uh, which approach uh, you will undertake. The, the three first points are crucial even before knowing the surgical approaches. So if in your mind you could say, well, uh, the iliopectineal and the ilioischial uh, lines are disrupted, so it could be a transverse fracture, it could be an anterior column posterior hemitransverse, it could be an associated both column, or it could be a T-type. It is not an associated both column because my iliac wing is intact. The obturator foramen is disrupted. This makes it a T-type acetabular fracture, classified on an AP radiograph. The personality of this fracture, as you will see in the, in the next few slides, is that it is from the transverse families because it is a T-type, and T-types have a stem that is the transverse component that then goes down to making it a T, but the fracture is characterized by where this transverse fracture line is located. In this case, you can see that the fracture line is really, really high, right? If you guys know about the roof arc angle, which defines how medial the fracture line extends from a vertical line, this one would virtually be zero degrees. It's, it's like in line with a sore seal, which makes it a transtectal T-type fracture. Uh, those are bad because they're hard to get to and because they breach the most important weight-bearing part of the acetabulum. Some other subtleties, you could see that there's posterior wall comminution at the back, so it is a T-type posterior wall fracture. You could see that there is a, some contrast in the bladder that is suspicious for bleeding. And you could also see that the femoral head is potentially likely injured, uh, some cartilage delamination from that subluxation or medial dislocation. So a lot of things can be seen on an x-ray and on the course that you're attending today, I hope that you can be really critical uh, when observing uh, an AP radiograph of a pelvis. So what we're going to do today, the sequence of learning, I want you to focus on getting x-rays and what they're used for 
and when they're not adequate so you have an inlet view when is it a good inlet when is it not a good inlet you need to be able to do that the second uh, learning is about the fracture and being able to understand these fractures on three dimension and finally Correlate the above with which approach you want to do, particularly, and some reduction vectors, although that comes much later um, in the learning. To do this, I really recommend, um, uh, you guys may have seen or not, but I really the do model build recommend is the simplest of supplies, um, including a Sawbones model, a one this, centimeter thick uh, yoga mat, a 35 by 26 created, by one centimeter sheet uh, of plywood, again the fixation materials. Website, First, the model is ideally centered and, and brought towards the edge of the plywood of sheet, which enables with, enough um, space for proper John ergonomics Hopkins and hand placement University. to obtain proper cordial uh, placement for all screw approaches. Pilot holes are then drilled in the wood and midline of the posterior sacrum, and ultimately these are then bound together by a simple wood screw. To provide additional stabilization, fixation is also applied to the bilateral PSISs, which remains outside the corridors of any percutaneous approaches. After adequate fixation is achieved, the model is wrapped in a one centimeter thick now, yoga mat, a size which was specifically sure chosen that, uh, to provide a tactile feedback and texture as similar to the layers of skin as possible. Your hands so you can While wrapping the model in the yoga mat, work, but the mat is attached to the model, model using staples. To However, if needed, splint tape could also be used as a suitable alternative. After trimming the mat as needed, to provide so the most realistic skin tension, the, the mat is pulled right tight angles, and further fixated with staples. And more importantly, After also pulling the sides in tight this, bilaterally, it will allow staples are again applied to completely enclose the model, the corridors, which is now ready for you can use. Take an hour every day after your clinic to go and practice and be the best at what you do. It is really a pretty amazing and cheap way of doing it not needing to go in a cadaveric lab, which is very expensive. So I really recommend you guys doing that. The model build. Um, you can find, again, on the Ortho Academy, a ton of material. There are, it is difficult to find in textbooks how to get the appropriate x-rays. How do you actually move the machine and what those x-rays are used for? And I tried with these drawings to summarize for you guys uh, what each x-ray is utilized for. So, for example, the iliac oblique view. What are the screws trajectory you're seeing? What is the view most commonly used for? Some tips and tricks on angles of view and how do you obtain them uh, in the operating room. So really useful. I recommend you download them. They're free. All of this is free on the website. You go on the website, you download them and you read them and you use them and practice uh, model. So, now I'm going to do a little shift in your brains and um, you're going to have to be attentive because this is complicated. We are accustomed to seeing all of these x-rays. We were brought up in our orthopedic education, seeing all of these x-rays through a exopelvic lens. This is an associated both column fracture and we're used to seeing it from 
we're used to seeing posterior wall, posterior columns, and transverse and posterior walls in that view. T-types look like this, so was associated column posterior hemitransverse. A question that I often get is, well, what is the difference between the T-type and the anterior column posterior hemitransverse? What if the anterior column limb of a T-type went more proximal? That would look exactly the same as the anterior column posterior hemitransverse, wouldn't it? And the answer is absolutely not. It does not, it is not the same fracture. And the reason is the main fracture line in a T-type is a transverse fracture line. While the main fracture line in an ACPHT fracture is the anterior column fracture line. And you will see from my few slides later in the talk that the planes of these fracture lines are very different. So it is not a matter of exopelvic appearance of those lines because they really look the same, but it's more a matter of the plane of the main fracture line. And this has critical importance in your reduction maneuvers and your fixation strategies. They are very, very different fractures. The fact that we are accustomed to this uh, exopelvis view but I want you to familiarize yourself with the endopelvic view of the fracture. And those are very different. Um, you could see how a T-type totally changes perspective when you're doing an an uh, anterior intrapelvic approach, uh, so-called modified stopa. The fracture lines are different and you need to, to be able to understand that your, your visual is changed. In green dots is the constant fragment. That is the fragment you're going to build everything to. And therefore, knowledge of where it is located in space, intrapelvis, will allow you to accomplish this task. We have been taught for the last decades that transverse fractures were A to P on a two-dimensional CT scan, and column fractures were, were medial to lateral on an axial cut. Well, how, how is that possible? If you look at that picture on the left and just focus on the transverse component, how is it that this transverse component would be A to P when it is actually breaching the acetabulum from medial to lateral. Why do we see a line that is A to P? And I really struggled understanding this concept until a few years ago where we actually created some fractures on a sawbone to better visualize why this was the case. And the reason why this is the case is the fracture is actually not medial to lateral. It's cephalocaudal. So as it starts going from lateral to medial, it then cuts 90 degrees and separates the acetabulum into a medial part, which is the anterior, the distal part of the acetabulum that is medialized, and a proximal lateralized part that is the constant fragment. So you have a cephalocaudal fracture with medial displacement of that distal segment and the constant fragment that contains a large part of the weight-bearing portion of the acetabulum. And this is very important um, aspects in terms of vector of reduction and implant placement. But that is why transverse fractures are A to P on an axial. On the contrary, you have an anterior column fracture, and you could see it right there, that is actually medial to lateral on an axial CT scan, but it, because it is a fracture that separates the anterior column and breaks it, pushing it laterally. And you can see that here, that this is not a medial and lateral part, it's an anterior part and a posterior part. The posterior part contains the constant fragment, the anterior part contains the constant fragment.
So very different injuries and very different reduction maneuvers. So you can see them here. You could see on the left, it is a transverse fracture, line A to P, medialized, uh, medialized fracture. It needs to be pushed lateral, and the fixation most of the time requires an infrapectineal fixation, right? You want to push that medialization back to where it needs to go. On the contrary, on the right side, you have a column fracture. The reduction maneuver is a Farabuff or equivalent on the wing component, and you want to internally rotate and compress from anterior to posterior with ideally some suprapectineal plating system. As we discussed earlier, transverse fractures can be transtectal, juxtatectal, infratectal, based on where they're located. Look at fracture line one, two, and three. One is transtectal. These are the worst because their location, they're located right on the roof of the acetabulum, so a lot of load. They don't tolerate any step off, higher risk of post-traumatic arthritis, and very hard to get to through an AIP. Ideally, these fractures can be managed through the middle window of the ilioinguinal for those of you that do that. But from an AIP, it is a little more challenging, and that's when I will add an ASIS osteotomy to the modified stopper approach. They're hard because they're right under the psoas muscle in the psoas gutter, and hard to place clamp uh, into. This is a table, you can take a picture so you can look at it uh, when you have a few minutes, but it's a picture that, cor it's a table that correlates So another common um, issue is identifying the differences between anterior column, posterior hemitransverse and associated both column. They look exactly the same. If you look at the endopelvic view, they're exactly the same injury. The biggest difference is the ACPHT contains a piece of joint, a piece of cartilage attached to the constant fragment. And that makes it a fairly unforgiving injury because the reduction has to be perfect. But if you see it on the endopelvis approach, um, you could, as you're turning this model, when you're doing a modified stopper, this piece here above the, the greater sciatic notch contains a part of cartilage of the acetabulum. Very important to remember that. On the contrary, the associated both column the constant fragment does not contain any piece of articular cartilage. And that makes it a little more forgiving, particularly in relation to secondary congruence, where the two columns are totally separated from one another and they can achieve a mold around the femoral head, particularly in elderly patients. So a little more forgiving. Um, Moving on to understanding the anatomy. Before you go into uh, complex surgical approaches, uh, it is critical to understand the three-dimensional representation of the anatomy. This is a model that was built by one of my international fellows uh, this year, Guillaume uh, David from France, who um, really, really took uh, a lot of precision and built this model with Foley catheters and, and other materials to constantly remind ourselves of the relationship in a three-dimensional model of the vas deferens, the corona mortis, the external internal vessels, um, and the obturator neurovascular bundle, just to uh, have a, a better visualization of the 3D um, anatomy uh, pertinent to the surgical approaches. It is really uh, simple, uh, but precise um, and worthwhile studying and looking at when you're preparing for cases. This is how he built it. 
using a lot of very cool uh, little tools that we have in the operating room um, uh, to build that model. Remember the Corona Mortis. I mean, people freak out about Corona Mortis, but you, you, you mustn't freak out. You just got to look for it. They're present most of the time located, you know, around four centimeters from the midline. And it is anastomosis between a branch of the inferior epigastric, which is a branch of the um, external uh, iliac um, circulation, with a branch of the internal iliac, which is the obturator artery. So essentially a connection between external and internal um, iliac through inferior epigastric and obturator. And there's different variations of this, it can take off usually directly from the um, inferior epigastric, uh, but it, it is possible that it also takes off straight from um, a connection, as you can see on the drawing uh, on the right, uh, from the main trunk that feeds the inferior epigastric. And in this case, you really want to uh, cauterize the corona mortis, not the common trunk, because you would uh, lose the blood supply to the rectus abdominis, but worthwhile looking at it and studying these drawings. Um, as you can see, uh, when we're going to clamping, um, these are uh, clamps that can be placed for a transverse fracture. You want a medial to lateral push. This is a clamp that is placed all internally um, on the picture on the left. Um, you can see that fairly bad transverse fracture here. Make sure there's no vessels incarcerated in there because this would be a bad day. So before you reduce those fractures, you got to go and check that there's no vessels, uh, particularly the superior gluteal artery uh, incarcerated, uh, but uh, also use lateral femoral traction. This will reduce most of these fractures nearly all the way. Um, you can, uh, this is the view you get from a modified stopper. You can see the entire superior gluteal notch uh, and the, most of the posterior column. Um, and your limiting factor is the um, takeoff uh, of the internal uh, iliac uh, artery and vein. A classic example here, transverse, I showed you uh, just a few slides ago from the 3D uh, uh, rotation uh, of the scan. Lateral traction, this is a clamp that goes in, out, and in with a small incision around the ASIS. You slide the clamp on the gluteal pillar and it allows you to get this kind of reduction. Uh, fixation through uh, the coca Langenbeck. Uh, so if you're prone uh, or lateral, usually easier prone for transverse fractures because you don't displace the transverse component, but you can place a clamp through the greater sciatic notch this is an example of trials and tribulations. Um, so we're posterior, we got a young bluth clamp, the posterior column is reduced, and now we're trying to put a clamp to reduce that anterior column from the back. It's not adequate, so the screw comes out again. We try several different clamps. Uh, the Weber seems to be doing a better job here. We pass our wire, and then we pass a 6.5 screw from posterior to anterior to fix the anterior column of the transverse fracture. Um, another question I get is transverse fracture family, do I start from the front or do I start from the back? And I want to spend the next few slides uh, showing to you why I like to start from the front most, most of the time. Uh, my belief is that if you do a modified stopper uh, and you fix, you put a plate on the anterior column component, you are really unlikely to lock your posterior column and not be able to fix it or reduce it if you've started from the front. And you can see these screws at the top of the plate. They're going in the constant fragment. There's no way you're going to lock yourself in. The distal screws in the anterior plate are going really anterior 
And there is no way that you're going to prevent your posterior reduction. Conversely, if you start from the back, uh, you do your coca langham back and you put your posterior column plate, the distal screws are not going to affect your anterior column. However, your, your superior screws and the plate may go across the fracture. And this could be a problem if your anterior column is not perfectly reduced. So um, you could see this here on this model. Look at how likely it is that these screws at the top of the plate breach that red transverse line. There is a perfect axis as opposed to an anterior plate that is unlikely, virtually unlikely to have screws, neither proximal nor distal, that would prevent a reduction of the posterior column. So I like to start from the front first for that specific reason. Um, this uh, slide just highlights what we discussed earlier, is that on the left, you have an associated both column. On the right, an anterior column, posterior hemi-transverse. They look exactly the same. The difference is the size of the constant fragment piece that is much smaller in an associated uh, both column fracture because it does not contain any cartilage. Remember that. So... Moving on to sequence of events, and we're getting towards uh, the end, and I will show you a couple of cases, but uh, my sequence of events is always posterior to anterior. If you have an associated pelvic ring injury and a, an acetabulum, you start at the posterior ring, you build that constant fragment, you stabilize it, then you fix your acetabulum, and then you fix the anterior ring. It's like building a wall. You want to start from a fixed point. And I do the same for an acetabular fracture that is isolated. In fact, we mapped all of our acetabular fractures, over 250 acetabular fractures from the last six or seven years. And the mapping, uh, and we're in the process of publishing this, focusing on this constant fragment, the mapping all, most of the time, 99% of the time, leaves an intact, totally accessible piece of that green zone that's called the constant fragment for you to work with. And this is my go-to when I start an AIP approach is I, I go straight away to that posterior ring um, about a centimeter anterior to the SI joint infrapectineal so that I can start building my wall moving posterior to anterior. The implants we have, those quadrilateral plate are not adequately built because they're not built based on this constant fragment. And therefore, I would advise all of you to start using, uh, you know, a, a small a recon three, four hole plate or um, a third tubular plate in that constant fragment area as the first maneuver of reduction to tackle that posterior column. You see the quality of the bone in that area is good. And this is the hinge upon you're going to rebuild your entire acid album. It is the cornerstone, as you can see here in those two fractures on the left and on the right. If you key in perfectly this triangle with more fragment-specific implant, your reductions will be much improved. So going back to our case and to finish off, I just wanted to show you two cases. Um, this is a bad T-type with your wall fracture. Um, there's a lot of bladder deviation. You could see uh, there's uh, a very big corona mortis in this case, uh, but more importantly, a lot of comminution. Um, and despite the presence of posterior wall, I decided to go anteriorly first to get an anatomical reduction of my anterior column before moving uh, posteriorly here. You could see the three-dimensional CT scan demonstrating incarcerated piece inside the joint. 
that we were able to extract from the AIP approach. Not an easy AIP because you're very um, transtectal and difficult to clamp in this in this case, and a fairly distal posterior column fracture, which makes it just a little more challenging for us. Um, I will, uh, I have a clinical picture here showing you the corona mortis. In this case, the corona mortis was bifurcating around the obturator nerve. So always, uh, if you can, have a good visualization of the corona mortis. And before you clamp it, uh, make sure the obturator nerve is safe in there. The lateral traction will help you greatly uh, achieve 90% of your reduction. And then you can follow that with, um, for, for those transtectal, I, I find it very difficult to find the appropriate vector. So I like to use a screw-based clamp. See the Youngbluth of Farabuff, uh, putting, you know, an infrapectineal plate in this case that is not completely screwed down to the bone. You could see it on the left here. And using screw-based clamp to slowly reduce that fracture. Uh, you want to make sure you don't over-compress the intrapelvic fracture line because this will gap open uh, the uh, intraarticular portion of the transverse fracture. Remember it's three-dimensional. If you squeeze on the intrapelvic side, you may distract uh, the intraarticular part of that fracture uh, because it remains an indirect reduction uh, and you don't see the joint. So be very critical uh, with your um, x-rays. Simple, simple fixation here because this patient may likely need a total hip replacement for the, the, the features of posterior wall comminution uh, and femoral head damage. So I'm doing, I'm, I'm aiming for anatomical reduction, but also I don't want too much hair in the way. And then we flipped him and did a coker and addressed the push wall and achieved a, a very satisfying uh, reduction, I think, as you can see on these x-rays. I will conclude with the high acetabular wall fractures. You see how this is really a proximally based fracture. This is a fracture from a couple of weeks ago too, uh, but it, it really looks on the left like this is a transverse fracture, right? If you just show me that CT scan, I would think that this was a transverse posterior wall but that fracture doesn't exit through the anterior column. As you could see in the bottom scan, the um, coronal view, it is a very large posterior wall piece that is so large that it um, affects the right, the dome of the acetabulum uh, right in that, um, in that um, most weight bearing uh, part of the acetabulum. So the thinking here is, you could try a coker Langenbeck. Uh, again, these slides are available, so uh, don't panic if it goes too fast. But the problem with a coker Langenbeck is you, you won't be able to access the superior part of the acetabulum um, without doing a trochanteric osteotomy. So I think you have a few options here. You do a coker Langenbeck with a trochanteric osteotomy, or you do a modified Gibson. And I find that most of the time you do not need a trochanteric osteotomy with the modified Gibson. The, the difference between the two is that uh, the modified Gibson, the only downside is that it is a little harder to go distal on the posterior column with the modified Gibson. So just something to keep in mind, if you have a very high wall with some distal wall comminution, you're perhaps better off doing a coca Langenbeck with a, a trochosteotomy. If it's just a, 
a fairly classic posterior wall with high extension, you're better off with a Gibson. Um, so this is what the Gibson looks like. You got your short external rotators, um, and uh, just like a coker, you would excise them. You would um, um, put your your retractors in the greater and lesser sidic notch. You'd put a clamp under gluteus uh, medius, labeled number one here, and that would uh, show you the extension of that a large posterior wall piece which we did in this case. I like to place chance pins. They serve as great, powerful uh, soft tissue retraction, uh, particularly to retract gluteus uh, medius uh, and the skin uh, and show you uh, your uh, posterior wall extension. And this is the fixation using a, a ton of uh, spring plates uh, with longer screws. And this is our reduction. Uh, this uh, lecture was 32 minutes. I apologize if I went a little over my allocated time. I hope it was um, useful for you guys. Uh, please don't hes hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Um, and uh, good luck on the rest of the course. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Good, uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Cyril Moffrey, and I am the chairman of the Department of Orthopedics uh, at Denver Health Medical Center. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation, um, Dr. Kekatpure, um, and uh, hello to all delegates and candidates uh, of the Pelvic and Acetabular Surgery Symposium and Hands-On Cadaveric Workshop. It is a great honor for me to be here with you. Um, so, uh, Dr. Kekat Pure uh, asked me to uh, discuss uh, for a few minutes uh, something around pelvic and acetabular fractures that I thought may be really valuable for the audience. So, I thought that I would keep things very simple because this is a lecture um, that I've given uh, several times, uh, realizing uh, that the simple concepts are often misunderstood and it is critical to understand these simple concepts uh, for progression uh, towards a better understanding of the fixation uh, of acetabular fractures. So um, all of these lectures are accessible. The videos you can find on the orthoacademy.com uh, website and a lot of my um, drawings and um, other content can be seen on the Ortho Academy website. So do not fear if you miss some of these uh, slides, uh, they're all somewhere online. So I want to start by uh, discussing <clears throat> this uh, classic fracture um, that um, I uh, encountered a few weeks ago at Denver Health uh, and managed, uh, but this is a great exercise for you guys interested in pelvic and acetabular fractures to, uh, to be able to classify, to be able to know the personality of the fracture, to be able to identify some subtleties, and then finally decide uh, which approach uh, you will undertake. The, the three first points are crucial even before knowing the surgical approaches. So if in your mind you could say, well, uh, the iliopectineal and the ilioischial uh, lines are disrupted, so it could be a transverse fracture, it could be an anterior column posterior hemitransverse, it could be an associated both column, or it could be a T-type. It is not an associated both column because my iliac wing is intact. The obturator foramen is disrupted. This makes it a T-type acetabular fracture, classified on an AP radiograph. The personality of this fracture, as you will see in the, in the next few slides, is that it is from the transverse families because it is a T-type, and T-types have a stem that is the transverse component, 
that then goes down to making it a T. But the fracture is characterized by where this transverse fracture line is located. In this case, you can see that the fracture line is really, really high, right? If you guys know about the roof arc angle, which defines how medial the fracture line extends from a vertical line, this one would virtually be zero degrees. It's, it's like in line with a sore seal, which makes it a transtectal T-type fracture. Uh, those are bad because they're hard to get to and because they breach the most important weight-bearing part of the acetabulum. Some other subtleties, you could see that there's posterior wall comminution at the back, so it is a T-type posterior wall fracture. You could see that there is a, some contrast in the bladder that is suspicious for bleeding. And you could also see that the femoral head is potentially likely injured, uh, some cartilage delamination from that subluxation or medial dislocation. So a lot of things can be seen on an x-ray. And on the course that you're attending today, I hope that you can be really critical uh, when observing uh, an AP radiograph of a pelvis. So what we're gonna do today, the sequence of learning, I want you to focus on getting x-rays and what they're used for and when they're not adequate. So you have an inlet view. When is it a good inlet? When is it not a good inlet? You need to be able to do that. The second uh, learning is about the fracture and being able to understand these fractures on three dimension. And finally, correlate the above with which approach you want to do particularly and some reduction vectors, although that comes much later um, in the learning. To do this, I really recommend, um, uh, you guys may have seen or not, but I really do the model build recommend has the simplest of supplies, um, including a Sawbones model, a one centimeter thick uh, yoga mat, a 35 by created, 26 by one centimeter sheet uh, of plywood, is, again, the fixation the materials. Academy website, First, the model is ideally centered and, and brought towards the edge of the plywood of sheet, which enables with, enough um, space for proper John ergonomics Hopkins and hand placement University. to obtain proper quarter placement uh, for all screw approaches. Pilot holes are then drilled in the wood and midline of the posterior sacrum, and ultimately these are then bound together by a simple wood screw. To provide additional Additional stabilization, fixation is also applied to the bilateral PSISs, which remains outside the corridors of any percutaneous approaches. After adequate fixation is achieved, the model is wrapped in a one centimeter thick now, yoga mat, a size which was specifically sure chosen that, uh, to provide a tactile feedback and texture as similar to the layers of skin as possible. Your hands so you can While wrapping the, the model in the yoga mat, work, but the mat is attached to the model, model using staples. To However, if needed, splint tape could also be used as a suitable alternative. After trimming the mat as needed, to provide so the most realistic skin tension, the, machine, the mat is pulled tight right and angles, further fixated with staples. And more importantly, After also pulling the sides in tight this, bilaterally, it will allow staples are again applied to completely enclose the model, the corridors, which is now ready for you can use. Take an hour every day after your clinic to go and practice and be the best at what you do. It is really a pretty amazing and cheap way of doing it not needing to go in a cadaveric lab, which is very expensive. So I really recommend you guys doing that. The model build.
Um, you can find, again, on the Ortho Academy, a ton of material. There are, it is difficult to find in textbooks how to get the appropriate x-rays. How do you actually move the machine and what those x-rays are used for? And I tried with these drawings to summarize for you guys uh, what each x-ray is utilized for. So for example, the iliac oblique view, what are the screws trajectory you're seeing, what is the view most commonly used for, some tips and tricks on angles of view and how do you obtain them uh, in the operating room. So really useful, I recommend you download them. They're free, all of this is free on the website. You go on the website, you download them and you read them and you use them and practice uh, model. So now I'm going to do a little shift in your brains and um, you're gonna have to be attentive because this is complicated. We are accustomed to seeing all of these x-rays. We were brought up in our orthopedic education, seeing all of these x-rays through a exopelvic lens. This is an associated both column fracture, and we're used to seeing it from, we're used to seeing posterior wall, posterior columns, and transverse and posterior walls in that view. T-types look like this, so was associated column posterior hemitransverse. A question that I often get is, well, what is the difference between the T-type and the anterior column posterior hemitransverse? What if the anterior column limb of a T-type went more proximal? That would look exactly the same as the anterior column posterior hemitransverse, wouldn't it? And the answer is absolutely not. It does not, it is not the same fracture. And the reason is the main fracture line in a T-type is a transverse fracture line. While the main fracture line in an ACPHT fracture is the anterior column fracture line. And you will see from my few slides later in the talk that the planes of these fracture lines are very different. So it is not a matter of exopelvic appearance of those lines because they really look the same, but it's more a matter of the plane of the main fracture line. And this has critical importance in your reduction maneuvers and your fixation strategies. They are very, very different fractures. The fact that we are accustomed to this uh, exopelvis view but I want you to familiarize yourself with the endopelvic view of the fracture. And those are very different. Um, you could see how a T-type totally changes perspective when you're doing an an uh, anterior intrapelvic approach, uh, so-called modified stopa. The fracture lines are different and you need to, to be able to understand that your, your visual is changed. In green dots is the constant fragment. That is the fragment you're going to build everything to. And therefore, knowledge of where it is located in space, intrapelvis, will allow you to accomplish this task. We have been taught for the last decades that transverse fractures were A to P on a two-dimensional CT scan, and column fractures were, were medial to lateral on an axial cut. Well, how, how is that possible? If you look at that picture on the left and just focus on the transverse component, how is it that this transverse component would be A to P when it is actually breaching the acetabulum from medial to lateral. Why do we see a line that is A to P? And I really struggled understanding this concept until a few years ago where we actually created some fractures on a sawbone to better visualize why this was the case. And the reason why this is the case is the fracture is actually not medial to lateral. It's cephalocaudal. So as it starts going from lateral to medial, 
it then cuts 90 degrees and separates the acetabulum into a medial part, which is the anterior, the distal part of the acetabulum that is medialized, and a proximal lateralized part that is the constant fragment. So you have a cephalocaudal fracture with medial displacement of that distal segment and the constant fragment that contains a large part of the weight-bearing portion of the acetabulum. And this is very important um, aspects in terms of vector of reduction and implant placement. But that is why transverse fractures are A to P on an axial. On the contrary, you have an anterior column fracture, and you could see it right there, that is actually medial to lateral on an axial CT scan. But it, because it is a fracture that separates the anterior column and breaks it, pushing it laterally. And you can see that here, that this is not a medial and lateral part. It's an anterior part and a posterior part. The posterior part contains the constant fragment. The anterior part contains the constant fragment. So very different injuries and very different reduction maneuvers. So you can see them here. You could see on the left, it is a transverse fracture, line A to P, medialized, uh, medialized fracture. It needs to be pushed lateral, and the fixation most of the time requires an infrapectineal fixation, right? You want to push that medialization back to where it needs to go. On the contrary, on the right side, you have a column fracture. The reduction maneuver is a Farabuff or equivalent on the wing component, and you want to internally rotate and compress from anterior to posterior with ideally some suprapectineal plating system. As we discussed earlier, transverse fractures can be transtectal, juxtatectal, infratectal, based on where they're located. Look at fracture line one, two, and three. One is transtectal. These are the worst because their location, they're located right on the roof of the acetabulum, so a lot of load. They don't tolerate any step off, higher risk of post-traumatic arthritis, and very hard to get to through an AIP. Ideally, these fractures can be managed through the middle window of the ilioinguinal for those of you that do that, but from an AIP, it is a little more challenging, and that's when I will add an ASIS osteotomy to the modified stopper approach. They're hard because they're right under the psoas muscle in the psoas gutter and hard to place clamp uh, into. This is a table. You can take a picture so you can look at it uh, when you have a few minutes, but it's a picture that it's a table that correlates the type of fracture, transverse versus anterior column and how different they are in their degree of displacement and therefore vectors of reduction and fixation strategies. So another common um, issue is identifying the differences between anterior column, posterior hemitransverse and associated both column. They look exactly the same. If you look at the endopelvic view, they're exactly the same injury. The biggest difference is the ACPHT contains a piece of joint, a piece of cartilage attached to the constant fragment. And that makes it a fairly unforgiving injury because the reduction has to be perfect. But if you see it on the endopelvis approach, um, you could, as you're turning this model, when you're doing a modified stopa, this piece here above the, the greater sciatic notch contains a part of cartilage of the acetabulum. Very important to remember that. On the contrary, the associated both column, the constant fragment does not contain any piece of articular cartilage. And that makes it a little more forgiving, 
particularly in relation to secondary congruence, where the two columns are totally separated from one another and they can achieve a mold around the femoral head, particularly in elderly patients. So a little more forgiving. Um, moving on to understanding the anatomy. Before you go into uh, complex surgical approaches, um, it is critical to understand the three-dimensional representation of the anatomy. This is a model that was built by one of my international fellows uh, this year, Guillaume uh, David from France, who um, really, really took uh, a lot of precision and built this model with Foley catheters and, and other materials to constantly remind ourselves of the relationship in a three-dimensional model of the vas deferens, the corona mortis, the external internal vessels, um, and the obturator neurovascular bundle, just to uh, have a, a better visualization of the 3D um, anatomy uh, pertinent to the surgical approaches. It is really uh, simple, uh, but precise um, and worthwhile studying and looking at when you're preparing for cases. This is how he built it using a lot of very cool uh, little tools that we have in the operating room um, to build that model. Remember the corona mortis. I mean, people freak out about corona mortis, but you, you, you mustn't freak out. You just got to look for it. They're present most of the time located, you know, around four centimeters from the midline. And it is anastomosis between a branch of the inferior epigastric, which is a branch of the um, external uh, iliac um, circulation, with a branch of the internal iliac, which is the obturator artery. So essentially a connection between external and internal um, iliac through inferior epigastric and obturator. And there's different variations of this, it can take off usually directly from the um, inferior epigastric, uh, but it, it is possible that it also takes off straight from um, a connection, as you can see on the drawing uh, on the right, uh, from the main trunk that feeds the inferior epigastric. And in this case, you really want to uh, cauterize the corona mortis, not the common trunk, because you would uh, lose the blood supply to the rectus abdominis, but worthwhile looking at it and studying these drawings. Um, as you can see, uh, when we're going to clamping, um, these are uh, clamps that can be placed for a transverse fracture. You want a medial to lateral push. This is a clamp that is placed all internally um, on the picture on the left. Um, you can see that fairly bad transverse fracture here. Make sure there's no vessels incarcerated in there because this would be a bad day. So before you reduce those fractures, you gotta go and check that there's no vessels, uh, particularly the superior gluteal artery uh, incarcerated, uh, but uh, also use lateral femoral traction. This will reduce most of these fractures nearly all the way. Um, you can, uh, this is the view you get from a modified stopper. You can see the entire superior gluteal notch, uh, and the, most of the posterior column. Um, and your limiting factor is the, um, takeoff, uh, of the internal, uh, iliac, uh, artery and vein. A classic example here, transverse, I showed you, uh, just a few slides ago from the three, uh, D, uh, rotation, uh, of the scan. Lateral traction, this is a clamp that goes in, out, and in with a small incision around the ASIS. You slide the clamp on the gluteal pillar and it allows you to get this kind of reduction. Uh, fixation through uh, the coca Langenbeck 
Uh, so if you're prone uh, or lateral, usually easier prone for transverse fractures because you don't displace the transverse component, but you can place a clamp through the greater sciatic notch. This is an example of trials and tribulations. Um, so we're posterior, we got a young bluth clamp, the posterior column is reduced, and now we're trying to put a clamp to reduce that anterior column from the back. It's not adequate, so the screw comes out again. We try several different clamps. Uh, the Weber seems to be doing a better job here. We pass our wire, and then we pass a 6.5 screw from posterior to anterior to fix the anterior column of the transverse fracture. Um, another question I get is transverse fracture family, do I start from the front or do I start from the back? And I want to spend the next few slides uh, showing to you why I like to start from the front most, most of the time. Uh, my belief is that if you do a modified stopper and you fix, you put a plate on the anterior column component, you are really unlikely to lock your posterior column and not be able to fix it or reduce it if you've started from the front. And you can see these screws at the top of the plate. They're going in the constant fragment. There's no way you're going to lock yourself in. The distal screws in the anterior plate are going really anterior, and there is no way that you're gonna prevent your posterior reduction. Conversely, if you start from the back, uh, you do your coca langham back and you put your posterior column plate, the distal screws are not going to affect your anterior column. However, your, your superior screws in the plate may go across the fracture. And this could be a problem if your anterior column is not perfectly reduced. So um, you could see this here on this model. Look at how likely it is that these screws at the top of the plate breach that red transverse line. There is a perfect axis as opposed to an anterior plate that is unlikely, virtually unlikely to have screws, neither proximal nor distal, that would prevent a reduction of the posterior column. So I like to start from the front first for that specific reason. Um, this uh, slide just highlights what we discussed earlier, is that on the left, you have an associated both column. On the right, an anterior column, posterior hemitransverse. They look exactly the same. The difference is the size of the constant fragment piece that is much smaller in an associated uh, both column fracture because it does not contain any cartilage. Remember that. So... Moving on to sequence of events, and we're getting towards uh, the end, and I will show you a couple of cases, but uh, my sequence of events is always posterior to anterior. If you have an associated pelvic ring injury and a, an acetabulum, you start at the posterior ring, you build that constant fragment, you stabilize it, then you fix your acetabulum, and then you fix the anterior ring. It's like building a wall. You want to start from a fixed point. And I do the same for an acetabular fracture that is isolated. In fact, we mapped all of our acetabular fractures, over 250 acetabular fractures from the last six or seven years. And the mapping, uh, and we're in the process of publishing this, focusing on this constant fragment, the mapping all, most of the time, 99% of the time, leaves an intact, totally accessible piece of that green zone that's called the constant fragment for you to work with. And this is my go-to when I start an AIP approach is I, I go straight away to that posterior ring um, about a centimeter anterior to the SI joint infrapectineal so that I can start building my wall moving posterior to anterior. 
the implants we have, those quadrilateral plate, are not adequately built because they're not built based on this constant fragment. And therefore, I would advise all of you to start using, uh, you know, a, a small a recon three, four hole plate or um, a third tubular plate in that constant fragment area as the first maneuver of reduction to tackle that posterior column. You see the quality of the bone in that area is good. And this is the hinge upon you're going to rebuild your entire acid album. It is the cornerstone, as you can see here in those two fractures on the left and on the right. If you key in perfectly this triangle with more fragment specific implant, your reductions will be much improved. So going back to our case and to finish off, I just wanted to show you two cases. Um, this is a bad T-type with your wall fracture. Um, there's a lot of bladder deviation. You could see uh, there's uh, a very big corona mortis in this case, uh, but more importantly, a lot of comminution. Um, and despite the presence of posterior wall, I decided to go anteriorly first to get an anatomical reduction of my anterior column before moving uh, posteriorly here. You could see the three-dimensional CT scan demonstrating incarcerated piece inside the joint that we were able to extract from the AIP approach. Not an easy AIP because you're very um, transtectal and difficult to clamp in this in this case and a fairly distal posterior column fracture which makes it just a little more challenging for us um, I will, uh, I have a clinical picture here showing you the corona mortis. In this case, the corona mortis was bifurcating around the obturator nerve. So always, uh, if you can, have a good visualization of the corona mortis. And before you clamp it, uh, make sure the obturator nerve is safe in there. The lateral traction will help you greatly uh, achieve 90% of your reduction. And then you can follow that with, um, for, for those transtectal, I, I find it very difficult to find the appropriate vector. So I like to use a screw-based clamp. See the Youngbluth of Farabuff, uh, putting you know an infrapectineal plate in this case that is not completely screwed down to the bone. You could see it on the left here. And using screw-based clamp to slowly reduce that fracture. Uh, you want to make sure you don't over-compress the intrapelvic fracture line because this will gap open uh, the uh, intraarticular portion of the transverse fracture. Remember it's three-dimensional. If you squeeze on the intrapelvic side you may distract uh, the intraarticular part of that fracture uh, because it remains an indirect reduction uh, and you don't see the joint. So be very critical uh, with your um, x-rays. Simple simple fixation here because this patient may likely need a total hip replacement for the, the, the features of posterior wall comminution uh, and femoral head damage. So I'm doing, I'm, I'm aiming for anatomical reduction, but also I don't want too much hair in the way. And then we flipped him and did a coker and addressed the posterior wall and achieved a, a very satisfying uh, reduction, I think, as you can see on these x-rays. I will conclude with the high acetabular wall fractures. You see how this is really approximately based fracture. This is a fracture from a couple of weeks ago too. 
Uh, but it, it really looks on the left like this is a transverse fracture, right? If you just show me that CT scan, I would think that this was a transverse posterior wall. But that fracture doesn't exit through the anterior column. As you could see in the bottom scan, the um, coronal view, it is a very large posterior wall piece that is so large that it um, affects the right, the dome of the acetabulum uh, right in that um, in that um, most weight-bearing uh, part of the acetabulum. So the thinking here is you could try a Coker Langenbeck. Uh, again, these slides are available, so uh, don't panic if it goes too fast. But the problem with a Coker Langenbeck is you, you won't be able to access the superior part of the acetabulum um, without doing a trochanteric osteotomy. So I think you have a few options here. You do a Coker Langebeck with a trochanteric osteotomy, or you do a modified Gibson. And I find that most of the time you do not need a trochanteric osteotomy with the modified Gibson. The, the difference between the two is that uh, the modified Gibson, the only downside is that it is a little harder to go distal on the posterior column with the modified Gibson. So just something to keep in mind, if you have a very high wall with some distal wall comminution, you're perhaps better off doing a Coca Langenbeck with a, a trochosteotomy. If it's just a, a fairly classic posterior wall with high extension, you're better off with a Gibson. Um, so this is what the Gibson looks like. You got your short external rotators, um, and uh, just like a coker, you would excise them. You would um, um, put your your retractors in the greater and lesser sidic notch. You'd put a clamp under gluteus uh, medius, labeled number one here, and that would uh, show you the extension of that a large posterior wall piece, which we did in this case. I like to place chance pins. They serve as great, powerful uh, soft tissue retraction. Uh, particularly to retract gluteus uh, medius uh, and the skin uh, and show you uh, your uh, posterior wall extension. And this is the fixation using a, a ton of uh, spring plates uh, with longer screws. And this is our reduction. Uh, this uh, lecture was 32 minutes. I apologize if I went a little over my allocated time. I hope it was um, useful for you guys. Uh, please don't hesit hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Um, and uh, good luck on the rest of the course. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Good, uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Cyril Moffrey, and I'm the chairman of the Department of Orthopedics uh, at Denver Health Medical Center. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation, um, Dr. Kekatpure, um, and uh, hello to all delegates and candidates uh, of the Pelvic and Acetabular Surgery Symposium and Hands-On Cadaveric Workshop. It is a great honor for me to be here with you. Um, so, uh, Dr. Kekat Pure uh, asked me to uh, discuss uh, for a few minutes uh, something around pelvic and acetabular fractures that I thought may be really valuable for the audience. So, I thought that I would keep things very simple because this is a lecture um, that I've given uh, several times, uh, realizing uh, that the simple concepts are often misunderstood and it is critical to understand these simple concepts uh, for progression uh, towards a better understanding of the fixation uh, of acetabular fractures. So um, all of these lectures are accessible. The videos you can find on the orthoacademy.com uh, website and a lot of my um, drawings and um, other content can be seen on the Ortho Academy website. So do not fear if you miss some of these uh, slides, uh, they're all somewhere online. 
So I want to start by uh, discussing <clears throat> this uh, classic fracture um, that um, I uh, encountered a few weeks ago at Denver Health uh, and managed. Uh, but this is a great exercise for you guys interested in pelvic and acetabular fractures to, uh, to be able to classify, to be able to know the personality of the fracture, to be able to identify some subtleties, and then finally decide uh, which approach uh, you will undertake. The, the three first points are crucial even before knowing the surgical approaches. So if in your mind you could say, well, uh, the iliopectineal and the ilioischial uh, lines are disrupted, so it could be a transverse fracture, it could be an anterior column posterior hemitransverse, it could be an associated both column, or it could be a T-type. It is not an associated both column because my iliac wing is intact. The obturator foramen is disrupted. This makes it a T-type acetabular fracture, classified on an AP radiograph. The personality of this fracture, as you will see in the, in the next few slides, is that it is from the transverse families because it is a T-type, and T-types have a stem that is the transverse component that then goes down to making it a T, but the fracture is characterized by where this transverse fracture line is located. In this case, you can see that the fracture line is really, really high, right? If you guys know about the roof arc angle, which defines how medial the fracture line extends from a vertical line, this one would virtually be zero degrees. It's, it's like in line with a sore seal, which makes it a transtectile T-type fracture. Uh, those are bad because they're hard to get to and because they breach the most important weight-bearing part of the acetabulum. Some other subtleties, you could see that there's posterior wall comminution at the back, so it is a T-type posterior wall fracture. You could see that there is a some contrast in the bladder that is suspicious for bleeding. And you could also see that the femoral head is potentially likely injured, uh, some cartilage delamination from that subluxation or medial dislocation. So a lot of things can be seen on an X-ray. And on the course that you're attending today, I hope that you can be really critical uh, when observing uh, an AP radiograph of a pelvis. So what we're going to do today, the sequence of learning, I want you to focus on getting x-rays and what they're used for and when they're not adequate so you have an inlet view when is it a good inlet when is it not a good inlet you need to be able to do that the second uh, learning is about the fracture and being able to understand these fractures on three dimension and finally correlate the above with which approach you want to do particularly and some reduction vectors although that comes much later um, in the learning. To do this, I really recommend, um, uh, you guys may have seen or not, but I really do the model build recommend has the simplest of supplies, um, including a Sawbones model, a one this, centimeter thick uh, yoga mat, model 35 by 26 by one centimeter sheet uh, of plywood, again, with fixation materials. Academy website, First, the model is ideally centered and, and brought towards the edge of the plywood sheet, this which enables with, enough um, space for proper John ergonomics Hopkins and hand placement to obtain proper cord or placement uh, for all screw approaches. Pilot holes are then drilled in the wood and midline of the posterior sacrum, and ultimately these are then bound together by a simple wood screw. To provide a Additional stabilization, fixation is also applied to the bilateral PSISs, which remains outside the corridors of any percutaneous approaches. After adequate fixation is achieved, the model is wrapped in a one centimeter thick yoga mat, a size which was specifically chosen to provide a tactile feedback and texture as similar to the layers of skin as possible. While wrapping the model in the yoga mat, the mat is attached to the model using staples. However, if needed, splint tape could also be used as a suitable alternative. After trimming the mat as needed, 
to provide so the most realistic skin tension, the mat is pulled tight right and further fixated with staples. And more importantly, if you're also pulling the sides in tight this, bilaterally, it will allow staples you are again applied to completely enclose the model, the corridors, which is now ready for you use. Take an hour every day after your clinic to go and practice and be the best at what you do. It is really a pretty amazing and cheap way of doing it, not needing to go in a cadaveric lab, which is very expensive. So I really recommend you guys doing that. The model build. Um, you can find, again, on the Ortho Academy, a ton of material. There are, it is difficult to find in textbooks how to get the appropriate x-rays. How do you actually move the machine and what those x-rays are used for? And I tried with these drawings to summarize for you guys uh, what each x-ray is utilized for. So, for example, the iliac oblique view what are the screws trajectory you're seeing, what is the view most commonly used for, some tips and tricks on angles of view and how do you obtain them uh, in the operating room. So really useful, I recommend you download them. They're free, all of this is free on the website. You go on the website, you download them and you read them and you use them and practice uh, model. So, now I'm going to do a little shift in your brains and um, you're gonna have to be attentive because this is complicated. We are accustomed to seeing all of these x-rays. We were brought up in our orthopedic education, seeing all of these x-rays through a exopelvic lens. This is an associated both column fracture and we're used to seeing it from we're used to seeing posterior wall posterior columns and transverse and posterior walls in that view t-types look like this so was associated column posterior hemi transverse a question that i often get is well what is the difference between the t-type and the anterior column posterior hemi transverse what if the anterior column limb of a t-type went more proximal that would look exactly the same as the anterior column posterior hemitransverse wouldn't it and the answer is absolutely not it does not it is not the same fracture and the reason is the main fracture line in a t-type is a transverse fracture line while the main fracture line in an ACPHT fracture is the anterior column fracture line. And you will see from my few slides later in the talk that the planes of these fracture lines are very different. So it is not a matter of exopelvic appearance of those lines because they really look the same, but it's more a matter of the plane of the main fracture line and this has critical importance in your reduction maneuvers and your fixation strategies. They are very, very different fractures. The fact that we are accustomed to this uh, exopelvis view 
but I want you to familiarize yourself with the endopelvic view of the fracture. And those are very different. Um, you could see how a T-type totally changes perspective when you're doing an an uh, anterior intrapelvic approach, uh, so-called modified stopper. The fracture lines are different and you need to, to be able to understand that your, your visual is changed. In green dots is the constant fragment. That is the fragment you're going to build everything to. And therefore, knowledge of where it is located in space, intrapelvis, will allow you to accomplish this task. We have been taught for the last decades that transverse fractures were A to P on a two-dimensional CT scan and column fractures were, were medial to lateral on an axial cut. Well, how, how is that possible? If you look at that picture on the left and just focus on the transverse component, how is it that this transverse component would be A to P when it is actually breaching the acetabulum from medial to lateral. Why do we see a line that is A to P? And I really struggled understanding this concept until a few years ago where we actually created some fractures on a sawbone to better visualize why this was the case. And the reason why this is the case is the fracture is actually not medial to lateral. It's cephalocaudal. So as it starts going from lateral to medial, it then cuts 90 degrees and separates the acetabulum into a medial part, which is the anterior, the distal part of the acetabulum that is medialized, and a proximal lateralized part that is the constant fragment. So you have a cephalocaudal fracture with medial displacement of that distal segment and the constant fragment that contains a large part of the weight-bearing portion of the acetabulum. And this is very important um, aspects in terms of vector of reduction and implant placement. But that is why transverse fractures are A to P on an axial. On the contrary, you have an anterior column fracture, and you could see it right there, that is actually medial to lateral on an axial CT scan, but it, because it is a fracture that separates the anterior column and breaks it, pushing it laterally. And you can see that here, that this is not a medial and lateral part, it's an anterior part and a posterior part. The posterior part contains the constant fragment, the anterior part contains the constant So very different injuries and very different reduction maneuvers. So you can see them here. You could see on the left, it is a transverse fracture line A to P medialized uh, medialized fracture it needs to be pushed lateral and the fixation most of the time requires an infrapectineal fixation right you want to push that medialization back to where it needs to go on the contrary on the right side you have a column fracture the reduction maneuver is a farabuff or equivalent on the wing component and you want to internally rotate and compress from anterior to posterior with ideally some suprapectineal plating system. As we discussed earlier, transverse fractures can be transtectal, juxtatectal, infratectal, based on where they're located. Look at fracture line one, two, and three. One is transtectal. These are the worst because their location, they're located right on the roof of the acetabulum. So a lot of load, they don't tolerate any step off, higher risk of post-traumatic arthritis, and very hard to get to through an AIP. Ideally, these fractures can be managed through the middle window of the ilioinguinal for those of you that do that, 
But from an AIP, it is a little more challenging. And that's when I will add an ASIS osteotomy to the modified stopper approach. They're hard because they're right under the psoas muscle in the psoas gutter and hard to place clamp uh, into. This is a table. You can take a picture so you can look at it uh, when you have a few minutes, but it's a picture that it's a table that correlates the type of fracture transverse versus anterior column and how different they are in their degree of displacement and therefore vectors of reduction and fixation strategies. So another common um, issue is identifying the differences between anterior column, posterior hemitransverse, and associated both column. They look exactly the same. If you look at the endopelvic view, they're exactly the same injury. The biggest difference is the ACPHT contains a piece of joint, a piece of cartilage attached to the constant fragment. And that makes it a fairly unforgiving injury because the reduction has to be perfect. But if you see it on the endopelvis approach, um, you could, as you're turning this model, when you're doing a modified stopper, this piece here above the, the great ascitic notch contains a part of cartilage of the acetabulum. Very important to remember that. On the contrary, the associated both column the constant fragment does not contain any piece of articular cartilage. And that makes it a little more forgiving, particularly in relation to secondary congruence, where the two columns are totally separated from one another and they can achieve a mold around the femoral head, particularly in elderly patients. So a little more forgiving. Um, Moving on to understanding the anatomy, before you go into uh, complex surgical approaches, um, it is critical to understand the three-dimensional representation of the anatomy. This is a model that was built by one of my international fellows uh, this year, Guillaume uh, David from France, who um, really, really took uh, a lot of precision and built this model with Foley catheters and, and other materials to constantly remind ourselves of the relationship in a three-dimensional model of the vas deferens, the corona mortis, the external internal vessels, um, and the obturator neurovascular bundle, just to uh, have a, a better visualization of the 3D um, anatomy uh, pertinent to the surgical approaches. It is really uh, simple, uh, but precise um, and worthwhile studying and looking at when you're preparing for cases. This is how he built it using a lot of very cool uh, little tools that we have in the operating room. Um, I had to build that model. Remember the corona mortis. I mean, people freak out about corona mortis, but you, you, you mustn't freak out. You just got to look for it. They're present most of the time located, you know, around four centimeters from the midline. And it is anastomosis between a branch of the inferior epigastric, which is a branch of the um, external uh, iliac um, circulation, with a branch of the internal iliac, which is the obturator artery. So essentially a connection between external and internal um, iliac through inferior epigastric and obturator. And there's different variations of this. It can take off usually directly from the um, inferior epigastric, uh, but it, it is possible that it also takes off straight from um, a connection, as you can see on the drawing uh, on the right, uh, from the main trunk that feeds the inferior epigastric. And in this case, you really want to uh, cauterize the corona mortis, not the common trunk, because you would uh, lose the blood supply to the rectus abdominis. But worthwhile looking at it and studying these drawings. Um, as you can see, uh, when we're going to clamping, 
Um, these are uh, clamps that can be placed for a transverse fracture. You want a medial to lateral push. This is a clamp that is placed all internally um, on the picture on the left. Um, you can see that fairly bad transverse fracture here. Make sure there's no vessels incarcerated in there because this would be a bad day. So before you reduce those fractures, you gotta go and check that there's no vessels, uh, particularly the superior gluteal artery uh, incarcerated, uh, but uh, also use lateral femoral traction. This will reduce most of these fractures nearly all the way. Um, you can, uh, this is the view you get from a modified stopper. You can see the entire superior gluteal notch uh, and the, most of the posterior column. Um, and your limiting factor is the um, takeoff uh, of the internal uh, iliac uh, artery and vein. A classic example here, transverse, I showed you uh, just a few slides ago from the 3D uh, uh, rotation uh, of the scan. Lateral traction, this is a clamp that goes in, out, and in with a small incision around the ASIS. You slide the clamp on the gluteal pillar and it allows you to get this kind of reduction. Uh, fixation through uh, the coca Langenbeck. Uh, so if you're prone uh, or lateral, usually easier prone for transverse fractures because you don't displace the transverse component, but you can place a clamp through the greater sciatic notch this is an example of trials and tribulations. Um, so we're posterior, we got a young bluth clamp, the posterior column is reduced, and now we're trying to put a clamp to reduce that anterior column from the back. It's not adequate, so the screw comes out again. We try several different clamps. Uh, the Weber seems to be doing a better job here. We pass our wire, and then we pass a 6.5 screw from posterior to anterior to fix the anterior column of the transverse fracture. Um, another question I get is transverse fracture family, do I start from the front or do I start from the back? And I want to spend the next few slides uh, showing to you why I like to start from the front most, most of the time. Uh, my belief is that if you do a modified stopa and you fix, you put a plate on the anterior column component, you are really unlikely to lock your posterior column and not be able to fix it or reduce it if you've started from the front. And you can see these screws at the top of the plate. They're going in the constant fragment. There's no way you're going to lock yourself in. The distal screws in the anterior plate are going really anterior, and there is no way that you're going to prevent your posterior reduction. Conversely, if you start from the back, uh, you do your coca langham back and you put your posterior column plate, the distal screws are not going to affect your anterior column. However, your, your superior screws in the plate may go across the fracture. And this could be a problem if your anterior column is not perfectly reduced. So um, you could see this here on this model. Look at how likely it is that these screws at the top of the plate breach that red transverse line. There is a perfect axis as opposed to an anterior plate that is unlikely, virtually unlikely to have screws, neither proximal nor distal, that would prevent a reduction of the posterior column. So I like to start from the front first for that specific reason.
Um, this uh, slide just highlights what we discussed earlier, is that on the left, you have an associated both column. On the right, an anterior column, posterior hemitransverse. They look exactly the same. The difference is the size of the constant fragment piece that is much smaller in an associated uh, both column fracture because it does not contain any cartilage. Remember that. So moving on to sequence of events, and we're getting towards uh, the end, and I will show you a couple of cases, but uh, my sequence of events is always posterior to anterior. If you have an associated pelvic ring injury and a, an acetabulum, you start at the posterior ring, you build that constant fragment, you stabilize it, then you fix your acetabulum, and then you fix the anterior ring. It's like building a wall. You want to start from a fixed point. And I do the same for an acetabular fracture that is isolated. In fact, we mapped all of our acetabular fractures, over 250 acetabular fractures from the last six or seven years. And the mapping, uh, and we're in the process of publishing this, focusing on this constant fragment, the mapping all, most of the time, 99% of the time, leaves an intact, totally accessible piece of that green zone that's called the constant fragment for you to work with. And this is my go-to when I start an AIP approach, is I, I go straight away to that posterior ring, um, about a centimeter anterior to the SI joint, infrapectineal, so that I can start building my wall moving posterior to anterior. The implants we have, those quadrilateral plate, are not adequately built because they're not built based on this constant fragment. And therefore, I would advise all of you to start using, uh, you know, a, a small a recon three, four hole plate or um, a third tubular plate in that constant fragment area as the first maneuver of reduction to tackle that posterior column. You see the quality of the bone in that area is good. And this is the hinge upon you're going to rebuild your entire acetabulum. It is the cornerstone, as you can see here in those two fractures on the left and on the right. If you key in perfectly this triangle with more fragment-specific implant, your reductions will be much improved. So going back to our case and to finish off, I just wanted to show you two cases. Um, this is a bad T-type with your wall fracture. Um, there's a lot of bladder deviation. You could see uh, there's uh, a very big corona mortis in this case, uh, but more importantly, a lot of comminution. Um, and despite the presence of posterior wall, I decided to go anteriorly first to get an anatomical reduction of my anterior column before moving uh, posteriorly here. You could see the three-dimensional CT scan demonstrating incarcerated piece inside the joint that we were able to extract from the AIP approach. Not an easy AIP because you're very um, transtectal and difficult to clamp in this, in this case, and a fairly distal posterior column fracture, which makes it just a little more challenging for us. Um, I will, uh, I have a clinical picture here showing you the corona mortis. In this case, the corona mortis was bifurcating around the obturator nerve. So always, uh, if you can, have a good visualization of the corona mortis. And before you clamp it, uh, make sure the obturator nerve is safe in there. 
that lateral traction will help you greatly uh, achieve 90% of your reduction. And then you can follow that with, um, for, for those transtectal, I, I find it very difficult to find the appropriate vector. So I like to use a screw-based clamp, see the Youngbluth of Farabuff, uh, putting you know, an infrapectineal plate in this case that is not completely screwed down to the bone. You could see it on the left here and using screw-based clamp to slowly reduce that fracture. Uh, you want to make sure you don't over-compress the intrapelvic fracture line because this will gap open uh, the uh, intra-articular portion of the transverse fracture. Remember, it's three-dimensional. If you squeeze on the intrapelvic side, you may distract uh, the intra-articular part of that fracture uh, because it remains an indirect reduction. Uh, and you don't see the joint. So be very critical uh, with your um, x-rays. Simple, simple fixation here, because this patient may likely need a total hip replacement for the, the, the features of posterior wall comminution uh, and femoral head damage. So I'm doing, I'm, I'm aiming for anatomical reduction, but also I don't want too much hair in the way. And then we flipped them and did a coker and addressed the push wall and achieved a, a very satisfying uh, reduction, I think, as you can see on these x-rays. I will conclude with the high acetabular wall fractures. You see how this is really a proximally based fracture. This is a fracture from a couple of weeks ago too, uh, but it, it really looks on the left like this is a transverse fracture, right? If you just show me that CT scan, I would think that this was a transverse posterior wall but that fracture doesn't exit through the anterior column. As you could see in the bottom scan, the um, coronal view, it is a very large posterior wall piece that is so large that it um, affects the right, the dome of the acetabulum uh, right in that, um, in that um, most weight bearing uh, part of the acetabulum. So the thinking here is, you could try a Coker Langenbeck. Uh, again, these slides are available, so uh, don't panic if it goes too fast. But the problem with a Coker Langenbeck is you, you won't be able to access the superior part of the acetabulum um, without doing a trochanteric osteotomy. So I think you have a few options here. You do a Coker Langenbeck with a trochanteric osteotomy, or you do a modified Gibson. And I find that most of the time you do not need a trochanteric osteotomy with the modified Gibson. The, the difference between the two is that uh, the modified Gibson, the only downside is that it is a little harder to go distal on the posterior column with the modified Gibson. So just something to keep in mind, if you have a very high wall with some distal wall comminution, you're perhaps better off doing a Coca Langenbeck with a, a trochosteotomy. If it's just a, a fairly classic posterior wall with high extension, you're better off with a Gibson. Um, so this is what the Gibson looks like. You got your short external rotators um, and uh, just like a coker, you would excise them. You would um, um, put your, your retractors in the greater and lesser sciatic notch you'd put a clamp under gluteus uh, medius, labeled number one here, and that would uh, show you the extension of that a large posterior wall piece, which we did in this case. I like to place chance pins. They serve as great, powerful uh, soft tissue retraction, uh, particularly to retract gluteus uh, medius uh, and the skin uh, and show you uh, your uh, posterior wall extension. And this is the fixation using a, a ton of uh, spring plates uh, with longer screws. And this is our reduction. Uh, this uh, lecture was 32 minutes. I apologize if I went a little over my allocated time. I hope it was um, useful for you guys. Uh, please don't hes hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Um, and uh, good luck on the rest of the course. Uh, thank you guys for listening.
Good, uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen.